Good morning, everyone. My name is Councillor Gord Perks. I am the chair of the Toronto East York Community Council. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'd like to now call meeting 24 to order. Welcome. Today's meeting is being held with members of council participating both in person and by video conference. City staff are also connecting to the meeting by video conference. As City Hall remains closed, the public continues to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. I ask everyone for their patience with any delays and technical issues. The clerk staff have connected all registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Toronto East York Community Council page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. Clerk's IT staff will also be available to assist members with their devices. I would like to remind staff to keep their microphones muted and their videos turned off unless they need to answer a question or speak to the committee. This will make it easier for me as chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe the members as they participate in the debate and vote on items. For those members who are joining us remotely, please keep your microphones muted unless you wish to question staff or speak to an item and ensure that your video is turned on. As part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their microphones if they wish to question staff or to speak. I will then create a speaker's list and will call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask that members ensure they turn on their video if applicable and raise their hands to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that you must submit your motions by email. Staff are available at teycc at toronto.ca to help with motions. If there are any visiting members of council attending the meeting today, I encourage you to turn on your video so that I know that you are present and can give you the opportunity to ask questions of staff or to speak. This will also assist the clerk staff in recording the attendance for the meeting. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the Community Council would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Members, are there any de declarations of interest? Seeing none? No. No, Mr. Chair, I just wonder if you could find out if there's hard stops for anybody. I'd just like to say I have a hard stop at six o'clock. And last time we ran out of time because of quorum with a really important issue in my community. So I'd just like to make sure we're managing the agenda and no councillor has that happen to them. So I'm letting you know at six o'clock and I would appreciate if we knew if we're going to run out earlier than that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, Councillor Cressy will not be attending today. Does anyone else have any timing issues? Councillor Bailao? Y yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I also have to leave at six o'clock. Okay, good. Um, if no one else does, I believe that means that we'll have quorum right through. I need a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting held on February 24th. Councillor Bailao? All those in favor, opposed? carried. Okay, members, today we have 95 items on the agenda. We're going to start our agenda run through at item TE 24.23, which is the appointments to business improvement area boards of management. I'll move the item. All those in favor, opposed, carried. <clears throat> Item TE 24.24, 35 to 50 Southport Street Public Art Plan. I'm going to move the staff recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Item TE 24.25. 
406 and 410 Keel Street, zoning bylaw amendment application preliminary report. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.26, Temple Avenue zoning amendment and rental housing demolition application preliminary report. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.27, 212 to 220 King Street West, official plan amendment, zoning amendment application, preliminary report. That's Councillor Cressy's. Councillor Layton, do you want to move this? Yes, thank you very much. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.28. 215 Lakeshore Boulevard East, official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment application, preliminary report. Councillor Layton. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.29, 25 Imperial Street, zoning bylaw amendment application, preliminary report. Councillor Mapp. I move these staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. We have a deputant on item 30 and a deputant on item 31. So that takes us to TE 2432, 401 Dundas Street, zoning amendment application, preliminary report, Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move um, an amendment. If the clerk can please put that onto the screen. Uh, one is to ensure that when we hold a public meeting, if sign language interpretation is required, that that cost will be borne by the applicant and we provide at the meeting. Uh, recommendation number two, and I'll just describe it very quickly, is to make the request that we set up a site plan working group uh, as well as traffic and uh, construction uh, management uh, uh, strategy when uh, when the time comes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take the amendment and the item together. I'm just going to wait for my screen to come back. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Item 24.33, 234 to 250 King Street East and 162 Princess Street zoning by law amendment application preliminary report. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'd like to move a motion and the clerk can please put that onto the screen. And uh, once again, it's uh, very comparable to the motion you would have just seen, uh, providing uh, ASL interpretation at the community meeting as required, as well as the permission, the direction to set up a site plan, uh, construction traffic plan uh, working group. Okay. Thank you. Taking the item and the amendment together, all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Item TE 24.34, 471 to 479 Queen Street East, zoning bylaw amendment application, preliminary report, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Again, uh, if I can ask the clerk to put the motion onto the screen. Uh, at this point in time, members will recognize what the motion will be about. Uh, uh, sign language interpretation, site plan, construction, traffic plan, working group. Thank you. Thank you. Taking the amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Item TE 24.35, 191 and 201 Sherburn Street, official plan amendment and zoning amendment applications, preliminary report, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. The final amendment, uh, comparable to the first three, uh, the clerks can please put that on the screen. Uh, Councillor, do you know what this is about? Uh, sign language interpretation provided at the public meeting, as well as directing staff to create the site plan, tra uh, traffic management, construction working group. Thank you very much. Okay, taking the item and the amendment together, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.36. Five, seven, nine, eleven, fifteen, and nineteen Cos Coburn Avenue 
and 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, and 40 Gowan Avenue, zoning bylaw amendment and rental housing demolition applications, preliminary report, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, uh, Chair, I have a motion there. Please, thank you. Councillor Fletcher, uh, the clerks have not received any motion from you on this Oh, item. okay. So it's a notice of community consultation, just the same one. I believe it's in there. That's fine. I don't think it's any different. So can we Sorry. just vote on the item? I just wish, wish to see. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So on the item, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Item TE 24.37, 380 Donlins Avenue, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application, Preliminary Report, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, this is another beer store application, as we know how many there are. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, they're all being converted. This is this one at Donlins and O'Connor, and I would pr proceed in uh, recommending the staff. Uh, the recommendations from staff. Thank you. Okay. On the recommendations from staff, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.3889 to 109 Niagara Street, authority to amend section 37 agreement. Uh, Councillor Layton. Yes. On behalf of the local councillor, I'll move the recommendations in the report. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.39, Vision Zero Road Safety Plan, right turn on red prohibitions for Toronto and East York. I'll move the item. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.40, Safety Review of Mill Street and Cherry Street, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I need to hold this item down. We're just waiting. Uh, we're working on a motion with city staff. It's not quite ready yet. Okay. Thank you. Item TE 24.41, car share vehicle parking areas, Stadium Road, Enduro Street. Councillor Layton. Yes, I believe um, clerks might be anticipating a motion. If they have it, I'll move it. If not, then we'll continue. I'll, I'll hold it down. Okay, we'll hold it in your name, Councillor Layton. Clerks do not have the motion. Okay. Yet. Item TE 24.42, construction staging area 102 through 118 Peter Street and 350 to 354 Adelaide Street West to Peter Street. Councillor. I'll Layton. move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 24.43, construction staging area time extension, 387 through 403 Bloor Street East, Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to move a motion if the clerks can please put that onto the screen. One moment, please. We're just going to, uh, well, one, oh, one well, moment. Uh, we can also hold it down. Well, just one moment, fine. just one moment. Uh, Councillor Wontan, we did receive a bunch of motions from your office, but but not one on this item. So we'll hold it in oh, your okay. name. Uh, yes, thank you. We'll resend it then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Item TE 24.44, construction staging area 1 through 25 DeFry Street, Councillor Wontan. Uh, thank you very much. I do have a motion on this. If the clerk uh, can put this one on the screen. Yep. There we go. Okay, thank you. We're just shortening, uh, obviously, the, the time of road occupancy. Uh, 
hopefully the developer can move faster on the construction, but also to ask them to establish the, uh, the monthly construction management working uh, discussion uh, with the local community and the affected stakeholders. Okay, taking the uh, amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.45, Construction Staging Area Time Extension, 158 Front Street, East Frederick Street, Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I do not have a motion on this, and I'll just move this to off the staff recommendation. And um, just to recognize that uh, much of Ward 13, it seems to be under construction, and it's uh, it doesn't seem to ease up. I know. I know this is a this the similar effect that's happening in, in many parts of the wards, but um, we're the smallest ward in the entire city. But it does feel like every street seems to be occupied with some type of construction activity. Thank you. Okay. On the item, then. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE twenty four point four six construction staging area. 125 through 181 Mill Street. Anyone want to guess whose this is? Mm -hmm. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cressy and I actually share the, the boundary. I believe much of the work is in his ward. Um, and uh, does uh, Councillor Layton want to move the motion or should I? It doesn't matter. Please go ahead, Councillor Wong Tam. Okay, um, we're just moving the staff, the recommendations in the staff report. Okay, on the staff recommendations, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 24.47, construction staging area 59 through 71 Mutual Street. <laughs> Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to hold this item down. Okay. Construction staging area 24.48. Construction staging area time extension 81 Wellesley Street East. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to move the staff recommendation and uh, just to once again recognize that uh, many of our streets are, are being used for uh, private construction, the facilitation of economy and development, and it just means that the public doesn't have access to their. Uh, right of way, and uh, and obviously when this happens in contiguous blocks, uh, literally it shuts down a, a good chunk of not just the, the 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 street, but sometimes the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, so on the item, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item twenty four point four nine, construction staging area TTC easier access program Donland Station Phase two and three. This time we're going to go to Councillor Fletcher. Thank you. See all the recommendations there for the elevator, and uh, I'll move those. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item 24.50, update on the construction staging area for the TTC second exit program, Donland Station phases two and three. Councillor Fletcher. Can I just check, uh, you know, you check with the clerks, please, Chair, if there was a secondary motion that's come in about pay duty officer for this one? We do have one motion from your office on this. So I'll put that up on the screen. I'll get that up on the screen. Thank you. Is this the one you were looking yeah. for? Yes. Yes, so we'll take uh, your motion and the item together. You can have our... Yes, I'd like to speak to that. Oh, please, you'd like uh, to speak Mr. to Chair. it? Thank... Yes, sure. of course. Go ahead. The floor you. is yours. Thank you so much. Um, this is a very difficult project because it's a second exit that's being built in a very uh, dense urban neighborhood at Dawn Lands. And it's a three-year construction period. It. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but... People's homes, they have a walkway that's built from home to home, from porch to porch. It's quite something. It's very intrusive. I just want to thank the TTC staff, 
I want to really thank Ms. Gray and all of her great people in, in traffic for listening to the neighborhood, for having a number of calls to get things sorted out. The last time this was at Community Council, instead of a three-year closure uh, for streets, I gave a two-month closure in order to have these community meetings to sort out what the final recommendations will be, and here they are today. So uh, thanks, everybody, for their patience and their hard work, and thank you to the neighbors who are living through this uh, for till January 2023. With that, I'll move all these recommendations, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, so on the item, all those in favor, with the amendment, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.51, construction staging area, 1285 Queen Street East, Councillor Fletcher. That is another one that I have there. Um, find those recommendations, Mr. Chip. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.52, construction staging area 276 through 294 Main Street and 144 Stevenson Avenue, phase two Stevenson Avenue, Councillor Bradford. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the staff recommendations, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.53, construction staging area time extension 342 through 346 Davenport Road, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll move the staff recommendations. Okay. On, this, on the item, all those in favor, opposed, carried. We have deputants on item 54, so we'll hold that down. Item TE 24.55, removal of on-street accessible loading zone, Olive Avenue, Councillor Layton. Yes, I'll move the staff rec or the recommendations in the report. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.56, accessible parking spaces, March 2021, delegated, Councillor uh, Bailao. recommendations all those in favor opposed carried item 24.57 parking amendments melville avenue between shaw street and christie street councillor layton yes thank you very much i have uh, to move a deferral i bet the, the, the residents have been un unable to get a petition i wonder why uh, during difficult times so we're still waiting on that from residents so we're deferring it to Oh, I'm sorry. I was under the impression you had a motion. Why don't we defer it uh, to September? September? Okay. I doubt people are going to be going door knocking between now and then. <clears throat> so let's give them a little bit of time. Okay. So on a motion to defer it till the September meeting. September. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. <clears throat> Item TE 24.58, parking amendments, Montclair Avenue, Councillor Matlow. I am the recommendation. Sorry, Councillor, I didn't make that out. I move the recommendation. Thank you. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.59, parking amendments, Gerard Street East, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you. I'd like to move the staff recommendations and to um, provide additional uh, on-street parking overnight extended. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE 24.60, parking amendments, Hambly Avenue, Councillor Bradford. Thank you. I'd like to move the staff recommendations, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.61, parking amendments, Waverly Road and Q Beach Avenue. Councillor Bradford. I'd like to move staff recommendations, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.62, traffic amendments, Arundel Avenue. Councillor Fletcher. 
I'd like to move uh, this, please, this recommendation, and uh, this is now putting the street back to normal after another second exit was built there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.63, extension of permit parking hours, Sumac Avenue, Sumac Street, Councillor Wong Town. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I'd like to move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.64, extension of permit parking hours, east leg of Sumac Street. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry? I beg your pardon. Um, one, one moment, one moment. On Okay, um, members, uh, there are two items on SUMAC. The first one, um, staff, well, the second one actually is more up to date. So staff are recommending that we reopen 63, withdraw 63, and then approve 64. And I believe, Councillor Wong Tam, your office was informed of that. So can I have a motion? Um. Do you want to just hold these and sort it out later? Uh, actually, I would prefer that just to make sure we get it right this uh, one shot. So I will confirm with my staff. They haven't spoken to me yet, so I'll just make sure that uh, that's in order. Okay. So the, the intention, Chair, is to withdraw 63 and then adopt 64. Is that okay. correct? That's correct. But to do that, what I'm going to ask now, just so that the record is clean, is that we uh, move to reconsider 63. Okay. Yeah, so all those in uh, favor so of reconsidering 63, good. And then we'll just hold 63 and 64 so that you can confer with staff and then we'll come back to them when you're ready. Fair enough? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And if I can just ask transportation staff to reach out to my office. Uh, these are two separate streets, uh, although they share one name. I uh, just want to make sure that uh, we're on the same page. Yep. I'll look forward to those instructions. Thank you. Very good. Okay, item TE 24.65, the realignment of permit parking area 13G to exclude the development located at 908 St. Clair Avenue West and 166 Alberta Avenue. Councillor Bailao. Thank you. Approve recommendations in the report. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.66, realignment of permit parking area two to exclude the development at 150 Sterling Road. Councillor Bailao. Approve recommendations in the report. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.67, realignment of permit parking area 5A to exclude the development located at 500 DuPont Avenue. Councillor Layton. I'll move the recommendations in the letter, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.68, introduction of overnight on-street permit parking, Cuthbert Crescent, Councillor Matlow. I move the staff recommendation. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.69, traffic calming poll results, Cottingham Street, Councillor Matlow. I move the alter alternate motion to approve the traffic calming. Okay. On Councillor Matlow's motion, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 24.70, appointment to the Scatting Court Community Centre Board of Direction, Board of Management. Councillor Layton. I'll move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 24.71, appointments to the Apple Grove Community Complex Board. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I'd like to uh, approve the staff recommendations, uh, which are actually from the meeting of Apple Grove. And to say it's very exciting board that one of the members is one of the Muslim Fellowship students that we had through our program a couple of years ago, and she's gone on to be 
onto this AR board. And another is a young man who's in Don Somerville revitalization that Apple Grove has been working with TCHC as the lead agency there, there and he is coming on the Apple Grove board. So I think this is just a tremendous um, shout out to our AOCs and how they're involving folks in the community, especially young, young people of color in the city of Toronto. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to move these. Okay. On the item, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.72, appointment of public members to the McCormick Playground Arena Board. Councillor Bailau. Uh, approve uh, recommendations in the report. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.73, appointment of interest group member to the Swansea Town Hall Board of Management. I'll move that. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.74, appointments to the Board of Management of Cecil Community Centre. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I'll move the staff recommendations. Okay, all those in favour, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.75, appointments to the Board of Management of Cecil Community Centre. It's the exact same title. That's correct. It's not a duplicate. Yeah, I get it, I get it. <laughs> it has the exact same title. But it has different numbers, so you can move this one too if you wish. Yes, I'll move the staff recommendations in both. Okay. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.76, request to temporarily close a portion of Maitland Street each east of Church Street for Cafe TO. Councillor Wong Tam. Oh, did we introduce all these yet? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, can I proceed? Okay, yes, go. 79. Okay, sorry, my mistake. Go ahead, Councillor uh, Wong Tam. Thank you. I'd like to. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to um, move the recommendations in my letter, and just to um, to point to the fact that this is a request uh, to try to be flexible uh, to support the Church Wellesley. Uh, village BIA and some of the neighboring businesses. I think that the CAFE TO program, as we can all recognize, has been an incredible lifeline for many of our struggling storefront restaurants, bars, and cafes. Um, and uh, there are probably uh, times where we have to be incredibly flexible to try to create that additional outdoor space for as many of the uh, participant uh, retailers as possible. So uh, you'll probably see a few more of these, uh, myself as a local councillor, moving to um, be as, uh, as innovative as possible to address the space constraints on the street so we can get more of the cafes uh, approved. And I want to thank staff because I know that I've been um, kind of uh, on their tail about trying to be as flexible as possible to expand the number of options uh, that are available on the streets. Uh, while we have a number of uh, restaurants and bars who want to all occupy the space, sometimes we don't have enough street space. So we're now moving towards the uh, flankages, and I'm hoping that staff can work with my office to ensure that we can give uh, these particular uh, restaurants the opportunity to have a, a competitive and viable summer. I want to thank Church, uh, Mouse, and Firkin uh, because they're going to be impacted and they'll have some benefits. Uh, and I want to thank the Church Street uh, uh, Garage Restaurant. Uh, same thing for them. Uh, I know this is important and uh, we're trying to work with you. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a good outcome and I'll look forward to the staff report coming back in June. Thank you very much. Okay, on the item, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.77, realignment of permit parking area 6K to exclude various properties in the St. Lawrence neighborhood. Councillor Wong Tan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the recommendations in the staff report. Uh, and just to recognize that when developers ask for a reduction of parking spaces and new developments, uh, the, the thing we don't want is the backdoor uh, uh, transaction afterwards where the occupants of those new buildings then take up on street parking uh, permits. We don't have it available. There's a limited supply. And if the developer is asking upfront for reduction of on uh, a, a reduction of uh, on-site parking, the provision of, uh, then we expect them to provide visitor parking or uh, additional temporary parking on-site. Uh, but it would be a gross uh, uh, injustice to then put that additional pressure onto the public space. Uh, thank you. 
Mr. Uh, Chair, I have a remark there, please. Pardon me? I'd like to speak to this item. You, you want to speak to this item? I'm sorry, your, your yes. microphone cut out there. Okay, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'd just like to support you, Councillor Longtam, in this. Uh, there was a recent story in the Globe and Mail featuring a property in, in my ward where people were very upset when they moved in and then the permit parking was not there. And staff pointed out rightly so that when the developer makes an application for a certain number of parking spots, that developer is essentially saying, this is all that's needed for this development. And I think that is how we should be measuring things. This is not a um, something evil for people moving in, but the developers already, as you correctly have said, stated that there is no more parking needed than what I'm applying for. And I think that our community council has come to understand that very well. And it's on the developer should people not be able to get parking after that. I do think they do have to be very clear with buyers. We recently, a while ago, put into the uh, developers had to put that into their offer of, of purchase that they would not be getting street parking because there is enough, according to the developer, for the residents who will be moving in. So I just wanted to strongly support you with that and raise that other point because it's becoming more and more a pressure point, as you as you correctly stated, stated, Councillor. Okay. Um, on the recommendation in Councillor Wong Tam's letter, all those in favour, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.78, request to evaluate the heritage potential of Dovercourt House, 805 Dovercourt Road. Councillor Bailau. Thank you. Um, I ask committee to support the recommendation on the letter. Okay. All those in favor, opposed, carried. So we have to add 79 to 95. Okay. I need a motion to introduce new business from items 79 through 95. Uh, Councillor Matlow. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay. We'll carry on with those items. Um, item 24.79, reopen item TE 18.78, turn prohibitions Bloor Street West and Perth Avenue. Uh, so first I need a motion to reopen it. Uh, Councillor Bailao, all those in favour, opposed, carried. And then on the recommendation in the letter delete part two and replace it with a revised part two. Uh, Councillor Bailao, I assume you're moving that? Y yes, I am, thank you. I'll move the recommendations in the letter. All those in favour, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.80, rescind alternate side parking on Robina Avenue and affix to east side. Councillor Bailao. Thank you, move recommendations in the letter. All those in favour, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.81, Residential Demolition Application 292 Dundas Street West. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I'll move the recommendations in the letter. All those in favour. You have a choice to make here. Yeah, it's a multiple. Between, uh, your, your letter actually contained two options. You can move to refuse approve without conditions or approve with uh, four conditions listed in the letter. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to give me a couple minutes to hold this down and figure out down. which one oh, okay. we had settled on. Yeah, okay. thank you. Good. Um, item TE 24.82, reopen item TE 16.49, request for changes to parking regulations in Ward 11. So I need a motion to reopen. Councillor Layton, all those in favour, opposed, carried. Uh, Councillor, over to you for how to dispose of this item. Yes, thank you very much. I believe there's an amendment. Sorry, it's part two, uh, is delete part three of the decision. Okay, so. With respect to TE 16.49. 
So on part two of your, your letter, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Mm -hmm. Item TE 24.833, oh, sorry, speed limit reduction south drive, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like uh, if you could support the recommendations in the letter. All those in those. favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.84, Muriel Street and Selkirk Street, all way stop, Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I'd like to introduce this and support the recommendations in the letter. On the recommendations in the letter, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.85, permit parking on Rosevere Avenue, Councillor Bradford. To move the recommendations in my letter, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.86, speed hump installation on Balfour Avenue, Councillor Bradford. To move the recommendations in the letter, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.87, speed hump installation on Dunkirk Road from Woodbine Avenue to Woodmount Avenue, Councillor Bradford. To move the recommendations in the letter, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.88, speed hump installation on Lockwood Road, Councillor Bradford. To move the recommendations in the letter, please. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.89, speed hump installation on Roblin Avenue from Plains Road to Cosburn Avenue, Councillor Bradford. I'd like to move the recommendations in the letter, please. For those watching at home, you are not caught in a time loop. Uh, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 24.90, speed hump installation on Whittington Avenue from Queensdale Avenue to Strathmore Boulevard, Councillor Bradford. I'd like to move the recommendations in the letter and add a note of thanks to Rachel in my office for these six items, uh, letters, and work with the community to make this stuff happen. Way to go, Rachel. Way to go, Rachel. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 24.91, Ivy Avenue slope stabilization. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, uh, this is an item from about 2012. So. Just gone back to see what hasn't been dealt with in community council that was an issue. And I'd just like to get this status report. This is a notional lane that the city owns on a steep hill behind uh, the railway track. So I'd like to have that result. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move those recommendations in my letter, Mr. Chair. Okay. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.92, request to assist the Bentley at 55 Lombard Street with private garbage pickup. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the recommendation in my letter and just to speak a little bit, a short, short period of time regarding the Bentley. Um, it is a uh, purpose built above grade parking garage. Uh, very few of them left in the city of Toronto. Uh, it was the first one in the city and the last one still standing from that era. Um, it was converted into a condominium and uh, and of course that's uh, it's a fantastic use. Uh, uh, many families uh, now have called uh, 55 uh, Lombard home um, but along with that conversion it meant that there was no uh, direct on-site uh, servicing for garbage pickup or removal. So literally the Bentley has to pull their garbage bins onto Lombard and, uh, and, a, and a truck will come along and take care of that. Across the way at Lombard and Church uh, is a new uh, condominium development uh, being developed by Minto. The city staff have given them a temporary uh, occupancy so that they moved onto the roadway, occupy the sidewalk and effectively narrowed Lombard. There are times when the narrowing of the streets not just uh, impact obviously uh, free pedestrian movement, the safety and health and well-being of the neighborhood, but in this case it actually created an unintended consequence uh, for the neighbors to the south, namely 55 Lombard at the Bentley, because now the garbage trucks are having difficulty uh, providing service uh, to that building. So we need staff to give us a hand to resolve this issue. We think the removal of one parking spot uh, should uh, should do the job, uh, but this is one of those tales uh, that we should be cautioned about is that uh, for every cause there's an effect uh, and uh, and now we need staff to give us a hand uh, to correct the matter and I look forward 
uh, to the work. I don't think it's going to be very uh, cumbersome, but it is uh, it is obviously necessary. And thank you everyone in advance um, uh, for your support. Okay, on the recommendations in the letter, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.93, request to temporarily close a portion of St. Nicholas Street from Phipps Street to St. Joseph Street. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. I'd like to move the recommendation in my letter and just to say, um, earlier I, I asked uh, members of this committee to provide us uh, 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 some support to close a portion of Maitland Street to allow for the garage restaurant on Church Street to extend and create a cafe Tio patio. Uh, this time we're asking uh, members of, uh, of City Council, Community Council to provide us some support to, uh, to temporarily close uh, a portion of St. Nicholas uh, Street so that cafe, so, so, so Bar Volo, uh, a very fine long time establishment uh, in our neighborhood can, uh, can possibly do the same thing. Uh, they do not have access to sidewalks. It's a laneway. It's one of those few European-style uh, restaurants and bars that kind of open onto uh, a bricked laneway. It's very elegant, um, and most of that laneway is providing servicing for local uh, stakeholders. Um, I recognize that, and I just want to acknowledge this because I think it's important. Many of us will be asked to do things that we generally aren't comfortable doing, especially during COVID. Um, uh, on very few occasions would I consider uh, supporting uh, what I think is the, uh, uh, the, the moving out onto the public uh, right away so we can actually provide a temporary lifeline to these businesses. And I suspect that many of my colleagues here on Community Council are being asked to support their businesses, their local restaurants and bars in the, in the same way. I think during the COVID times, we have to be uh, flexible and, uh, and part of the flexibility is finding ways uh, to a path where um, uh, there is a viable solution. So I want to thank city staff, uh, especially from transportation, because I know that I have been uh, very um, adamant that we take second, third, fourth, and fifth looks at applications, trying to find a path of approval for the, uh, the CAFE TO applicants. And I want to thank uh, all the restaurants that we've been in conversation with uh, I want to thank Barbolo for putting forward, uh, to be quite honest, their own solution, uh, the flexibility of staff to now say, let's take another look. And, uh, and in this case, I want to thank uh, Tyler Johnson from my office, who shepherded both the Barbolo file that you see before you today, uh, but also the er earlier uh, item regarding the Church Street uh, Cafe TO application. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Uh, so on the recommendations in the letter, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.94, Hogarth Avenue and Ingham Avenue, traffic safety and infiltration. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I'd like to uh, table this letter and uh, receive the recommendations, approve the recommendations. Thank you. Okay, on the recommendation in the letter, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, so this takes us to 24.95, undertaking public consultation for Hotel X Phase 2. Members and members of the public, I want to alert you, there is a revised version of this that's been posted. Over to you, Councillor Lee. I'll move the recommendations in the letter. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay. 58 minutes to do the run through. <clears throat> so we now go back to item TE 24.1, permanent closure to vehicular traffic, the north-south public lane west of Augusta Avenue between Richmond Street West and Queen Street West. I have no deputants listed for this item. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I'll move the recommendations in the report. All those in favour, opposed, carried. Mr. Chair. Yes. Councillor Fletcher, thank you. Just before we get too far, I meant to do this before you started that one. I, uh, since we're thanking everyone this morning, I just want to again thank our clerk staff. When we met last time, we were not in a severe situation with COVID. We are, they're here all the time. They're doing this job. They're keeping things moving. 
And as Councillor Wong-Tan pointed out, development certainly hasn't slowed down. So all the staff of the city are working full out during this really difficult time. And I think we just want to thank you very much as committee members. Thank you for that. Thank you. And it's true. I mean, it's really heroic what city staff are, are doing just to keep the business of the city going right now. Thank you, Ellen, and your team. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, before you move on, I just have a, a small point of order. Um, we submitted a new business item, a letter with regard to can the Canada Square Working Group, and I just didn't hear that come up uh, uh, when you went through new business. Could you just indicate that you have the letter? We do have the letter. Um, when we're doing the run through, the letters that we receive uh, by a certain cutoff point are done as part of the run through. Uh, mm -hmm. Things that we get past that, staff have to continue processing it to get it all up and public and on the agenda. And when we That's come fine. to it, yeah. we will introduce it then. Okay. I only worry that you hadn't uh, mentioned it. So as long as you've got it, I'm, I'm great. Thank you. You're, you're quite welcome. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have anything before we continue? Nope. Happy campers. Okay. Item TE 24.2, naming of an existing public lane located west of Salem Avenue, south of Shanley Street. Councillor Bailao, there are no deputants here. Uh, thank you. Approve the recommendations in the report and thank the residents that make this uh, suggestion uh, to have this laneway um, uh, named. This is actually the owner of uh, Paradise uh, Theatre. Uh, that has been recently renovated, but that had a huge uh, impact um, and uh, role in the uh, Italian Canadian community. This, this movie theater uh, used to play um, movies on the weekend, Italian movies, and it was like a little bit of a hub for the Italian community as well. So it's a great pleasure to be able to move that and to honor that uh, honor that legacy. Um, I had the. Uh, uh, the pleasure of uh, meeting them actually when I became counselor and I was super curious to see how we could bring this theater um, into life. <laughs> uh, I got a tour of this uh, very special place and uh, I know that it was uh, the family's intention as well to to have it as, as a theater in the future and I'm sure they're very pleased to see it remaining uh, as a theater so I think it is very fitting for the community and the city to honor him for um, all his work that uh, that he did along the many years uh, in, in that neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, on the item, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Members, if I could just remind you, uh, when you don't have the floor, to mute your microphones so that we can clearly hear what your colleagues are saying. Item TE 24.3, naming of an existing public lane in the block bounded by Harvard Street, Montrose Avenue and Crawford Street. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I also, I've switched devices and somehow it uh, works now on the other device. So to the clerk, thank you, but I can, I, I can do the mic now uh, and, and, and mute as suggested by the chair. Um, I would just like to thank uh, the individuals who brought this application forward. Um, I didn't understand this little bit of history in, uh, in Ontario, and I think it's uh, important for us to recognize um, uh, those that, uh, that, that, that move the bars. Uh, Ray Lucock was, isn't as recognized as the first woman sworn in as uh, MPP in the Ontario legislature, but she was elected in the same election. And uh, uh, Ray Lucock served the community I actually live in, and I didn't know that. Uh, it's a, a riding called Brackenvale, which if you can imagine it, put in your mind, Crawford to Dovercourt from St. Clair to the water. Um, this was uh, Bracken, Brackenvale, uh, flanked by Dovercourt, the riding of Dovercourt to the east, and Bellwoods uh, to, to, sorry, Bellwoods to the east and Dovercourt to the west. Um, but Ray was very active uh, from the beginning of the founding of the CCF to her election as a school board trustee and then uh, served in the Ontario legislature for many years and fought for things like free, free university education, and improving rural education, uh, better scholarships and funding for, for secondary institutions. And then um, she also promoted the idea of equal pay for equal work and paying homemakers uh, for the work they did inside the home. These are like certainly ideas that uh, 
uh, that still permeate today. And we hope that, um, that, that we continue to have strong leaders that will fight for that at the provincial level and we will encourage them to do so. Um, so I'm very happy that, um, that we were able to bring this forward and that this bit of history won't be forgotten and that the leaders of, uh, of this neighborhood will um, continue to reflect back on, on, on the ideas that uh, we should be bringing forth around building a more just and equal society. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that history lesson. Um, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, item TE 24.4, 646 to 648 Dufferin Street and 133 Boland Lane, official plan amendment and zoning amendment application final report. We have a deputant on this item, Dwaran Young. Dwaran, are you with us? Dwaran, um, the clerk staff advised me that you need to turn your microphone on or connect your microphone. Dwaran? Uh, Councillor Bailao, I'm in your hands. This is the only deputant listed here and we're having trouble communicating with her. Do you want to hold it down for a little while or? Uh, yeah, if we can hold it down just okay. to see if we can establish We'll connection. hold it down and see if we can establish a better connection. Thank you. Oh, Dwaran? Hello? Oh, there we go. Hello? Oh, hi. Oh, we hi. Got you. <laughs> Success. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for waiting for me. No problem. So, Dwaran, uh, you have five minutes to address the committee. You can start whenever you're ready. Um, I just wanted to ask the committee, um, because I live in this neighborhood right beside Dundas and Dufferin Street, and there's a lot of road accidents here. And it looks like in the report that there is a the laneway will be on the north, uh, the northwest side of Dundas and Dufferin. How will this affect traffic there? Because that slip road is pretty dangerous. So, Dwaran, um, unfortunately, we don't really do a question and answer format here. This is your opportunity to tell us what you want. Um, if you have the staff report, uh, you'll note that there's a contact information for the planner on the file. And also your local councillor, Councillor Bailao, I'm sure would be happy to answer any questions you have. But this is your chance to tell us what you think. Well, I just think that as, as it is, the Dufferin bus is always very packed. I don't know whether or not having more condos right along the Dufferin street is going to be the answer for what's happening here. And it is just, it's such a busy uh, crossroads. Having more condos and more people there, it's going to take away the charm from the Portugal for sure. And it's just, it's a huge amount of construction because it's technically two buildings and, and it's going to be uh, like, and so much construction in such little space. So I just don't feel like it's right for our neighborhood. Uh, but I will, um, I will contact the on the report and see if we can come to some sort of agreement. Okay. Thank you. Any questions of the deputy? No, seeing none. Uh, that's the only deputant that I have on this item. Are there any questions of staff? No, to, Councillor Bailao to speak. Um, thank you. I have um, a couple of motions. Um, so this is uh, an application that we had our uh, community meetings well before um, COVID um, and staff have been working with the applicant to deal uh, with uh, some of the issues around the laneway loading and loading and loading. This is a very tight uh, site. So I'd like to thank staff for uh, really working um, out solutions. Uh, it's a, this is a two small um, mid-rise uh, buildings that had a lot of challenges and staff really worked hard uh, to make this a development that works for everybody. Um, and so um, the motion that I have here, uh, one is to deal with the permit parking as well to ensure that uh, there's no permit parking um, given that the developer believes that adequate parking has been provided and staff is in concurrence, but um, this was something that we had agreed as a community would be important to have in there. 
And uh, the, the, the building does not um, uh, qualify for Section 37, but the developer is providing um, $250,000, $125,000 in one of the buildings, $125,000 in another of the building for um, community improvement projects. So um, because it is a voluntary contribution, uh, to the community, um, it could not come as a staff recommendation, and that's why I'm moving uh, this recommendation here. Um, as I mentioned, there were uh, there was a lot of work that staff did as well, and so there is some um, uh, wording around the loading that uh, I'm moving on behalf of staff, uh, and uh, so those are the three parts of this motion that I'm not moving forward and asking for uh, for your support. Thank you. Uh, any questions of the mover? Seeing none, anyone else to speak? No. All those in favor, we'll take the amendment and the item together. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.5194 through 1502 Dundas Street West Zoning Amendment Final Report. I don't have any deputants on this item. Uh, questions of staff seeing, oh, Councilor Neal, questions of staff seeing none. Councilor Bailao. Uh, thank you. This is the exactly same thing. This is uh, the developers developing the two small sites and the that's why the reasoning for the um, the motion that I moved on the loading because they are sharing uh, a loading zone. So staff had asked me to do with that. But so the motion is still with regards to permit parking and to the voluntary uh, section 37 or for the community as well. Okay, taking the amendment and the item together, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, TE 24.6, 50 through, sorry, 40 through 56 Harvard Street, official plan and zoning amendment application, final report. I have two deputants listed. First, Courtney Heron Monk. Courtney, are you with us? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Courtney. So you've got uh, five minutes to address the committee. Start whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of Community Council. My name is Courtney Heron Monk. I'm an associate with the planning and urban design firm Dose Fields Inc., who is the planning consultant to the University of Toronto. Uh, joining me as well this morning is Adam Trotter of the University of Toronto, available to answer any owner-specific questions that might arise. Uh, I'll be very brief. I just want to start off by thanking staff for all their efforts on the applications and for their uh, wonderful collaboration throughout the process. Uh, as outlined in the staff report, the applications would support the construction of a nine-story student residence building uh, which would form part of the university's St. George campus. Um, as we're all aware, and as expressed in the University of Toronto secondary plan, the St. George campus is an important institutional district within the downtown core. And this proposed student residence is an important component of the university's mandate to expand their student housing options on campus and fulfill the university's needs for additional student housing while addressing the broader citywide need for purpose-built uh, student housing. In addition, the proposal represents an important contribution to the institutional function of the campus in that it will provide students with the opportunity to live in close proximity to their classrooms, faculty, um, and campus resources. And in turn, uh, this will support the institutional function of the campus. And as it relates to the design, uh, the building's been designed and programmed to meet the needs of, of the students and the broader community. It includes a range of amenities, including student lounges, study areas, uh, outdoor and indoor common areas, um, as well as a food hall and an event space on the ground level um, that will serve both the university and the surrounding neighborhood. And another point about the design is that it was informed through a robust community consultation process that included feedback from a working group comprised of local stakeholders, including current students and members of the Huron Sussex Residents Organization. Uh, some of the massing changes to the building that emerged through the review of the application and our conversations with community members included 
a reduction in the overall height of the building from 10 stories to nine stories, a reduction in the overall floor to floor heights, and um, there was a slight increase in the floor plates for the upper levels of the building uh, in order to accommodate the unit mix. Um, and on the ground level, the proposal includes significant contribution to the public realm, including an expanded sidewalk along Harvard and a number of streetscaping elements, including new street trees, bike parking, seating areas, and lighting. Um, so we feel this is a high quality contribution to the St. George campus, and we're excited to see it come, come to fruition. Uh, so I reviewed the staff report and support the recommendations, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, are there any questions for Courtney? No? And if I understood, um, Adam doesn't need to make a deputation. He's just available for questions. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, correct. Okay. Uh, any questions for Adam? No. Seeing none, thank you both so much. That's all the deputations that we have listed on the item. Are there any questions of staff on this item? Seeing none, um, I seem to have lost a couple members of, of the committee on my screen. We could. My apologies, Councillor Perks. Um, I've changed machines and it's so it. No, no, it's not your fault. Page. I just don't have enough squares in the Hollywood squares here. Um, anyway, Councillor Layton, I'm going to give you the floor to speak to this item. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the staff recommendations and, and with thanks to uh, the local community, to city planning and to the university for all coming to the table in a, a, of a working group in a very open and I think, um, uh, and I think willing uh, process uh, that, that resulted in change. And I, I would say significant change. Uh, it, it, it also, though, it served a dual purpose uh, that, that these working groups do, and I think proves it very well when it when we have early involvement and when it's sustained and done with an open mind uh, and, and a creative approach, uh, we can land in a place where um, where everyone achieves what they would like to achieve. Uh, in, in this case, we had a lot of learning about what makes a, a student residence good for students um, while the uh, the architects that brought it forward. Uh, I had some learning about what makes the, the neighborhood a, a more livable place for the neighbors and we landed in a good spot as a result. So thank you to all involved uh, and we will, uh, that, that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak to the item? No, seeing none. Um, on the item then, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24, Point seven, three one five to three two five Spadina Avenue zoning bylaw amendment application final report. Uh, I have some deputants listed here. First, Chai Tam. Chai, are you with us? Hi there. Hello. Welcome. Um, you've got five minutes to address the committee. Uh, start whenever you're ready. Hi, my name is Chi Tam. I'm a friend of Chinatown Toronto, otherwise a groom, group known as FOCT. Um, I'm here to speak on the 315 Spadina application, obviously, and I'm speaking to you, the community council, but I'm also speaking today just to leave evidence for other organizers, other racialized neighborhoods in Toronto that have been looking to us and other families in other Chinatowns around the world who have also been following our work. This building is known to our community for context as the Roll Sand Building in reference to the renowned dim sum and seafood restaurant on site. It's also a building with unique culturally competent medical and health services that have clustered here in a very unique way. And so this building is already the home of cultural cornerstones and anchor services. This is a place that compels weekly visits to Chinatown from residents across the GTA. It's a, it's a place that soothes homesickness for newcomers that feel really lost and alone in this city. And so I just wanna emphasize that this is a place where you can still fill your stomach at Ding Dong Bakery for less than a couple of bucks. It's already delivering an incredible community purpose and essential services. And we deem the true character of this site to be affordability and cultural competency. Our group is not actually categorically against development and change. It's just that we have what we feel is a more meaningful vision for Chinatown's future. And we recognize what we already have on this site and oppose any development that does not maintain a bare minimum or add to this incredible place. So 
we find that it is structurally racist and embarrassing that the city of Toronto still cannot do the minimum of ensuring that a public process is multilingual. This is from the most multicultural city in so-called Canada, in a city that boasts diversity as its strength. It is honestly exhausting and traumatizing and racist to have to perform whiteness as I am doing right now to speak clearly in a measured tone in the tone I'm using to only have a sliver kicked back when we are losing so much from this application. We feel that Toronto really deserves better. And so what you will hear is that this application is delivering above and beyond the current community benefit standards and is precedent setting. But we just feel that we have more self-respect than to be excited by that. What that means to us is that the community benefit standards, the bar is so low, it is in hell. All of the community benefits on the table for this application will not last to the day that I have grandchildren in Chinatown. So by nature, both the affordable housing units proposed and the proposed retail motion are, we see it as delaying gentrification rather than actually safeguarding our neighborhood against it. What we hear when we are asked to celebrate this achievement is that our community's emotional labor has brought about your exceptionalism. So what you will also hear is that councillors and city staff have personal ties to Chinatown, but if you listen closely, the way they have spoken on Chinatown in the past has been in past tense. And when we hear about the need to recognize Chinatown's history, we feel that there's a huge neglect to fight for its current, its real real reality in the present. In our working group meetings, I want to disclose to other members of this council that we explicitly heard the developers and other white resident groups speak about a future where Chinatown does not exist, as if that's just a given. I can't understate how violent that was for some of our other members to hear, and, and it was wildly inappropriate in terms of Fox's entire experience engaging with the working group and the things we had to hear and internalize and make sense of together. You will also hear that change is constant in a neighborhood like this, as if that's some kind of rationalization for why this level of an application is acceptable. And you don't need to explain to a neighborhood that has been repeatedly displaced that change is constant. What I feel that more people need to understand is that we need to be interrogating what the nature of that change is for, and that accepting this is not value neutral. We've already lost the Bright Pearl building across the street from this application, and that building still stands empty. The level of intensification that has been planned for the downtown core is planned and is making the level of real estate speculation on this site and in our neighborhood possible. The fact that the downtown plan and this application conforms with that plan includes photos of Chinatown without mentioning the word Chinatown once is incredibly racist. The fact that a whole downtown plan is able to articulate other cultural precincts and other culturally significant areas of downtown to protect before enforcing that plan without considering Chinatown specifically is racist. And the fact that policy and planning and development teams are not diverse enough themselves to notice that from the outset when doing that planning work is racist cultural erasure through just growth planning and bureaucracy and all of this paperwork. So when you approve this application today, it will indeed be precedent setting for our neighborhood. We're just tired of hearing that the Chinatown study that is coming down the road is delayed or it cannot be binding. Hi, to I'm sorry, you've reached your five minutes. Could you just give us one final thought? I'm on my last sentence. My last okay. question is, what is anyone here going to prevent another application like this coming through the door tomorrow from displacing our already very, very harassed on the daily culturally specific businesses? It's heartbreak I'm speaking from, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions for the deputy? Seeing none. Um, next, we have Courtney Heron-Monk. Courtney, are you with us? Yep, um, I'm here again. Hi, Courtney. So you know the drill. You've got five minutes. Start when you're ready. Uh, thank you. Yes, again, for the record, uh, Courtney Heron-Monk, associate with Bowsfields, Inc. Um, we are the planning consultant to the owner. And I'm joined as well by Bernard Lutmer, who is on the call representing the ownership. Uh, I do want to take this opportunity to thank staff and the counselor's office for all their hard work to get to the get the proposal to this point for their efforts in continuing to advance this project. I want to acknowledge and thank the members of the community, um, including the um, woman that just spoke for her input and in, sh in shaping this proposal into um, what we feel is a progressive addition to the Chinatown neighborhood. 
Um, a number of community members took part in the working group and we want to thank them uh, for the meetings and all the follow up discussions that took place. They donated a lot of their time and effort and for that we are very grateful. Uh, the proposed rezoning would permit the development of a 13 story rental apartment building comprised of 219 rental units and seven unit retail units at grade. We've worked closely with staff in the community to implement um, a number of design changes that we feel are very positive. Um, these include um, changes that were informed through the working group process and um, representatives in the working group included the Friends of Chinatown, Friends of Kensington Market, the Chinatown BIA, and other members of the community. And through our consultation with the community, it was clear that the provision of affordable housing, the provision of an appropriate range and mix of units, and the pr preservation of Chinatown's character uh, were top priorities. And this feedback culminated into a number of positive changes to the proposal including the provision of 22 affordable housing units, smaller retail spaces on the ground floor, and a revised unit mix that includes fewer studio units and more family-friendly units, including 41 two-bedroom units, 21 three-bedroom units, and one four-bedroom unit. Um, in an effort to ensure the retail component fits in with the existing commercial character of Chinatown, the owner has made a commitment to create conditions that would be more favorable to smaller scale independent real retailers rather than chain stores. And these include limiting the size of the retail units, providing a universal washroom that would reduce the fit up costs for future tenants. Um, we've also discussed and reviewed the counselor's motion that will further support these goals and are supportive of the additional measures that, that he's put forward. Um, so we reviewed the staff report, we support the recommendations, and we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputy? And Courtney, once again, uh, you said that Bernard is with you. Does Bernard need to speak independently? Uh, no, he does not. Okay, thank you. Okay, seeing as there are no questions, uh, and that concludes our list of deputants. I'll ask, are there any questions of staff? No, to speak. No, I, yes, I, if I, I, I have three questions. Of, I, thank you very much. I just have three questions of staff really quickly. Um, the value of the affordable housing. Um, can, can someone on uh, the staff team tell us what the eligible value would be of the affordable housing had we or had this been a, a traditional section 37 amount? Uh, good morning, Councillor. This is uh, Kim Matthew Center from City Planning and Housing Policy speaking. Um, through the chair, the number of affordable housing units that we secure through section 37 um, at any given site depends on a number of factors, of course, uh, including you know the location of the development and the value of the land, um, market rents within the vicinity of the site, uh, the proposed unit mix, and both the length and the depth of affordability. Um, in this case, the applicant is also planning to apply to the city's open door affordable housing program, and the value of the open door incentives for which they would be eligible is contingent in part on the number of affordable units they propose to build. Uh, so that's another factor that kind of um, figures into the equation here. That's not the case at other at other sites. Um, but having said that, and given the estimated value of the Section 37 contribution for the site, uh, combined with open door incentives, uh, staff would expect that at least 12 units could be provided at 80% of the average market rent uh, for a 40 year affordability period. And we're achieving on the site. And the applicant's current proposal right now is 22 units at 80% of AMR for 40 years. Um, so staff are of the opinion that this would be a, a positive outcome from a housing standpoint. Uh, Care, I we don't have. I, I can't think of any buildings, including TCHC housing, that is a hundred percent rent geared to income. Is there a reason for that? Um, well, most developments that are um, one hundred percent RGI are provided through comprehensive government financing arrangements uh, through social housing development. Um, we don't secure RGI housing through Section Thirty Seven. But most of the buildings, in particular, a TCHC is a is is a mix. It's about a 50-50 split of market versus um, non-market 
affordable housing, correct? Uh, it depends on the site. Some of them are completely RGI, some have more market. Okay. Um, maybe what tools would we have to require affordable housing on a site like this? As it stands, we don't have any tools that we could require the provision of affordable housing. Uh, as Council is aware, we do have a draft inclusionary zoning policy framework that we're bringing forward later this year, but it's not currently in effect. Um, as currently and proposed, the third, sorry. No, I was just going to say, would this property fit in the um, in the current um, uh, designated tra protected transit areas? Does it fall within them? I can't comment on that. I'm not sure if it would fall within the within the, the range, but. Uh, I can say, as currently proposed with our inclusionary zoning framework, uh, with a purpose built rental like this, we would be looking to require between 2.5 to 5% of the new housing as affordable housing. Um, the current rate is about 10% uh, in this development, so it's a little bit different. That's something I think we need to change for sure. But uh, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm ready to speak whenever. Okay, are there any other questions of staff? Seeing, oh, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll just ask um, maybe two questions very quickly. Um, this is a, a question to planning staff, obviously. Is there any power that the City of Toronto has legally that will um, enable a, a, a moratorium on new development applications? So how do we stop this? from happening do do does the city have any legal powers to do so councillor it's linda mcdonald here um no under the current um planning framework we do not have the right to prevent a landowner private owner from uh, applying for development on uh, private land we can certainly shape that development and comment on it with the policy framework but we cannot prohibit uh, redevelopment so, so because of the, the framework that you, you suggest, if the province, uh, which, which basically owns and controls the planning act, our job is to, um, uh, to administer. Um, if the province was to give the city of Toronto or other municipalities additional powers to, um, to impose a moratorium, for example, um, is that something that we would welcome if the province was able to if the province was willing to give it to us, that, that power? Um, I don't believe the city has asked specifically for that power. I think there are uh, instances where the city um, would like to have a slightly more influence on development, particularly where there's an important resource that we're trying to protect or an important character of, of an area that we would like to be able to protect in a more uh, comprehensive way. And because the city hasn't asked for that power, would, would city planning support city council making the request to the province? Uh, as, and as professional planners, would you support city council if that request came forward to, uh, to give us the powers to freeze development while we complete studies or uh, cultural um, uh, plans? Is that something that, that you as a, our, our, our planning expert would support? I think we do. The one power we do have is the power to implement interim control bylaws, which gives us the authority to freeze development for one to two years. While we're undertaking a study, we have to be very clear about why we need to freeze the development. Um, that, of course, can be appealed when we, when we uh, implement an interim control bylaw. So that could still be appealed to the LPAT as any other bylaw can. Uh, we also have the powers under the Heritage Act to freeze development for a year when we're looking at a particular uh, heritage study. So we do have some degree of control um, in, in the context of doing a, a comprehensive study of an area. And, um, and how likely is it that um, an interim control bylaw on this site or in this neighborhood uh, would stand uh, an appeal? I think the, the challenge with interim control bylaw is an interim control bylaw is meant to stop develop as of right development. In this case, I'm, I'm not sure that the city would have a fundamental objection to an as of right development. This In this uh, application, it is a rezoning, it's asking for a change. 
on the site. Uh, Intim Control Bylaw would certainly freeze changes, um, but we would have to demonstrate why we believe that the as of right development should also be prohibited within the neighborhood. And it sounds to me that you don't feel confident yet that you can defend that. I would say it would be difficult here. I think um, given the request from council that we do a, a Chinatown study, I think if we are looking at doing a more comprehensive study, if it, we felt that uh, there was there were more threats to the neighborhood, you could tie something like an interim control bylaw to the study request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Seeing none. Um, Councillor Layton, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker and or Mr. Chair. Oh, and, I got promoted. Um, yes, and uh, I have a motion, and it's 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 quite long, so I'm I'm gonna try to give the gist of it, and then hopefully people can, um, uh, can can get details if they if they need them. The first part of the motion is to recommend that the owner be responsible for the fit up calls uh, uh, fit up costs of the initial leases and it includes a list of things um, and, and in addition to that universal washrooms for commercial units um, so that they don't need to be provided in each individual unit um, or a cost per square foot of the initial fit up uh, fee uh, depending on if the um, if the new um, leasee would like to do the fit up themselves um, the second piece is that the owner shall uh, um, shall establish a initial commercial base rents comparable to existing rents plus the CPI index calculated from the date of the zoning bylaw to when the units are occupied, essentially a rent freeze on the commercial uh, the commercial rents in this space. Um, uh, uh, number nine is the owner shall commit to offering each commercial unit to the existing tenant, so a right of, of right of first refusal, and then there is a bit of a uh, of the description about how that might uh, how that might work, and if two if two existing tenants want the space in the end, or or occup would occupy all the spaces. Um, number ten that the owner shall not lease commercial space to any chain stores on the site, and then there's a definition of chain stores. As defined by um, the types of retail activities or sales establishments with along with 11 or more other retail sales establishments located in the world, maintaining 2 or more of the following features and lists some features that definition comes from San Francisco's um, formula use retail uh, bylaw. Um, number 11 is at the end of the offer period of the existing tenants. Should there still be vacancies, the owner shall establish a working group comprised comprised of members of the local community. Um, organizations and agencies to provide guidance on uh, prospective tenants and establish a set of principles for enacting for attracting commercial tenants and offering leases that include but are not limited to promoting the return of businesses and services displaced by development, promoting the selection of tenants who are sm of small businesses defined as having five or fewer full time employees, promoting the selection of retail commercial tenants. That reflect the diversity and character of the area, including those that promote the cuisines, art, language, cuisine, um, sorry, customs and health, and allowing uh, agencies serving the local community to have the opportunity to grow on the site. Uh, one thing of note is there was a proposed additional amendment that had a sunset period on these this series of amendments that has since been deleted from the proposed amendment. So there will be no sunset clause on particularly on. Um, recommendations eight and uh, sorry 10 and 11 uh, here this has been one of the most challenging files uh, of uh, of mine in, in the time I've been a, a city councilor and it's not because of the size um, it's because of, of a couple of things one very early in the process it revealed that, that that there is structural racism in the approach that we use for community consultation and that there needed to be um, some changes to the way that we conducted that uh, that consultation in neighborhoods with communities uh, or with some communities that that needed to be addressed. And I'm happy to say that I think planning 
uh, planning rose to the occasion when this was point, pointed out. And I would like to thank the Friends of Chinatown and others who, who pointed this out at an early stage that um, that the consultation was simply inaccessible because of a language because of a language barrier. And uh, one of a, a, a series of reasons why it was inaccessible, um, but uh, our, our local planner did uh, rise to the occasion and ensure we started to try to meet and address some uh, of those uh, barriers to um, accessibility uh, of, of our process to that uh, to that community. Um, I'd like to also uh, point out that it revealed um, the inadequacy of some of our planning tools to address this notion of protecting vulnerable people and businesses from displacement uh, through development, through gentrification. Um, we did, we, we searched deep and hard as to what tools would we have in the toolbox to help address this. And there weren't any there. We got to the bottom and they weren't any there. So what did we do? We invented some new ones. And I'd like to thank, the, I thank our city staff. Uh, I, I'd like to thank Ren and Maladin uh, and uh, their managers for having an open mind to allowing us to experiment with the boundaries of our uh, of our, our powers under under our review of bylaws, and in particular around addressing issues of retaining the cultural relevant retail and affordable retail on the site. So things like a freeze on retail units, things like uh, banning chain stores, things like addressing this issue of having culturally significant businesses in neighborhoods that, um, that, that deserve that recognition and deserve to be able to uh, maintain that, that cultural identity. It's not perfect. We didn't get far enough. We're only scratching the surface here, but we're also on new ground. And, and I'm, I'm keenly aware that, that, that this direction in how we protect our cultural resources may go off in a direction that smarter people than I will come up with, with, with better mechanisms and tools to do the job. Um, but we wanted to start coming up with what that looked like. Now we got here and we got some of the other changes in the development from a couple of things. Um, one is I think a, a, a willing developer. And I don't, I don't speak well of developers on every occasion, um, perhaps on, on very few occasions, but I will say this, um, there was a willingness from the very beginning to change where possible under our existing capitalist model of redevelopment and our planning regime. There was some willingness. We did see change in the unit mix. We saw change in the affordability uh, and an and, and affordable component brought into the site that didn't need to be there from the developer's perspective, but they brought there. And we saw a willingness to consider some of these new tools um, to retain the culturally relevant retail and the affordability of that retail. You know, if, if if, if the developer wanted to, I'm sure they could walk up to the LPAT and have all of that thrown out. I'm confident they're not going to, and, and I've been given every assurance that they're not going to, um, which allows us to start testing the boundaries of some of these new tools that we've, uh, th that we've come up with. But we also wouldn't have been here without the work of local activists, without the work of the Friends of Chinatown and other residents uh, in, in, in the local vicinity uh, that came to meetings and dedicated time to voicing their concerns despite the fact uh, that that there are disagreements with fundamentally how land use planning is done in the in in the city and in the province, uh, and I respect that. Our system needs to change. Um, we will. We we need to be part of that change as a city. We need to be pushing the boundaries to ensure that um, that, that the province knows that there is a better way of doing this. Um, we have done that through inclusionary zoning, where we we kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Sometimes protesting, sometimes in in public. In, 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 in private meetings, but we, we we managed to get them in that direction. Now our current government is back. We won't we won't get too far uh, into that. Um, I, I would say though that uh, uh, there, while there is much to be desired in the planning process, um, I don't know if there's much further that we could have got on this file towards that end while keeping this out of the hands of the LPAT and uh, and the members that uh, that that don't come uh, that that aren't from the city of Toronto and can't. Uh, don't understand the significance and importance of uh, of neighborhoods like Chinatown and, and the affordability of retail within them. So, with my with my sincerest thanks to um, the activists and friends of, and, and and residents and friends of Chinatown, um, with the recognition to the developer for uh, for coming forward in a willing way to uh, to see some change rather than going to the LPAT, and th my thanks to city staff for for their continued. Uh, work uh, on this file and, and being a little bit 
I think, more creative in the approach uh, that, that, that the community was demanding of them. You will see in the coming, and this is my last point, you will see in the coming uh, meetings, we weren't quite ready to move ahead today, um, but a motion that will direct city clerks to broaden their, um, their note, their, the language is used in their notification and the resources that are brought to the table to ensure that uh, communication and consultation with our communities around not only planning files, but a wider range of the way the city communicates with certain uh, with, with some communities is uh, is more inclusive and, and starts to try to, scr to scrape away some of these structural uh, uh, barriers. Um, we weren't quite ready. We were going to bring it forward today. We weren't quite ready with, with the language, but we are still working on it. And I, if, if any of my colleagues on the call have suggestions, uh, I am certainly ready to, uh, uh, to, to bring that forward. Um, and thank you all very much for the extended amount of time I no doubt had. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I see uh, uh, Councillor Wong Tam first. Where is yours? Uh, Chair, I have questions of the mover. Oh, questions of the mover. My, my, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam, did you want to ask Councillor Layton questions or did you wish to speak? Uh, I just wish to speak, but okay. I, I, but Councillor Bailao's hand and and Councillor Matlow's hand went up before mine. I, I, I'm very sorry. I, I the screen is just impossible for me to work off at times, so I don't always see all of you. Uh, Councillor Bailao, you had a question. The mover. Yes. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, to the mover. Um, super interesting approach. I think you are pushing the boundary. Really interesting. Some logistical question. Um, are you securing this through the section 37 or is it on title? How, how are you securing the stuff around the, yeah. Um, yeah. No, the commercial? I'm proposing that we secure it over the 37. Um, I appreciate that there are some concerns that we're, we would be unable to um, administer and enforce these pieces. Um, but we, we also put on 37 other elements of a site plan that we can't enforce. Um, so uh, I'm suggesting it go, it go there. There is going to be some, um, some faith put in the developer uh, on the site that, the, that they will follow through because there are a relatively few, a few enforcement mechanisms for things like this. If I could find an op, if I, if I could find an angle to ensure that we uh, were able to enforce it, I would take it now. I think that that's part of the inadequacy of these these new made up tools. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Any other questions of the mover? No? Okay, so we'll go to speakers. I had Councillor Wong Tam, then Councillor Matlow. Anyone else? No? Nope. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And I just want to um, just offer some, some, some thoughts as I was watching this uh, proceeding unfold. Um, I want to first of all say to Councillor Layton, um, bravo to you uh, and uh, to your creative team. I know that works in your office uh, that probably would have grappled with finding a resolution forward that would have not been as simple and straightforward. The motion you've put forward today uh, is something I don't believe any of us, any one of us have ever seen. And uh, and by, by way of even being able to table it, it, it seems to me that you probably may or may not have gotten the full support of staff, but if you did, good for you. Uh, but if you didn't, uh, good for you anyways, because uh, you're, you're moving it. Um, I just want to recognize that, you know, these type of applications are, are not without emotional fraught. And, uh, and oftentimes uh, we, we want to be able to, to do the best that we can to support a community that feels that they've been slighted and, uh, and they probably have been, but also recognizing that we have to work within the bounds of, uh, of, of, uh, of a planning act uh, that is legislatively um, uh, administered by the city of Toronto. And that means that we have to make some really difficult decisions. I know that Councillor Layton and his community have wrestled with this application. I think that by coming together uh, through the, the conflicts of the push and pull, there is a resolution that's before community council today that would not have been there, uh, that would not have been placed uh, if, if that conversation, even as difficult as it has been in times, uh, not uh, been, uh, been, been present. And I just want to just uh, highlight that, you know, in my question to, to Linda McDonald, who we know as an esteemed city planner, um, if there was a way for city staff to be able to control and to exert more force 
on the outcome of this uh, application uh, with respect to the pending Chinatown cultural study, with respect to the, the, the planning process, I am very confident that they would have gone there. Um, but uh, about last, we all recognize that, uh, that when it comes to land use planning and, and development in Toronto and every other municipality, town and region in, in, the, in the province, we are oftentimes subjected to what happens um, through the appeal process. And if the application left the city without a negotiated um, uh, arrangement uh, or an outcome, which is what is before us today, the outcome for the community would be far worse absolutely um, uh, insensitive and I suspect uh, an outcome that no one would be happy with. Um, and in this case, uh, perhaps the, the arrangement um, and consideration before us is, is as good as it gets, but even as good as it gets, it's better than um, what many of us would have anticipated just because of the extraordinary powers that the province has, the extraordinary sway that the appeal process has um, and, uh, and the planning process. I want to just speak for a, 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 a brief minute or two regarding Chinatown. Um, as someone who is also of Chinese descent, uh, someone who came to the country um, in Canada back in the 1970s, um, Chinatown was one of the first places that my mom and dad would take me to. But it's not the Chinatown today. Uh, it was actually a different Chinatown. Uh, Dragon, uh, Dragon um, uh, City Mall uh, was not what we know of it. Uh, neither was Chinatown Center. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's important for us to recognize that Chinatown over a period of years has already, through the decades, evolved. Have those new developments um, eradicated the cultural identity of Chinatown? I don't think so. Uh, at least it has changed it for sure, but it certainly has, hasn't moved it out of the way and, and eradicated in the sense that um, we don't have small, uh, fine grain retail. We actually do. Uh, it's oftentimes in, situated in the mall. The footprints of those retails are very um, uh, unique and 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 uh, and intimate, uh, and uh, and it's certainly not the footprint that you would see uh, in, for example, at the Eaton Center. Uh, nothing close uh, comes to it with respect to the Chinese style malls that have been built, and that was an addition on top of the history of Chinatown in its making. And prior to that, my mom was actually uh, working in the garment factories on Spadina. And uh, so we know that Spadina Avenue in many ways was actually an industrial area where people came to, to participate in the, the manufacturing of goods and services for Torontonians. And this is when Toronto was, uh, was even more of a prominent uh, industrial city. Uh, we manufacture goods locally. We made them and designed them here in Toronto. And, and women like my mom, who didn't speak English, uh, who called Chinatown her home uh, and, uh, and made it her own, uh, would have actually worked and been employed there. Uh, of course, much of the manufacturing that used to take place uh, in Chinatown, as well as in the other factories uh, in the city, have all changed largely because of uh, how uh, goods and services are manufactured today. Uh, but it doesn't change necessarily uh, because the buildings have changed. It changes because the uses have changed. And I want to offer this as a, as a thought. Um, I've been fascinated with the, the conversation around heritage preservation for some time. And I think that uh, for, for us, what's important uh, in terms of the recognition uh, of, of community activity, it's actually not always just the buildings that are of cultural uh, importance and value. And I think that we know this with our with the work that's happening uh, in the church in Wellesley Village, whether it's happening uh, in Little Jamaica, it's the activity that brings the people together, and it's what happens within the walls, in the the piazzas, and the open spaces, in the marketplaces uh, that actually creates the cultural dynamism of a community, and that's how we have always clustered together. So by way of Councillor Layton's motion, in trying to enshrine and shrink wrap some of that, I think he's doing um, a, a very good job, very innovative job of trying to preserve the cultural uses of those spaces, even if the built form changes. And, and, and I, I wanna just commend him and his community for working so hard uh, to that outcome, because it would not have been necessarily uh, straightforward. And then finally, if I may, Mr. Chair, 
you know, um, there has been acknowledgement, I think, uh, on, on, on everyone who's spoken with, especially Councillor Layton and, uh, and the Friends of Chinatown, about how inherently racist uh, the planning process and perhaps some of the government processes are. I want to just uh, offer an additional extension of thought. Uh, one of the reasons why I've moved motions to provide childcare provisions at community meetings, as well as sign language interpretation to provide some some food, just uh, when during pro, uh, COVID, before COVID, when we were coming together in physical spaces, is because the system is actually very much, um, as we all know, exclusionary. It's not just racist, it's sexist, and it's classist, and it's ableist, and if you don't speak English, obviously uh, you cannot participate. So as Councillor Layton has noted, we have a long ways to go, and I look forward to working with him uh, to make sure that we can get to a better process, a more inclusive process, and I think that this difficult file, and I know it's been difficult for him and his staff, um, has already pushed us forward in a really structurally sound way to making some systemic changes that are long overdue. And I want to thank everyone involved. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. I want to just uh, contribute in the same spirit as Councillor Wong Tam. Um, my acknowledgement, first of all, for uh, Councillor Mike Layden and the work that he's done. Um, uh, as he was speaking, I was I was thinking uh, not only about how thoughtful he is when it comes to the approach he takes to these really, really difficult uh, challenges, but also uh, anyone who knows him personally knows of his um, his 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 personal relationship with Chinatown and his commitment and dedication and and care uh, for its its heritage and its future, uh, along with um, celebrating its identity and its culture. Um, I'm going through a, a similar exercise in Little Jamaica where the community and I are going through a process to ensure that we both um, uh, preserve the uh, unique, uh, in, in that context, the Jamaican and Caribbean and African diaspora character and identity of Little Jamaica, but also make sure that we take steps to protect its future. And what Councillor Layden has worked on um, is you know very similar. I, I often use the the metaphor a toolbox and sort of looking in that toolbox for what tools we have, and what tools do we need to invent where they don't exist today. And as was said by the other the other speakers before me, we have a very limited toolbox because we've got a screwed up planning process in Ontario. It, it is it is it is so challenging when uh, and I'm sure Councillor Layden is hearing this. When when people say, well, you know, why are you allowing this to happen in the first place? Why did you allow this application to even be submitted? This is so wrong. How could you allow for that? Councillor Layden, like the rest of us, is put in a position where he has to uh, consider pragmatically if this goes to the LPAT and you lose all control. None of these tools that he's even trying to find or trying to create might even come into play. And what he's trying to do is really with so much thought and so much care, ensure that the interests of the community are reflected in the development, even though he had said earlier, it's not the perfect development that he would want either, but it's so much better than what could have happened otherwise. And I just want to acknowledge that because we're all in those positions from time to time when we have these developments that we wouldn't have chosen, we wouldn't have asked for, we wouldn't have sought out, the community is upset and justifiably so. And our job is to fight to the end of the earth when necessary, but also recognize when, if you fight just to fight or just to look popular, you'll actually not serve the community's interests because it'll end up so much worse than it otherwise could have been or would have been if you hadn't intervened. So I wanna thank Councillor Layden for the work that he's done. And I wanna reassure the community but the best thing that we can do together is demand that this provincial government make changes to the planning act to the planning process so that we actually can gain the tools on the ground to reflect the community's interests in every development application for every neighborhood to make sure that the community's interests come before the interests of the development industry and if this provincial government isn't willing to listen to us 
we need to work together to replace this provincial government. And I'll conclude on that. Thank you. Anyone else to speak? Councillor Bailao. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I, I, I too want to thank um, the three willing partners that I think came to um, this uh, a, arrangement and agreement that I think will serve this community well, but I think it will serve all of us well. As previous speakers said, we've all had you know these very difficult. We are facing these very difficult applications, and I think that um, the innovative thought that was put around some of these uh, tools that we're going to try out in this application will help all of us. Um, so I thank you, Councillor Layton. I'm sure this was a ton of work from your office and your team. Thank you to the community for pushing the boundary, but to be willing to be at the table. I am sure that a lot of these things come from the experience, the firsthand experience of those business owners, what they need to succeed and to maintain, to, to be kept in this neighborhood. Uh, so. Thank you to all of them uh, and thank you to having a willing development partner as well, because as Councillor Layton said, um, you know, if we don't have that, um, it gets very hard to get to to something like this. So when we have these three um, parties coming together, we really don't need an LPAT, really don't need to have an LPAT. Um, and uh, that is always the you know, the the pressure that we all have, but we know that the city can come together with communities and the development industry to put together good projects with very, very, very limited tools like has been has been said before. But I think that uh, I want to thank uh, all of them for bringing together an application that brings some affordable housing, um, uh, addresses the issue of the small business and, and the heritage of, of the, the cultural heritage of that community. And uh, I want to echo something that Council Wong Chen said, because I think we're also grappling with this in, in very different communities. And I think she's absolutely right. You know, when we talk about heritage, Hi. we tend to focus just on the physical. Are those letters that they and heritage is much more than just that, as we see from different um, uh, uh, tools and, and different studies that we're looking at and different conversations that we're having across the city and different communities that, that we've seen being pushed out. And sometimes in the cases, the buildings haven't changed much, but they continue to be pushed out. And I think what, what is interesting with uh, some of the tools that Councillor Layton put forward in here is the recognition of not, not only the physical space, but that connection and intersection between the physical and some of the economic issues and some of the social issues that are that need to be taken in consideration through this planning process. Planning cannot just be about the physical state of the building, but is creating that situation for that social interaction to happen and social outcomes to come through. So um, thank you for uh, for uh, pushing the boundary a little bit forward. If more, I think all of us are going to be looking at, at uh, this motion and taking uh, some ideas. Uh, uh, from from this as well, um, I know that uh, the community feels like it's not enough. Um, I just say, uh, you know, it's a big step forward, and we need to continue pushing for for um, uh, innovative ideas and pushing the boundaries uh, to make sure that we get uh, the uh, the end results that uh, that we all want. So, thank you, everybody involved. Thank you. Do any other members wish to speak to this item? Seeing none. Uh, you know what, because it's such an interesting motion, I'm going to suggest we have a recorded vote on Councillor Layton's motion. I just want to do that. I feel that what, like burning need to do that. Okay, so on Councillor Layton's motion, all those in favour, please raise your hands. I have Councillor Bradford, Councillor Bailao, Councillor Matlow, Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Layton. Councillor Fletcher, are you voting? Well, you got Councillor Perks. Councillor Fletcher, are you voting on this? I, I don't seem to have a vote from Councillor Fletcher. I'm just going to hang on a minute, guys. Sorry to do this. I feel like I need her vote to be recorded. Da, 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 da. 
Councillor Fletcher, we're doing a recorded vote on Councillor Layton's uh, motion. Can you hear me? Hello? Hi, we're doing a recorded vote. Oh, Councillor Fletcher is in favour. There we go. And uh, in the chair, Councillor Perks, so that's unanimous. So on the item, all those in favour opposed carried. I think if I could, if I could, Councillor Perks, I'd just acknowledge the, uh, like the absence of, uh, of, of Councillor Cressy, the other um, uh, Councillor for Chinatown. Um, he, he is the Board of Health Chair, and I know that he is away on, uh, or not at this committee, because he's away on critical business, and he is supportive of the application. So I would uh, have the amendment and application at this stage. Good. Thank you for, for that. Okay. So we did the motion, yeah? Okay. And we did the item. Okay. So that takes us to... Item 24.8350 Vaughan Road, City Initiated Zoning Bylaw Amendment Final Report. I have two deputants listed here. First is Adrian Litovsky. Adrian, are you with us? Yes, I am here. Hi, Adrian. Uh, I am here. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? So, yes, I can. So, you're going to have five minutes. Start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, by way of introduction, my name again is Adrian Latavsky. Uh, I am the plan consultant uh, for the landowner in this case. And uh, before uh, I get into my very brief presentation, I do want to thank both city staff and Councillor Matlow and, and his office. We have been working closely with them as we move this item forward, and we very much appreciate their efforts. And I, I believe it has been a very good and, and helpful process so far. Uh, my presentation is going to be very brief indeed. Uh, the purpose of this application or uh, these amendments is uh, to allow what is in fact an already approved development, uh, site-specific bylaws were brought forward and approved by City Council back in 2017 for this townhouse development, or rather I should say this housing development. Um, the purpose of these amendments today uh, is to simply allow the phasing of the development. There are no physical changes proposed to the already approved um, site plan. And uh, the reason for the phasing is to is the fact that three of the units that are proposed uh, and the and upon which they will be built uh, are they're ready to go. Uh, they, they can proceed uh, immediately. However, the remainder of the site remaining six units, there are still some remedial work done on the site and uh, that second phase can and will proceed once the record of site condition is secured there. And so uh, having said all that, all the details are indeed set out in your staff report uh, as And otherwise, I'm really just here to answer any questions that there might be. Um, staff so thank you very much thank you are there any questions of the deputy i don't see any we'll move to the next deputant aaron arkin aaron are you with us i am can you hear me okay yes i can so you'll have five minutes aaron start whenever you're ready all right thank you very much chair i'd like to thank of course uh councillor matlow and his staff specifically denise mcmullen and Catherine young from the community planning staff for their assistance um councillor matlow said something fairly astute a few moments ago where he said the community interests come before the developmental ones uh when he was speaking about little jamaica and i think this is a perfect example of that i'm a resident of cherrywood avenue which is the street that intersects with vaughn road where this construction site is i pass by the construction site on a daily basis uh no issue with the fact that the construction needs to take place most residents i've spoken with were opposed to the density of the site nine units in this very small area yet somehow the application has been approved so we're fine with that we have no choice but to accept it i'm not going to try to appeal to emotions i'm rather going to appeal to common sense and reason in this specific instance 
Now, uh, the developer or any of the project uh, people with the site really haven't been able to offer a reasonable justification as to why the site needs to be split into two phases. Um, the remedial work that the applicant mentions here uh, is soil testing approval. Uh, the soil has not been passed by the Ministry of Environment. Uh, and the fact that half the site has had approval and the other site is still requiring at least two more years of testing should be a red flag, not only to the community, but also to anybody that would be interested in purchasing a house with such proximity. The issue I have personally with this idea of splitting this into two phases is that Twice the construction means twice the disruption to the residents of the area. Cherrywood is a very small street. There's a school in the middle of it, so there's a lot of traffic that will come through in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, so the construction in two phases is not ideal for the area or the community or for the flow of traffic coming in and out. Uh, further, the construction, the current transportation plans, which have yet to be approved, uh, involves trucks using a laneway in order to access the construction site for this proposed first phase. Using the laneway that residents, children, dog walkers uh, use to move through from street to street behind this busy Vaughn Road doesn't really seem feasible given the size of the laneway, which is only three meters wide, and the further disruption to the residents who use that laneway to park their cars for their homes. So, Three main concerns, really one, the disruption to the local area more than one time. We all understand there needs to be construction, but we want it to happen once and not have to live through two separate constructions. Um, most some of these plans have yet to be approved by the appropriate bodies, be it the transportation plan or the soil testing plan. So that's obviously of a concern to the residents uh, and. The residences being close to all this contaminated soil, I think, should be a concern not only for the developer, but also for the residents that currently live in the area. Um, I think that fairly accurately summarizes the points that I'd like to make. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputy? No, seeing none. Uh, I believe that's all the deputants we have listed for this item. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Matlow. As, um, as you can hear, it is self-evident that there is still some work to be done in this conversation. Um, so we're not ready to move forward today. I'm moving a motion to defer this item to the next uh, community council meeting. Uh, so, uh, so to ensure that both the owner and the local residents, uh, one of whom you heard from today, uh, we have an opportunity to uh, to see if we can resolve uh, questions that are that are that are remaining. Okay, so we have a motion to defer for one cycle. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. Item twenty four point nine. Uh, 244 to 260 Church Street Zoning Amendment Final Report. I have uh, two deputants listed. First, Lincoln Lowe. Lincoln, are you with us? Hi there, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome. Uh, okay. You'll have five minutes to address the committee. Please start as soon as you're ready. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of Community Council. Uh, my name is Lincoln Lowe. I'm a principal at the planning firm of Malone Gibbon Parsons. I am the planning consultant for the owners of 91 Dundas Street East, which are the lands immediately abutting uh, the proposed application at 244260 Church Street uh, to the north and to the west. Uh, my client's lands are currently occupied by a two-story building. Uh, it's the one with the Santuka Ramen uh, restaurant on the ground floor uh, and a second floor above. Uh, while we do not have immediate concern with the height and density proposed uh, by the Church Street application, my client continues to have concerns uh, about the setbacks or, or lack of setbacks uh, to their lanes. I understand that my client has expressed opposition to this through correspondence dated November 2020, uh, as well as January 2021. Uh, and when I speak about set setbacks, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the setback uh, from the proposed development to the southern property line of my client's lands. The proposed Church Street application is proposing a, a zero meter setback at the ground floor. Uh, it, it increases to a three meter setback at the mezzanine and second floor, uh, and then it goes back to a zero meter setback uh, from the third floor upwards. 
Uh, there's actually an excellent illustration of this, uh, of, of what this looks like in uh, attachment 13 uh, of the staff report. Uh, from the illustration, you can see that the, uh, the cantilevering from the third floor upwards uh, of the proposed development will block sky view from my client's building perpetually. I uh, also contribute to my client's building to be in shadow uh, for the majority of the day. Uh, there are currently three large floor to ceiling windows uh, on the second story, uh, and you can see that on the illustration as well. Uh, that currently provides great sunlight to the building. These windows will be rendered uh, ineffective from this development. The proposed Church Street development provides what is in essence, uh, for lack of a better term, a cubbyhole uh, to the second story of my client's building uh, and is, in my opinion, not an appropriate interface to maintain the building's existing function. Additionally, the zero meter setback on the ground floor will require that my client relocate a drainage pipe that currently runs diagonally across the rear of its building. The impact of the proposed development will have on the existing functions of my client's building is immediate and it is permanent. Uh, beyond that, the proposed development will also restrict the redevel redevelopment potential of my client's lands in the future. Uh, you will see from the um, attachment 13 illustration uh, that the proposed development is essentially limiting the existing dwelling to what it is currently, which is a two-story building. This is despite the fact that my client's lands have an as of right zoning permission to build up to 30 meters. The proposed development would severely restrict this potential. Uh, the church street application for greater zoning permissions uh, should not come at the expense of the as of right zoning permissions of adjacent properties, uh, namely those enjoyed by my client. The upzoning of the proposed development should not have the potential to simultaneously downzone my client's lands. Uh, and, and all of this is in addition to severely impacting the existing function uh, of my client's buildings. Uh, I believe further work with the applicant is, is required to resolve this issue. Uh, in my mind, a slightly larger setback uh, and the removal of the cantilevering element would allow the 244-260 Church Street development to function largely as proposed. Uh, and would allow my client to enjoy the existing function of their building and better protect for its redevelopment potential in the future. Uh, I am asking community council to consider deferring this approval recommendation so that it can allow us time to have these discussions with the applicant uh, and to discuss whether these changes can be incorporated into their development. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, should there be any. Uh, thank you for your time, committee. Thank you, Lincoln. Are there any questions? No, nope, seeing none, thank you for your time today. Oh, uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. sorry Mr. Chair, it's uh, Councillor Wontam. Yes, the floor is yours. Uh, just thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the deputant for your, um, for your remarks. Uh, if I can just ask, because this application has now been um, uh, circulated for some time, uh, obviously we're now at the, the final report stage. Uh, were you not in contact with the, uh, with the applicant? Uh, in this case, center court, and and were you not in communication with the city planning staff with regarding your client's concerns? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor, and, and through you, the chair, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I was actually uh, just retained on this file on a matter of, I'd say, uh, a week ago. Uh, I've, I've quickly, quickly reviewed all the documentation and, and um, as I mentioned before, um, in large part, I have no issues with the center court a development. I actually think it's actually a pretty good development, but uh, just with respect to, to my client's lands and the setback and the cantilevering element, I thought, you know, if, if I could have those discussions both with the applicant or the planning consultant for the applicant, I think I think we could come to potentially a resolution on, on, on the issue that, that I brought up. Uh, thank you, sir. And um, with respect to the cantilever, cantilever in, in particular, the cantilever does not go over your site. Um, the cantilever goes over the existing uh, Nishinaabe homes on Church Street. Is that not correct? It doesn't or, go. Or are you concerned? Are you concerned about the cantilever on Church Street? Because your your client's property is on Dundas. Correct. So uh, the the issue that I am concerned with is the rear uh, building wall of my client's lands, which is right at the pretty much the rear property line. Uh, and the uh, application that I see it from the plans that I've seen, uh, it cantilevers right to the shared property line. So it essentially has a zero meter setback uh, at the ground floor where it touches the ground floor of, uh, where it touches the, the building of, of my client's lands at the ground floor. There's a bit of a hole uh, that is cut out on the second story at three meters. 
Uh, and then that goes up to the third story of the proposed application. And then from the third story onwards or upwards, um, it goes back to a zero meter setback all the way up uh, to the height of their building, pretty much uh, until there's, I believe, a terracing uh, at the eighth floor or the ninth floor. I see. Okay, so I am looking at the uh, the staff report. It's uh, it's it's very well is illustrated on the last page, seventy Correct. page seventy three of seventy three. Yeah. So uh, I guess my my question to you, just because um, uh, I'm now hearing about this uh, for the first time, but I want to just understand: um, is your uh, did your client um, uh, and and maybe you may may or may not know because you were just retained, but um, did your client uh, have those early conversations with the city planning staff as well as the uh, the applicant. Uh, my understanding is that they they submitted uh, formal correspondence uh, on this matter. I, I think in objection to the setbacks uh, proposed. Uh, I am not quite sure if the applicant has had uh, these types of talks with planning staff. I know that they've advanced uh, their own development aspirations as part of a pre consultation uh, meeting with staff. But I I am not sure if they had the cantilevering concern. Uh, discussions that that I'm speaking about this morning uh, with staff as of yet. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think I have. Um, if, if your client has spoken to city planning staff about his or her own development um, aspirations, uh, my office has not been made aware of it yet. But uh, I'll, I'll look forward to learning more. Thank you very much for, for answering my questions. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of the deputy? I don't see any. Uh, next, we have Mitch Gascoigne. Sorry, Mitch, I got your name wrong. Mitch Gascoigne. Uh, no problem, Mitch Gascoigne. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. You've got five minutes. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitch Gascoigne. I'm Vice President of Development at Centre Court and the applicant on the project. Um, I'm just. I'd like to speak very briefly, and uh, I'm excited that we're here at Community Council. We've been. Uh, working on this project for the last year plus with staff in the councillor's office and um, I'm happy with the project that is being brought forward. Um, just for a bit of context, we've worked extensively in the downtown east in recent years and this is our fifth project um, that, uh, that, that we've worked on that has been built and uh, is in the midst of construction. Um, uh, if you know the corner, currently the site is occupied by uh, a parking lot and a Pizza Pizza. And uh, beneath that Pizza Pizza is actually a rather handsome uh, bank building that was designed by John Lyle, a fairly prominent uh, architect uh, that has done banks all over the city um, and province. And um, in the final uh, version of our proposal, we're, we're actually retaining that heritage building in full um, and went to the preservation board um, last week in, on that particular item. Um, another component of the project that I'm, I'm particularly proud of is the expansion of the Nishinaabe facility um, that's currently located to the south of the proposal at 244 Church Street. Nishinaabe is an, an indigenous nonprofit housing, housing excuse me, uh, an, an indigenous nonprofit housing provider that has locations throughout the city. And um, where the proposal is to expand the Church Street facility into this new uh, residential building. Um, in particular, I'd like to give a special thanks to Francis Sanderson, the executive director of uh, Nishinaabe, and we're really expanded to bring that expanded facility to life. Um, in, re in regards to the items that the speaker uh, previous to me just raised, um, we have worked with planning staff over the past year, including the items that uh, were included in the proposal to address the concerns, and that's the reason that that attachment and the setback um, is included in the staff report. and. Uh, and, and, and following the lead of staff, we're happy with what we've put forward and, and feel like it, that it addresses those concerns. I'm happy to answer any questions on the project and thanks again to planning staff, heritage staff, counselor's office, and all else uh, that worked with us on this project. Thank you, Mitch. Are there any questions for Mitch? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for, for your presentation. Um, can you just uh, expand on the um, the Nishinaabe homes uh, uh, inclusion? So I, I just want to. I think it's important for for us to recognize that that uh, you're actually um, putting more units uh, of affordable housing for Indigenous people on site. Is is that part of your application? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, uh, Nishinaabe has facilities throughout the city, but uh, the facility on Church Street is 
is 50 or so dorm rooms with some shared facilities that are currently in place. And our proposal is to add and expand that facility and to include um, essentially studio units that have washrooms and kitchenettes included um, to expand the offering that they have in this particular location. It's gonna take up essentially the entire second floor of, our, of, of the new building. It will have a separate entrance. Um, it will have additional amenity space for the Anishinaabe uh, 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 group to use um, and will be contained within this building, but feel like an expansion of the existing Anishinaabe site. So um, really expanding the offering that they currently have servicing the people that they are in this area, um, but it, it, into this new building. Thank you. And just to, uh, so, so everyone is clear, um, this, uh, this arrangement and, and this deal that you, you struck up with Nishnabe, uh, this is uh, separate and aside from the Section 37 benefits uh, that are contained in the staff report. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So the Section 37 uh, is, a, is a separate deal with the city, and this is an expansion of, of Nishnabe over and above that commitment to the city in Section 37. Okay. Um, and uh, with respect to the, um, uh, okay, this, I think this is this is worth exploring because I want everyone to to recognize that we we have a developer who came to the city uh, suggesting that they expand affordable housing on site uh, and did not uh, uh, make it a, a part of the Section 37 deal. So so Mitch, um, because uh, of this unique proposal you brought to the city, um, is the is the land that you're 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 creating for Anishinaabe home on the second floor of the podium. Is that being conveyed to Anishinaabe homes, meaning that um, it's uh, being transferred fee simple ownership? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll do a severance that will separate that from the condo building and it will be all owned in whole by Anishinaabe, not owned uh, or included as part of the condo development. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mitch? I don't see any. Um, we have one more deputy, Peter Gross. Peter, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome. Uh, so, Peter, you've got five minutes to address the committee. Start anytime you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peter Gross, as mentioned. I am counsel for uh, the company that owns 91 Dundas Street. And in particular, to Councillor uh, Wong Tam's question, I can confirm the following, that myself, as well as my client, and our internal land use planner at Gowlings attended a public meeting for this proposal and made oral and written submissions at that time. Uh, so we have been engaged from the very beginning. We met with Centre Court and expressed our concerns, which to date remain unaddressed in part. Our internal land use planner has spoken no fewer than five times with the city's land use planner. We have attended a pre-consultation meeting with the city planner to present our site concept plan as a preliminary discussion of what we think could be achieved on 91 Dundas Street. And we have made three written submissions now, including the submission from the external land use planner that you heard from this morning. So uh, I think it's just important to, to note that our client has been engaged and actively engaged from the generally the very beginning when he became aware of the proposal. And there were a number of issues. To be fair, Centre Court has revised its plan, but not in a way that in our view is reasonable to the concerns raised. We are not opposing the density. We are not opposing the height. We recognize the importance of uh, providing affordable housing and think that in general, there are many positive attributes. However, that doesn't mean that 91 Dundas is as of right permissions and its current functionality can be compromised and that it can be essentially down zoned because there are some positive attributes. What we are seeking is a deferral of this decision so that the external land use planner who is new to the team can have further discussions planner to planner with center court in the hopes that we can resolve this without resort to the local planning appeal tribunal. 
So uh, subject to any questions, those are my submissions. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Wong Tam? Uh, yes, thank you. And, uh, and, and thank you, Mr. Gross, for your uh, deputation. I just want to, uh, sorry, the, your, your comments are taking me a little bit by surprise, and I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm understanding. If, um, if, if, the, if the planning, uh, if the final report goes ahead, because I have a, a staff report that's before us, uh, if it goes ahead, are you suggesting that your app, your client will appeal this to the Ontario Municipal uh, to LPAT? I don't have uh, any instructions at this point. Obviously, uh, an app, uh, someone in opposition has that option. I'm not suggesting that's what I've been instructed to do because I haven't been at this point. But what I am saying is, I think that there's an opportunity for the planners to sit down and try and work through the, these are not issues that normally come up such as density or height. These are somewhat minor issues, but they have great importance to our client. And we think they deserve an opportunity to uh, canvas one more time uh, with center court so that everybody can live and coexist uh, in a way that works for everybody. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Are there any further questions of the deputant? Seeing none, are there questions of staff? Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, and I just, and uh, staff, I know you've been watching uh, all the, the presentations, and I just want to make sure I get this uh, correct. Um, the, the image on page 73 that highlights the, the setback between the tower uh, and the podium of the, of the application, as well as 91 um, uh, Dundas, uh, is that an acceptable condition to you? Because um, uh, there is an opinion that's before us from the, the owner of 91 um, Dundas that that is not an acceptable condition. But, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm gathering that you are satisfied with that. Is that correct? Um, this is Derek Walthall from City Planning. I'm the planner on the file. And just to give it a little bit of background, um, yes, I have talked with the people from 91 Dundas a number of times about their issues and what they want to do. And they did come to me um, for a pre-application meeting for a tower proposal on their land, on their lands. Now, um, stepping back a little bit, uh, the existing zoning does allow um, a development on their site of 30 meters in height. However, the FSI on their site only allows four times density. So effectively, the, their as of right is roughly a four story building under the existing zoning. Anything beyond um, a four story height, approximate four story height, uh, would require um, either minor variance or a zoning amendment, depending on the scale of their development. Now, when they came to me, they proposed a roughly 20 story building. Um, their lot is only eight and a half by 11 meters in size. In other words, very, very tiny. So we looked at that and their lot is so small that they cannot even get uh, a standard type G loading space on their site. The loading space would actually cantilever over onto the public right of way. The lot is that small that they can't even get loading on. So um, our response was back to some, um, basically two things. At a technical level, uh, they cannot build a, a tall building on their site, irrespective of that this existing zoning doesn't permit it. The second part is our policies and guidelines, um, they do mention uh, that not all sites are, are tall building sites. And in our opinion, this site at eight and a half meters by 11 meters is not a tall building site. The moment you start putting in um, step backs uh, and you consider things like tower separation distances, their site is just too small to do any of that. And, and I mentioned eight and a half meters in width. Uh, we require a three meter step back. So you're down to five and a half meter width for a tower development. It's not feasible. 
So we did talk to Santa Cora about their proposal and we did make some adjustments to address the issues at the lower levels. Um, in other words, their existing as of right permissions. Um, and we did set back the um, podium element at the lower levels to give access for natural light to um, the, the second floor, uh, the second floor of the building where the existing windows are. Um, it's not presently a dwelling unit, so it's not actually affecting any existing residents. Uh, we feel that 91 Dundas, um, irrespective of what the, the owners want to do, it's not a tower site. The existing zoning does not permit a tower development on that site because of the FSI 4.0. And hence, we're satisfied that the proposal at 244 260 Church is reasonable under those um, circumstances. So it sounds to me, um, uh, Derek, that you would not be supportive of deferring the report. You're, you're satisfied with the report as is, even in light of the submissions that were provided by the owner of 91 uh, or the representatives on behalf of 91 Dundas. Is that correct? Yes, I'm satisfied with the way it is. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Any further questions of staff? I don't see any. Councillor Wong Tam, you have the floor. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to move the recommendations in the staff report and just to um, recognize that the, the, the application is, is, is unique and it's not unique because if we're, we're seeing a condominium being built on top of a, a, or adjacent to uh, and incorporating a heritage building. The application is unique is because a developer came forward with a proposal that I've never seen before. Uh, and that proposal is to um, lead the discussion with myself and city planning staff with their desire to expand an existing affordable housing uh, uh, program on site uh, with an existing uh, a, a nonprofit housing um, uh, provider. And in this case, it's the, the well-respected Anishinaabe uh, homes. And I, I would imagine that for any of the um, the 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 other uh, potential developers that may be watching the proceedings today, um, you know, perhaps this could be an example uh, that you could uh, investigate and, and and lean towards uh, because it actually, in some ways, uh, is uh, is a great way to start a, a planning discussion uh, with the city. Uh, very similar to Councillor Fletcher and her ward uh, when the red door shelter was incorporated into the condominium. Uh, you know, that was a, a good outcome for the community, a good outcome for the applicant, a good outcome for the local councillor. Uh, we have a very comparable uh, situation here. And, and I just want to recognize that it's, it's not always easy uh, because we've, we've had now uh, various uh, comments from, from colleagues on, on the call that we're constantly battling development and sometimes development seems to give very little back to the community. They take years to build. Uh, they encroach the public right of way, and in many ways, um, you know, we're trying to just scrape our way uh, to find a path that will allow us to see the light on some type of common good uh, for the community. Uh, this applicant, I want to just say, you know, to to Mitch and, and the team at Center Court, uh, thank you for for working with our office in, in the constructive manner that you do. Uh, thank you for working with city planning staff. I know that there are times where. Uh, you know, our, our, we don't agree on everything and that's okay. But I do deeply respect the fact that we can come back to find some common ground. And the common ground on this application is that everybody wanted to uh, save the, uh, the Sterling uh, Bank of Canada building at the corner of, uh, of Church and, uh, and Dundas. And I think that the other common ground was that in the, in the midst of a housing crisis, we couldn't necessarily let a development go without some uh, sizable contribution uh, to affordable housing. And in this case, not only are, is Nishinaabe getting the deeds to expanded, upgraded new facilities, uh, we're actually getting additional money uh, through Section 37 for new uh, and, and existing affordable housing uh, in, the, in the ward. So I just want to thank everybody for, for their hard work and coming together to find a resolution. Uh, so yes, uh, obviously we want to be able to, to expand 
and, and, ex and exceed the dialogue uh, when it comes to good planning in every single case. Um, but I am satisfied with the response that city planning staff provided us today. And I'm certainly very satisfied with the fact that we had a, a good uh, and sometimes difficult uh, negotiation. But I believe that the outcome is one that uh, we can uh, support. And I also want to just give my, um, my thanks to Nishnabe Home, who is not represented here, but they do some really difficult and very challenging work. Uh, but they do excellent work in the city, and I'm very pleased that um, that this has worked out for them, uh, as well as the and, and most importantly uh, for the clients that they serve. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any uh, questions for the mover, or anyone else wish to speak on the item? I don't see anyone, so we'll, we'll uh, on the item then. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. That takes us to TE 24.10. What are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, we have a number of deputants listed here. Uh, first, uh, Shuang Dong Wang. Good, good afternoon. And are you here? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Mm -hmm. um, you've got five minutes to address the committee. Start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, councillors, and everyone who's here today. Um, I am a resident from uh, 37 Gross Venner. Uh, the building uh, that's connected to 38 uh, Granville Street. The building, two buildings together, harbor about uh, more than uh, a thousand uh, units. Um, well, I'm here to talk about the project regarding uh, 27 Gross Venner Street and 26 uh, Granville Street. So, um, as a resident myself, uh, uh, I am starting a new family with um, a new baby. Um, and we live on the 33rd floor. And from my experience living in this building for about uh, more than six years, my experience that we have a lot of uh, retired elderly in the building, as well as newborns uh, and new families. Um, as well in the surrounding area is the, on the east side is the co-op building, which also uh, are the residents of multiple, um, a lot of retired people and young kids. Uh, same thing as the uh, opera building on the north side of the new project that's being proposed here. So a lot of residents will be affected by uh, this project. Uh, my main objection is regarding the uh, zoning bylaw that's being proposed regarding bylaw 438-66 and 4569-3013. So these uh, amendment that they propose is actually to increase the uh, density and height of the uh, permitted uh, building. Uh, project for this site. Uh, and in our point of view, everybody in my building on the east and south side will be significantly impacted. All the uh, windows that we have right now are from uh, floor to ceiling. Uh, imagine you're living in a place and all of a sudden all your natural light are being completely blocked and you're being shadowed um, forever, um, especially um, as uh, Councillor um, can mention earlier in the era of COVID as a health worker myself, uh, this is a long term battle It's not um, unlikely to be solved within the short term. So we're living in this condition maybe for multiple years um, at this point to increase the density and the number of uh, uh, residents in the existing uh, project is not ideal for any anyone, including the current resident, the future residents uh, and our society. Especially uh, for right now, um, I think people in this neighborhood, in this community, have ma been making a tremendous contribution, significant efforts to stay in home. Um, at this point, the only fresh air and sunshine they might get on a daily basis is probably open their window and get some natural light in their building, at, in their home. Um, which, if this project is going to be increased in height and density, may significantly impact. Um, this right of the of the current residents. And number two, I want to address is that 
um, the uh, resale um, value of all these uh, people on the south and east side of my building and the neighborhood will be significantly impacted as well. So that's not something that uh, has been taken into consideration uh, by the uh, amendment. Uh, number three uh, is regarding the um, transportation currently on the street of Granville and the street of uh, Gross Venner. Right now, we've been having a lot of traffic, uh, especially during rush hours in the morning and in the afternoon. The residents are already being significantly impacted on that. Um, in addition, the corridor that's connecting the Granville Street and um, Gross Venner Street, which is the main exit for the current residents from uh, 37 Gross Venner and 38 uh, Granville Street, uh, is extremely narrow, and uh, that's from the plan of the proposed uh, amendment. This will be the also the exit and the main entrance for the uh, uh, the trucks and uh, vehicles for the new project. So that's also something that may not be practically feasible for um, the co-living of the current resident and the new residents. So those are the three points that um, I listed here. And I solicit your consideration not to approve this amendment um, for the sake and benefits of the current residents, the future residents, and our society, and also on the healthcare and um, point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? No? Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, Jen Green. Good afternoon, Jen. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Jen. Welcome. You've got five minutes to address the committee. Start whenever you're ready. Thank you, members of Toronto and East York Community Council, for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Jen Green, and I'm the Director of Affordable Housing and Corporate Social Responsibility at Greenwind. I'm here representing Greenwind and Choice Properties, the development team behind the 27 Grosvenor and 26 Granville rezoning application. On behalf of Greenwind, Choice, and our entire project team, I want to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to the many individuals and groups who have been a part of this unique milestone project, which will bring 231 affordable rental units, over 500 market rental units, new retail space, and new daycare space to the heart of downtown Toronto. This project is particularly unique and dear to us, given the number of people that have been involved and dedicated to bringing it to life. It is a true testament of what can be achieved when a community, city, province, and private enterprise all come together to achieve a common goal. On that note, first and foremost, Councillor Wong Tan, I would like to thank you for your leadership and vision throughout this entire process. From the earliest days when this site was identified as part of phase one of the Provincial Affordable Housing Lands Program, through the planning application and community consultation process to today, you have been a champion and advocate for this project and the important contribution it brings to the city and Bay Corridor community. I would also like to thank Infrastructure Ontario for the ongoing support they have provided our team. Their assistance in navigating the site, existing conditions, as well as their adjacent properties is key to how we've arrived at the proposal in front of you today. Our entire team is grateful to IO for their continued support. To city staff, it has been a pleasure to collaborate with you on this project. The guidance and expertise you have provided to ensure that this project is well integrated into the neighborhood and within this dynamic downtown context has been nothing short of vital. Ironing out the details of a project of this scale is no simple feat. It is thanks to your expert knowledge and commitment that we are one step closer to delivering a project that will bring much needed affordable housing and daycare space to our city. Last, but certainly not least, I would like to express our team's sincere gratitude to the many members of the community who have shared their time, insights, and feedback to shape the proposal in front of us all today. In no particular order, to the members of the Bay Cloverhill Community Association, Peregrine Co-op, Murano Condos, Simon Apartments, 
law community services and the individuals who participated by email or visiting our project website. Your diligent attention to both the built form and public realm of G2 has been fundamental to this project. We are proud to count ourselves as members of this community and as your future neighbors. It is with much excitement and anticipation that we look ahead to continuing the work with you all to deliver this milestone project and to achieving our goal of creating a place that all Torontonians feel proud and a part of. Thank you again for the time and opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Are there any questions for the deputy? Seeing none, uh, next I have David Copeland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, David. Welcome. You've got five minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, uh, David Copeland. I'm an associate with uh, Sweeney and Co Architects, and I'm the project architect for uh, the G2. Uh, I'm mostly here to uh, provide any answers if uh, staff or the members of the committee have any questions. I'd like to reiterate what uh, Jen Green said. Uh, we uh, thank very much the community, uh, Councillor Wong Tam and her office, uh, staff uh, and others. I'd like to uh, particularly call out um, uh, Gail O'Donnell and her colleagues at Children's Services who have uh, been uh, 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 such a treat to work with in uh, developing the uh, requirements of the new daycare. Um, but fundamentally, I'm really here to uh, help with uh, any questions that might arise. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, uh, we'll go now to Tony Volpentesta. Tony, I'm told you need to connect your microphone at your end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, can you hear oh, me? I've got you now. Great. Okay, Tony, Wonderful. you know the keep, drill. I will. Yes, I will keep my remarks extremely brief. I just want to add to the course, chorus of praise that you're hearing today. Uh, as a practicing planner in the city for the past 30 years, I am extremely proud to be associated with this project, the delivery of the number of affordable housing uh, units. And um, I just like to echo specific praise back to Catherine Bailey, David Sid, and the planning department in their entirety, their professionalism, the manner in which this application was uh, processed, the collaborative process that led to the, to the design of the project, the care and careful consideration of all planning issues, and of course, uh, to the leadership uh, demonstrated by Councillor Wong Tam. And I too was available for questions, but uh, given the planning department's extensive, the extensive nature of their report, I'm sure many questions could be directed to them. Uh, are there any? But I, I just wanted to be on record of A, indicating my pride uh, in, in being associated with this project, and B, thanking all of those who were instrumental in how the, uh, the project has come to this council today. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Are there any questions for Tony? No, seeing none. Uh, got time for at least one more. Sidonia Thomasella, are you with us? Sidonia? You're connected at Hello. our end. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Wonderful. I can. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and, and members of uh, the committee. Um, I too, much like the previous two speakers, I'm a uh, municipal council on this file on behalf of the applicant um, and am largely available today in the event that any questions should arise. Um, but I too would just take the opportunity to underscore uh, the comments that you've heard from the previous three speakers with respect to our uh, both our pride of being part of this project and um, and our um, uh, gratitude uh, to staff and Councillor Wong Tam's office in, in, in getting us this far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for Sidonia? Seeing none. Uh, 
I guess we do have time for the final deputant before the lunch break. Uh, Mark Richardson. Hello, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, Chair. Go ahead. Your, your uh, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Toronto East York Community Council. Uh, speaking to you today about uh, the development at uh, Grosvenor Street and Grenville Street and the loss of 26 open doors affordable housing units. Uh, first of all, our housingnowto.com volunteers would like to commend the provincial government for surplusing this prime downtown land for development of new rental housing, including a very strong component of affordable housing. Um, as you know, this location is near Youngen College. Uh, it provides the city with an excellent opportunity for smart, transit-oriented development of new affordable housing capacity within an existing Toronto neighbourhood. However, as with many, many other of the city open door program sites, we see the same recurring problem on the city side of the table, that the number of affordable housing units proposed in the initial open door approvals by city council gets cut during the negotiation and approval process with the city planning department and the local residents associations. This is a fundamentally flawed practice. It needs to be called out and city planning staff need to be instructed that it has to end. In just under two years ago, on May 14th, 2019, City Council approved an item PH 5.3, which supported the creation of up to 257 affordable homes for a period of 40 years via the open door program. The proposed building at that time was 35 and 50 stories in height, containing 844 total rental units. Today's final report, has only 231 affordable homes, a loss of 26 open door units from the original proposal. City planning staff have justified this loss by stating the main revisions include a reduction in the tower heights to 32 and 46 stories to ensure, quote, no net new shadow on Opera Place Park in accordance with the official plan policies of the area. We've just gone through a similar thing on two housing now sites the heights at Sherburn and the heights at City Place. We added heights and density to those buildings to create affordable housing units. We created new shadow on Winchester Park. We created new shadow on Rail Deck Park, what's going to be Rail Deck Park in the future. We need to reset our priorities or not consider shadow on park to be the priority that appears to be today. At a time when Toronto has literally hundreds of people sleeping in our parks, perhaps it is time for City Council to reset some of our planning priorities in order to ensure that we end this practice of placing shadow studies and default policies above the need for creating 40,000 new units of affordable housing that you say we require by 2030. We've included some comparison tables uh, in the appendix of our letter that we gave to you today and a photo of Opera Place Park uh, in the attached pages. We would really like you to give some direction to staff that when they cut open doors units out of buildings that you have already approved for open doors funding, they have to walk across some hot coals to cut those open door units. And default policies and practices have to be relaxed to give the height and the density and the built form to deliver the open doors units at the scale we require. Happy to answer your questions as always, councillors. Are there any questions for Mark? Oh, Anna has a question, or Councillor Bailao has a question. Geez, I got way yeah, too just informal a, there. A quick one. Um, were you able to look at the shadow studies? Do we know what the incremental um, shadow we, would be? No, we've we've been doing shadow studies on your housing now site. We worked with Ken, uh, Councillor Wong Tam's office to increase the height and density at 405 Sherburn, three more floors, 50 more units, 25 of them affordable. Um, we, we've only really started tracking the open door sites over the last six or eight months because we started to see this pattern. We saw it at uh, 80 Dale in Scarborough. We see it at Richview Terrace, which is crazy making because Richview Terrace is create TO land. It is next to the underground uh, Eglinton LRT and Councillor Holiday's ward, and you're cutting open door units out of it. Um, about a year ago, we were at Councillor Fletcher's, uh, when we were talking about the Broadview site, where we lost height and density at the, uh, 
Broadview and Queen site, uh, and we lost affordable housing units for open doors. You, we are, you're announcing we've created this many open doors, affordable housing sites. Often we think you announced the number that you approved to fund X number of years ago, not the number of units that actually end up getting delivered at the end of the day when the building is created. We're happy to do shadow studies for you if that's what you want us to do, but our volunteers have a limited amount of bandwidth. We really want your staff to not use parking minimums and shadow study defaults as things that are blocking your open doors, affordable housing units. Um, we've asked to speak and join the working group in uh, Councillor Matlow's ward for the uh, city uh, Canada Square locations because we want to make sure that affordable housing is a primary goal in all of these locations. Mark, Mark, I think I think yeah. you got the the answer to the question that uh, Councillor Bailao was asking. Are there any further questions? Thank you. No, that, no? that's it. Okay. Um, Thank you. You're quite welcome. So that concludes the deputations on that item. Are there any questions of staff? Councillor Baila. Um, you know what, before, staff... before you start, Councillor, sorry to interrupt. Um, can I just have a motion to extend uh, to finish this item before the lunch break? We should only be a minute. Councillor Bradford, all in favor, opposed Sorry, just... Okay, go ahead, Councillor Baila, floor is yours. Um, uh, so um, the shadow studies that um, were, were just mentioned. So uh, how, how long would the 35, 50 story tower shadow on the park? Through the chair, this is Catherine Bailey from uh, Toronto Community Planning. Uh, I'm the planner who reviewed this application. Um, so just to provide some context on where the shadow restrictions are coming from here, uh, this is a policy that's found in the North Downtown Young site and area specific policy, which contains enforced policies that protect a few specific parks in the downtown from new net shadow during specific times on specific dates of the year. And the shadow protection policy that is in question here relates to Upper Place Park to the north of this proposal between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on the spring and fall equinox. The proposal was revised to conform to this policy so that an official plan okay. amendment uh, what, was not what, required. What, can you respond to what shadow was it provided before it was revised? The, the park was uh, experiencing additional net new shadow during the protected time. No, but was it an hour? Was it five hours? Like, what is it an hour? Was it five? Can you just give us an idea of what we're talking about here? Uh, I think count, count. So sorry, I apologize. Um, hi, Councillor. I, I guess the I think the important uh, consideration here is that the way the policy is drafted for this part of the, David, the with, with all due respect. I yeah. ask I just I just asked the question and and I just want an answer to the question. Either you have it or not have it, it it's fine. Like I, I understand there's different things that need to be taken in consideration, but I would just like to know what are we talking what's the incremental shadow? Like are we talking about an extra hour of shadow or are we talking about, you know, six hours of shadow? I think I'd have to go back and take a look at the, the exact shadow plan that was done when the original application came in to answer your question in terms of how much incremental shadow was shown at that time. So I'm happy to do that. Um, maybe answer your question after the, the lunch break, if that's helpful. Yeah, that would, that would be helpful. May, may I, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, may I just use this this window, this little window here? <laughs> uh, I don't mean to interrupt uh, Councillor Bailao's uh, train of thought. Um, I just didn't have a chance to comment when when there was the vote to uh, extend into the lunch hour. I have a meeting that I can't miss right now uh, during lunch, and I just wonder if we could come you, back. You know, lunch or I'd be willing. I'd be willing, uh, given that staff say that they have to do a little bit of work to bring an answer back. I'd yeah. be willing to. Reopen that and say, let's just have lunch now. Fair enough? That would be helpful. Okay, all those in favor of having lunch now. All right, <laughs> it looks like that's what we're doing. <laughs> very enthusiastic, hungry bellies all over the city right now. 
Um, I'll see you all back here at 1.30. Thank you. Okay.
Good afternoon. Uh, I call the meeting of the Toronto East York Community Council back to order. Before we uh, take up where we were in the agenda, I have two new items to introduce. Uh, the first, we will number TE 24.96, Supporting Canada Square Working Group Process with Additional Information. Uh, motion introduced, Councillor Matlow. All those in favour, opposed, carried. And second, um, 17 Boothroyd Avenue permit parking. Uh, Councillor Fletcher isn't here, so I'll move the introduction of it. All those in favor, opposed, carried. So all members, uh, those are available uh, on the electronic agenda if you want to look at them. <clears throat> and so what I'd like to propose is that we return to TE 24.10. We were in the process of asking quest questions of staff. Uh, there was a question Councillor Bailao had asked about shadow studies. I'm wondering if city staff have that information for us now. Read the chair. Um, I, I do have the answer to Councillor Bailo Lau's question. I wanted to ask permission if I could first, before I do that, just give a little bit of uh, a bit more of background so oh. that you can be better informed. However you want to answer the question, that's fine. Just try to keep us moving along. I certainly will. Thank you. Um, so to respond to the question, uh, one thing I did want to specifically raise for the north downtown area is that there is this policy that we have recently, it's recently been approved through the LPAT that actually speaks to no new net shadows on uh, several parks in the downtown, including this Opera Place Park, Lillian McGregor Park and Barbara Hall Park. And there's a, a specific window of uh, importance that we are trying to protect for uh, sunlight on the park. And specifically for Opera Place Park, the window is a two hour window between 12 o'clock and two o'clock. So that is really the window that we are trying to ensure that there is sunlight. So in terms of answering the councillor's questions, the amount of shadow will be from a period between 12 o'clock to one o'clock, and it will be shadowing up to six and a half percent of the park. I should also say to you that the, it's, it's also not just the amount of the shadow that it's being uh, affected here or, or the period of time, but the other thing that we are certainly trying to be very cognizant of is that uh, in the downtown area, we have a number of other development proposals that are market applications, market condominium applications, that are also trying to uh, attack this policy and to try to shadow um, these parks. And case in point is a recent uh, LPAT hearing that the city was involved in over at Church and Wellesley, where we did uh, take the position at the LPAT that Barbara Hall Park should not be shadowed because of the importance of um, that park and the AIDS memorial that is found within that park. We're still waiting for a decision on that hearing, but again, it's it's this um, no new net shadow policy that is really important when we are talking about you know all of the growth that is happening in the downtown area and the ability for us to ensure that we're trying to protect for the quality of life uh, of the residents that are living in these neighborhoods and certainly the park and having access to sunlight is a really important consideration that i would just like to leave you with thank you uh councillor bylaw did you have any further questions <clears throat> yes i do um so uh following up so there's six point uh, uh between 12 and 1 there's a, a shadow that affects 6.5% of the park. Uh, and I'm assuming that is uh, when we take in consideration like the March, September uh, times, correct? Okay, is, there's no shadow in the summer. I'm assuming if that's just 6.5%, there's no shadow in the summer. Uh, there is, let me just double check my 
information here, Councillor? That is correct. It's from March and for, from September as well as December. Okay. And uh, was this the, um, the the only reason why we had to reduce the number of units, the height? That that was certainly primarily the the main reason is because of the shadow on the park. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Okay, uh, to speak, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. And I do have a technical amendment that city uh, staff have provided for me. If you can please put that on this to the screen. Uh, the amendment is, is to just slightly change the size of the childcare uh, provided space on site. Um, Hopefully you have that and hopefully it's going on the screen, but I'll just sort of speak to to the, the process and the application itself. Uh, I want to start off by saying a big thank you um, to the community uh, and let me just dial back a few years. The Bay Clover Hill Community Association, uh, a long standing community in the downtown core has been advocating for years long before the provincial announcement in 2017 uh, when they said that they were going to. Uh, unlock the the um, uh, the corner site as we know it, um, and uh, and they had been lobbying the provincial government, uh, meeting with Infrastructure Ontario, uh, asking them to consider building affordable housing on this very site. These meetings go back um, to 2013, 2014. It took several years before the province caught up with the um, uh, thinking of the community association. Uh, because they said that um, it would be a shame to see uh, another market condominium uh, come down into the neighborhood that provides very little to any type of benefits uh, to the community. So I want to just recognize how um, how this has been a long-standing position of a residence association in in Ward 27 and now Ward 13. I also want to recognize the, the, uh, the, the provincial government, the previous provincial government who first unlocked this land. They could have said no. And, uh, and in the past, they have said no to us. Um, just north of the site is 11 Wellesley, which was a, a very large parcel of land owned by Infrastructure Ontario or managed by Infrastructure Ontario, which uh, ultimately went a uh, full market condominium. And we had to negotiate hard to then secure a 1.6 acre park uh, on those lands. That's what happens when the, the province wasn't really uh, willing at all to listen to the community. The city had to be creative. We ended up purchasing a portion of the land and assembling the parkland dedication from Lanterra in order for us to have that community benefit. That is not the case here at the Grosvenor Grenville site. Uh, here, we actually had a very different outcome and a very different process. And I want to thank uh, Greenwin for a Green Rock for their contributions because uh, we have a developer who has uh, obviously a long track record of building purpose-built uh, rentals in the city. Uh, they were extraordinarily uh, good to work with. And I know that this is not just my assessment, but the assessment of the Bay Clover Hill Community Association, but as well as the adjacent neighbors, uh, whether it's Pellegrine uh, co-op or perhaps uh, loft community services, uh, even the Murano, uh, uh, Murano buildings uh, would, would probably agree is that this developer was open, they were transparent, they were timely in their communication, always very respectful. And I want to thank the city staff who I know did not necessarily give um, the developer a, a free pass simply because there was a uh, some affordable ben uh, some affordable housing on site, they still put them through the same planning criteria, which I think is absolutely important. And, uh, and that speaks to what David uh, Sitt has just spoken about. This community has felt significant development pressure. And through the leadership of the local community associations, whether it's Church on Wellesley, that really led the, uh, uh, the, the fight and the advocacy to create the uh, official plan amendment 183 for North, uh, downtown Young, uh, supported by the BCCA, uh, or the fact that they had gone to the OMB and now LPAT together to then defend their official plan amendment, um, 
this developer was willing to work within the city rules and still be able to provide significant contributions uh, to the community. Uh, and I think that everyone is, is a lot better for it. Is it an absolutely perfect um, application? No, and I don't think we, we have many that, that we can point to as, as, as perfect. But does it meet a lot of those check marks that we look for in other applications? Absolutely. The provision of affordable housing on site, purpose built rental on site, mid block connection on site, dedicated uh, streetscape improvement and ongoing maintenance, maintenance at the cost of the developer in perpetuity, including a lighting plan and an art plan on site. Does it hit and, 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 and cast new shadows? on dedicated parks of significance in the downtown core, an area that's already so parkland deficient, it does not. So is it a short, elegant little building? Heck no. But it does it meet the criteria of, of the planning staff and the urban design staff? Absolutely. Does it have the support of the local community? Absolutely. And I'm very proud to say that it also has my support. Um, so I just wanna thank uh, everyone involved uh, because we had a number of working group uh, meetings. I know we had some very uh, uh, timely and sometimes difficult discussions, especially when we were finishing up the um, uh, the final pieces as we were wrapping it up uh, through the COVID pandemic. Not necessarily easy to make that pivot, but even as we were making that uh, pivot, the community rallied and said this was good. This was going to be a positive contribution to our neighborhood. And so we welcome um, this development as we welcome this developer into the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other speakers on the item? Councillor Bailao. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I would like to start by thanking Councillor Wong Tam. Um, I think uh, she um, was very passionate about this. What I just hear was a big request from her community on advocating to the province to have this designated for affordable housing. Um, I think back in the day, I seconded a motion that she came up to me and said, you know, we need to ask the province to have this uh, designated as affordable housing. Very often she would call and say, are you talking to the province? I'm talking to this person. Can you talk to that person? We need to continue advocating. She was relentless in advocating uh, for the province to designate uh, this portion, this land uh, for affordable housing and to use the land value to create the affordable housing. This is very much the same model that we use for our housing now. Uh, the, the province used that land value to create the affordable housing unit. So I think that uh, we need to thank the province, but we also need to thank her uh, advocacy and her community for identifying the land, the potential that it had to add to community building and to create affordable housing in this community and to her relentless uh, efforts in this community. Um, I think from what we've heard in here from the local councillor, Councillor Wong Tam, and from the people involved, uh, this was a collaborative process. It adds a lot to the community, affordable housing, childcare, uh, and so on and so forth. I do have to um, talk a little bit about this loss of um, affordable housing units. Um, also, because this is not an issue that we see just in this project, we, we're seeing a little bit. And we all know how difficult it is to um, balance uh, city uh, priorities and, and quality of life is important. But as I'm hearing these numbers, as I'm hearing, you know, a shadow that casts between 12 and 1 on 6.5% of the park, and we lost 26 units of affordable housing. Um, and I have to say, it, it stuck with me when that deputant talked about, you know, the fact that we have our parks full of people living in parks, and we're talking about losing 26 units because it shadows in March and September in 6.5% of the park. So um, I think we need to uh, consider these things when planning is, is, is evaluating uh, these applications. We need to consider the dire, desperate need of affordable housing. And yes, we need to, to balance the quality of life, but quality of life means people being also able to afford to live in our city and in particular in, in, in downtown Toronto, where it's, is, is very, uh, um, uh, very uh, expensive as well. And when you have, you know, a shadow on 6.5% of the park, 
I question that. And so um, I think we need to uh, question that more often. I think we need to come to the table and and really uh, um, set our priorities straight. So I, I would like to leave that here. If no one else has anything to say, I might want to add a word. Um, uh, let me add my voice to the chorus of congratulations for Councillor Wong Tam and her work here. Um, but I, I wanted to focus in on this business about whether you sacrifice the quality of life in order to build affordable housing. Uh, it, it, it's interesting to me because uh, so many of the problems we have with our current network of social housing is because somebody somewhere in the past decided to trade off a good built form, good quality of life, good amenities in order to build a bit more affordable housing. And as a result, we have neighborhoods that we are having to spend a fortune redesigning that don't have amenity, that are not as good places to live as places for people who got their housing through market. And I will not be part of a, a, a process of eroding the quality of life only for those people who can't afford to go and buy market housing. To suggest that the constraint we have on building affordable housing is good planning is nonsense. There is an uncountable amount of developable land within our official plan. The problem is that the City of Toronto doesn't own that land and that neither the federal government nor the provincial government are giving us sufficient money to go and acquire that land. We don't need to build neighborhoods that don't have good amenity in order to build affordable housing. We just need a public investment. We have to decide that sacrificing the quality of life for people who can't afford to buy into market units is not the way to solve the problem, but rather all of us investing collectively so that we have the public money to do it properly, so that everyone is entitled to a good quality of life. Now, you can make an argument, well, you know, it's only this much over the line and only that much, you know, cutting into the things that we put in our plans. We have to remember the reason that there are shadow constraints that we put on developments in this area is because already the amount of sunlight that hits those parks is way below what we would accept in other parts of the city. In other words, we've already gone over the line and the additional 6%, while it may sound small, is just saying there is no such thing as a, as a line that we will draw to say this is the quality of life that we must provide. I've been approached by city staff and saying, well, you know, why, maybe we can just waive the development rules that we apply to everybody else uh, for this one site in your ward. And I say no. Every time I say no. Good quality, good urban design is good urban design and people deserve it whether they're wealthy or they're not. So, uh, did anyone else want to speak to this item? <coughs> Councillor Wong-Tan, did you have a motion on this? I can't remember. Uh, I do, and uh, I don't. I don't think it's been shown on the screen yet, but I think staff okay, here we go. do have it. There it is. And this is just a technical amendment from planning staff uh, to to modify to amend the the size of the childcare uh, space. Very good. Okay, um, members, I think we can take this all as a package: the amendment and the item together. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. <clears throat> okay, that concludes item 10. The next item is TE 24.11, King Parliament Secondary Plan Review, Final Report, Secondary Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendments. Uh, I have no deputants listed here. Are there any questions of staff? Councillor Wong-Tam. Um, I have a, 
Yes, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, with respect to the um, the final report on the secondary plan with the zoning bylaw amendments, uh, my question to staff is with respect to the development applications that have already been received uh, and are being processed through the uh, the pipeline. Uh, how will the secondary plan be applied to to those uh, uh, to those uh, applications? Um, Mr. Chair, this is Melanie Melnick speaking from City Planning. Um, my answer to your question is that with respect to development applications that have already received approval in principle, um, either through council approval or adoption or an LPAT decision, but do not yet have bylaws, uh, the intention is to recognize the eventual bylaws as prevailing over the uh, secondary plan and, and zoning bylaw. With respect to applications that are complete and under review, um, the recommendation that staff have put forward to the committee and council is that the secondary plan policies be uh, used to inform the review of ongoing and future development applications um, uh, to uh, understand how they can fit into a new context. And uh, how successful do you think we will be to use this new um, secondary planning zoning bylaw amendments to inform the applications in the pipeline? Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I think the um, the standards and policies that have been uh, are being proposed before committee today have been uh, before committee previously, um, most recently in October 2019, and have been the subject of uh, public consultation for the last two years. And um, it should not be a surprise to uh, any uh, applicants that are currently going through their review. Um, the hope is that this planning framework sets a new context against which uh, development applications can be evaluated um, and uh, hopefully leading to fruitful conversations with uh, with applicants and staff in the ongoing review, understanding that we are recommending increased heights and densities in many of the cases throughout the secondary plan area that uh, better respond to the more recent pattern of development in this area. Thank you. And when the uh, sec I'm sorry, when the Heritage Conservation District uh, plan came forward. Uh, that plan was appealed to the LPAT. Um, there were certain things that were struck out and, and amendments that were made. Uh, can we recover that lost ground in the secondary plan that's before us today? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we've worked closely with our colleagues in heritage planning um, and uh, done everything we can to align with the intent of both the previous uh, Staff recommended uh, conservation plan and uh, the LPAT decision on that, and um, we feel confident that uh, those are aligned and that any um, policies or standards that speak to heritage uh, are intended to um, maybe not restore uh, those intentions so much as uh, you know work hand in hand with a, a planning rationale for. Um, for some of the standards that uh, are are present in the secondary plan and, and zoning bylaw, uh, for example, we are maintaining a policy that um, the standards that are recommended, where there is a heritage uh, site present or a, a property that's identified in the uh, heritage register, uh, that additional uh, consideration be given uh, and to how the, that heritage site is treated in a new development application. So they are intended to be aligned um, with a firm planning rationale that uh, also recognizes the importance of heritage in this area. And is it because of this work that you you did uh, largely because of the LPAT review of the HCD that um, that you then included over 250 plus properties within the catchment area prior to the secondary plan on the city's register? Is it was that to sort of offset the damage that was done at LPAT? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to speak to that particular report. I wonder if my colleagues, uh, Mary McDonald or, or Alex Corey, can speak to this. Uh, 
Through the chair, this is uh, Mary McDonald. I am also joined by Alex, and if there the questions get more specific, I'll pop it over to him. Uh, no, the listing actually came forward as a comprehensive part of the planning study. Uh, and so, uh, as you know, we, we brought forward the multiple listing as one of our first uh, sets of, of uh, multiple listing reports that are related to planning studies back in December. And so it is that listing is is separate from the Heritage Conservation District sec, and, was not, and was not conceived of as uh, in just one sec, related. sorry. Keep going, Mary. Uh, Mary, I still heard your answer, so not to worry. I think I got it. OK, is that is that sufficient? Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I. I, I think what I, I want my, my final question is going back to city planning, um, not on the heritage side. So, uh, obviously, with secondary plans, um, with any type of uh, with any type of final report coming forward, uh, there could be the pod, uh, the potential for for an appeal. Um, do you anticipate that this uh, this this uh, new secondary plan with the zoning bylaw amendments? Do you anticipate uh, that, that that we will have to now go defend this at LPAT? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, judging from some of the communications that we've received um, at uh, at this committee for consideration, um, there there may be issues that could be resolved, um, uh, but I would anticipate that we could see some appeals. Okay. And uh, do you stand by the process that that city planning staff undertook with respect yes, to the hundred percent? So, okay, thank you. I was just going to say the length of time, the engagement, the, the deep consultation, the notification, all of that you can stand behind. Yes, yes, I, I would through you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Bella. A couple of questions. Uh, when you're through the process of a secondary plan, uh, was the new transit taken in consideration? Um, Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, when the process began, um, the the downtown relief line was the uh, order of the day, and there were uh, two transit stations on the relief line that were under consideration. Um, the one uh, at Queen and Sherburn uh, was already under consideration, and then there was another one further east. As the plan moved through the process, uh, the Ontario line was announced uh, with a new station uh, location for the Corktown station further to the west. So, uh, certainly we did monitor the, the new station locations and, uh, ensured that the growth, uh, the, the, the targeted areas for growth were directed, uh, to closer proximity to those stations. So the growth that you're proposing here already, you know, takes in consideration, you know, the stations and it, you find it appropriate uh, with the transit investment in the area. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I would uh, agree that the, certainly that the growth in the area is already quite sufficient to support uh, transit. Um, I'm not an expert in this field. I would uh, also say that the plan allows for additional growth to optimize transit investment. And, um, just a question around this if and it's it's with this and other projects um how does you know if if certain sites get an mzo done on them um does that create a precedent for other sites then does that jeopardize the work of the secondary plan or all or just that site um through you mr chair i think that um it, an, an MZO um, it certainly has the potential to introduce a new precedent uh, that the ongoing planning process did not anticipate, um, and, and that is an ongoing concern. Um, again, the hope is that um, having a plan in place that's the result of, of over two years of ongoing consultation and uh, study and analysis of the area um, might prevail in the rationale, but um, there is always the danger that uh, a municipal zoning order that um, exceeds what was anticipated could create a new precedent. Thank you. Those all the questions? Anyone else? No? Councillor Wong Tam, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will be happy to move the staff recommendations and just to say thank you. 
Um, there are so many different individuals to thank, um, but I'm going to thank just them in terms of the 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 the, the visions that they work for, um, and uh, and I want to recognize that city planning staff, um, Melanie and, and and the crew that have been so um, hard at work in trying to make this particular uh, document, um, you know give life to the, the community and city aspirations on how we want to guide the growth in King Parliament. Uh, obviously, King Parliament, King Spadina, two significant um, uh, parts of the city that was slated for uh, revitalization, regener uh, regeneration. Um, it goes back to the days of, of Paul Bedford and, and, and Barbara Hall as our mayor, and, uh, and the work seems to not ever, you know, entirely be concluded. Um, and so this is the latest attempt at this uh, by the city of Toronto and the city uh, visionary planning staff to give some guidance to how we grow a, a dynamic neighborhood that's under tremendous development pressure. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to uh, you know these uh, the St. Lawrence Neighborhood Association. Um, and uh, Suzanne Kavanaugh and the Development Committee. Uh, they have been hard at work in trying to, um, number one, uh, meet the city's expectation that these areas uh, would be um, expected to, to see development, to see change, uh, but also to guide it with a thoughtful and uh, an inclusive hand to a good outcome. The reason I asked the question around the, uh, the Heritage Conservation District is that, you know, after lots of consideration, careful planning, notification, uh, and clear rationale and, and staff reports, um, that uh, that particular document was uh, appealed to LPAT. And at LPAT, they seem to have taken um, a knife to it and carved out sections that they just they deemed did not meet um, the, uh, the HCD uh, boundaries. So they ended up shrinking that boundary uh, and uh, my fear in this case is that this secondary plan is going to go under the knife at LPAT as well. Um, and I think we've already heard from from Melanie um, in city planning is that they anticipate that they are going to have to then go and defend this entire process. The process that involved hundreds of people that came out to community meetings, open houses, on-site um, uh, workshops uh, over a period of years, a community process that actually involves stakeholders and property owners, uh, all of that will be upended when it goes into the appeal um, uh, ringer. And, and I point to that because, you know, TO Core uh, was interfered with uh, by the province. Uh, and we saw that we had to go through an LPAT discussion, and then we had all of a sudden the minister reaching in to change things that he didn't like. He did the same thing for Midtown and Focus, uh, and I think that we need to recognize that whatever we push through and, and we say we support at the community council and city council will still be left to the whim of, of a provincial uh, overlord that can undo good uh, uh, urban planning. And so I want to just um, lend my strong support uh, to the work and the process that, that has led us this far, but I also want to put a, a, a caution in the wind that although much effort has been put into this uh, uh, this, this strategy with, the, with respect to the secondary plan. Um, I also anticipate that we're still going to have to fight. Um, the central waterfront um, secondary plan, uh, which includes a component of the West Don lands, uh, we've seen a lot of, um, uh, we've seen some ministerial oversight, uh, sort of not oversight, overreach <laughs> come into our neighborhood, whether it's the first uh, parliament uh, site that they are now interested in, uh, in taking away from the community uh, and the city, or whether it's the upzoning automatically through the ministerial zoning orders in the West Donlands. There seems to be a lot of interest uh, in the province about what happens in this little tiny section of the city. And for reasons unbeknown to myself, city planning and the local community, they continue to interfere. So my, my words of caution are not necessarily about not just the property owners and the very aggressive developers that may be helicoptering around, but my words of caution are also the fact that our second threat and perhaps larger threat sits at the province. I just want to be mindful of the secondary plan. And as we support it as city council is that we are obviously not the final word, um, not, on, not on planning matters in the city, uh, but I think we should take a very stand, strong stand and support this uh, this process and uh, and the staff's recommended recommend secondary plan uh, for King Parliament. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? Seeing none. Uh, on the item then, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 24.12, inclusion on the City of Toronto's Heritage Registry, Register, intention to designate under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, alterations to a heritage property and authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement, 260 Church Street. Questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd just like to move the staff recommendations and to say uh, thank you to everyone who worked on the uh, uh, on this uh, particular report, uh, reviewing the application, and I'm very pleased to, to support the recommendations coming from the Preservation Board. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Members, I'm going to try to uh, speed up a little bit. We have quite a number of deputants left, and I know some of you have to leave at 6 o'clock. Item TE 24.13, intention to designate under Part 4, Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act, alterations to a heritage property and authority to enter into a heritage easement agreement, 425 Cherry Street. I have no deputants. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, again, I'd like to move the staff recommendations and to say thank you to all involved uh, and uh, appreciate the recommendations from the, from the Preservation Board. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.14, inclusion on the City of Toronto Heritage Registers, Queen Street East, Leslieville Properties. We have one deputy, Mark Richardson. Mark, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Mark. You have five minutes. Please start okay. as soon as you're ready. Okay. Uh, council members, if uh, you are interested, we did submit a letter on this item, which has a series of photographs and maps that would be helpful while we depute. Uh, volunteers from our HousingNowTL.com Civic Tech and Open Data Project have closely followed the Toronto Preservation Board's rapid process of bulk inclusion of marginal value Main Street buildings onto the City of Toronto's Heritage Register since 2017. Today's proposed addition of 54 Leslieville properties will take the total buildings added to the Heritage Register using this bulk inclusion method to 1,343 buildings in under four years. And it would appear that nearly all of these 1,300 buildings are located within major transit service areas around existing or expanding transit investments where the city and the province are rightfully directing new housing growth. The affordable housing and transit-oriented redevelopment advocates we, that we are, we have frankly been amazed by the volume of city planning staff resources that have been applied to these bulk heritage endeavors. We would hope the city had higher and more worthy priorities. Given the limited staff budgets, comparing the length, breadth, and detail of the many heritage reports we have reviewed to similar affordable housing reports has been quite eye-opening about where the city is choosing to apply its limited resources. As some of our volunteers are Leslieville and East End residents, we've actually been very fortunate to welcome some great new developments in the last few years that had strong affordable housing components and replaced old underused church buildings. In retrospect, given this current staff report, we should be grateful that neither of those church buildings had any heritage listing or restriction placed upon them by the Toronto Preservation Board that would have put much needed redevelopment and affordable housing projects at risk. We've included photographs of the 17, uh, 1117 Gerard Street East, which is Wood Green's 35 seniors affordable housing units and daycare. We've also included 877 Queen Street East, which is the Wood Green church redevelopment with 118 condos and the new Red Door family shelter. As you'll see from the attached photographs and maps, the majority of the 54 commercial buildings on Queen Street East that have that staff have provided in your report are wholly unremarkable and exist in similar forms by the hundreds all over various parts of Toronto and East York. In addition, almost all of the 54 commercial buildings in Leslieville that have been suggested for bulk inclusion into the Heritage Register are within the 500 and 800 meter major transit service areas around the new Ontario line station that Metrolinx is developing at 799 Queen Street East. We would respectfully 
ask that City Council refuse this bulk inclusion of 54 commercial buildings on Queen Street into the Heritage Register at this time. Send the report back to staff to review and more importantly, reduce the number of properties that are being considered for inclusion. In addition, this is our big ask. We would suggest that it is long overdue for City Council to review the current demographic composition of the Toronto Preservation Board to ensure that its membership is more appropriately reflecting the age, ethnicity, and economic diversity of our city. The current composition of the Toronto Preservation Board appears to be entirely white, majority homeowner, resident, and ratepayers group association members, and predominantly over the age of 60. If diversity is our strength in Toronto, then our preservation board should be far younger and more socially and economically diverse than the current board membership suggests in order to ensure that our heritage preservation decisions are more reflective of a broader worldview than the board appears to have today. As always, our affordable housing volunteers are happy to answer any questions that the board or city council have about our advice about the real world impacts of these bulk heritage decisions on not-for-profit infill redevelopment in the city of Toronto. We know from previous deputations that staff and councillors will say heritage doesn't impact affordable housing. We know from the West Queen West study we talked about, that was the response. We also know that at the Housing Now site at 140 Merton, the 2017 heritage status on that building cost as affordable housing units on a city owned site. We know that the open door site that we talked about last year at Queen and Broadview lost height, lost density, lost units because of the heritage designations around that building. And we know that Councillor Bradford has a Housing Now site coming to Queen Street in just a few months, it'll be in front of you, and the Beach and East Toronto Historical Society are losing their minds about it in the local media. Heritage does have an impact on affordable housing. Mark, that's your time. We need you Mark, to reset that's your time. Mark? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any questions of the deputy? Councillor Bailau? Uh, just yes, one I question. question the um, just to clarify so that you have your facts straight. Thank you very much for coming today, Mr. Richardson. But the uh, open door policy at the Riverdale Co-op were you suggesting that the co-op should be knocked down, the heritage building should be knocked down in order to have more units there? Not in that particular case. In that case, there were heritage restrictions. Again, I believe on the amount of shadow that could fall on the heritage no, building. That and that's why, that's why clarify, the building was reduced. Not no, not the case, not at all, no. And that, that uh, rather than more units, they retrofit the actual co-op so just so you have that straight for next time and are you aware that both the uh, Riverdale site for wood green housing and the red door site both had a heritage designation on them before the buildings came down they were listings on the the drugstore section of the building correct nope our understanding the drugstore was, was actually rebuilt into that are you aware of that Yes, we are, Heritage and we're supportive of that. Into the northeast corner, and both of those churches came down. So I think if you should look a little further into that, you'll find that. Out. Thank Just you. Just to let you know. Councillor I know you do good research, so you'll find it. Councillor Bailau, you had a question of the deputy? I think it was around the same questions for Councillor Fletcher, because the deputy gave us two examples on the wood green. Um, but I couldn't understand if those examples had heritage or didn't have heritage. Our understanding from reading the materials was that they did not have a heritage registration upon them. Okay. Okay. But the materials that we are reading are from five or six years ago in most of those cases. Okay. Thank you. Just look it up. You're good with the research. Okay. Golly, that was a lot of fun. Um, are there any other questions for the deputy? Nope. Questions of staff? Councillor Bailau? So, I know that there was a, a little bit of confusion, but I, I just, 
I think Councillor Fletcher was trying to tell us that these two examples, they were listed, not registered, listed. And um, what we're doing here today is listing these properties. So you're saying, if any development occurs, take a closer look at it. Is that is that what's being done here? Yes, that's correct uh, through the chair. Uh, and in, in the uh, case of the church for Wood Green, I believe it was a designated heritage property. Uh, the drugstore was a listed property. And uh, as always, uh, City Council makes a decision about what the priorities are for the site. Uh, and in that case, Councillor Fletcher believed that the priority uh, for her ward was for the uh, wood green development to proceed unencumbered. And uh, all city staff are aware that on different sites, there are different outcomes. Uh, so I would suggest that there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, criticism about heritage getting in the way, but in fact, council sets the priorities and council set the priority for the citywide heritage register. Council directed us to do these multiple listings. We did ask for permission to do it and we received it. We're doing it uh, as a part of every single planning application across the city. And there is no, uh, it's, it's not a surprise that the first ones are coming in areas that are anticipating growth. Uh, we are now in a position in the division where we are creating planning frameworks ahead of growth in order to direct it. And I would say in most cases we're listing somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of uh, uh, lot frontage for properties. So there is 80 percent of the, this Leslieville area is heritage free of consideration. The other 20 percent will be a part of the conversation and City Council will determine what the priority is on a case by case basis. Thank you. And but it still needs further examination, right? Because usually I, in the experiences that I've had when it's listed, what it forces is the developer to look at it and to produce a, a heritage study. And sometimes it comes with different conclusions. Sometimes it's the property, it's not, a, a, the full property is not heritage, it's portions of the property. Other times it is the full property, but that's what it means, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, I just also want to uh, uh, get your feedback on that comment about our Toronto Heritage Preservation Board diversity. Um, so, and um, how Councillor, often do we Councillor, uh, recruit members? Councillor, can I suggest, yes. um, that's not really the item that's in front of us, but, but more to the point, Ms. McDonald is no part of the selection process for the preservation board. Perhaps that's something we could take up uh, with the clerk's office and and the uh, that process uh, in, in another forum. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll take your lead on it. I I feel I mean, like it's probably something that you feel like we should look into it, and that as a team, as a group, we should probably look into it in the appropriate uh, set of set. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And and you know, Mr. Richardson makes an, a, an interesting observation, and it's completely within our purview to pursue it. It's just that uh, poor Ms. McDonald has absolutely nothing to do with the selection of uh, yeah. the preservation board members. Sure. I, I mean, she probably knows the process, but I'm, I'm fine with it. We have to move the agenda, Mr. Chair. So let's, uh, we can discuss this offline and see how we can uh, tackle that. Yep. I'm sure that uh, the committee as a whole would, would be probably interested in having a report back or something just to ensure that we're having diversity in the, in the I will I will uh, consult with the clerk's office and find an appropriate way for us to investigate that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Nope. Uh, to speak, Councillor Fletcher, is this one yours? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion here today that I'd like the clerk to put up. It has to do with one property. 825 Queen Street East. Uh, I'll just explain that. that. That from the beginning when I was watching the batch listings come up in particular, uh, noticing the Danforth one after the planning study and then much later the batch listing came in. And people were extremely surprised by that, Mr. Chair. They, um, 
just didn't know where that kind of came out of left field. So there was no preparation done for that at all. And um, so for this one, which was attached to a Leslieville planning study that was done quite a few years ago, that was also coming out of left field. Although these properties, the planning study said, please identify any properties with potential heritage. So I can understand why Mr. Richardson didn't get that because that planning study so far back that people have forgotten about it sometimes. And although it has led to the development all on Queen Street and the redevelopment all along Queen East. So this batch listing came out, as you may remember, I held that batch listing uh, and sent it out to the Leslieville BIA. And I sent it there so that they could advise all of their members that would be property owners and business owners that this was going to be coming forward to Toronto and East York Community Council. I felt that was only fair to have that consultation in that way. So all of the businesses, the BIA held a meeting, they invited the preservation board, they answered questions, quite a few questions about it. But that property there is not in Leslie. Hall. That property is in the Riverside BIA and it's improperly part of this study. So uh, this study that in front of us. So that may be a clarification around boundaries with the study versus the BIA, but basically these property owners were never advised that this would be coming and I think they deserve that. So that's getting removed and sent back. I would move all of the rest of the, the listings that are here and simply say, yes, they're only listings. It's just to let everybody know if they're thinking of doing something, they're not gonna be surprised that when Heritage says, well, we have to take a look at your property, you've got X, Y, or Z on that property. I will just note for Mr. Richardson that those two properties uh, were more than listed. There was a recommendation on them that was removed in order to build social housing. And that is the one at Leslie and Gerard, the Riverdale Church, and also the Wood Green United Church on Queen Street, where the Red Door Shelter had been <clears throat> the lone tenant for many years and is now built within that condo. Also, as you well know, the Northeast corner, the old Wood Green drugstore, which was a uh, listed building, but the community, the Leslieville Historical Society was very concerned that, that that would be torn down, that the facade was saved and built in to the new build, built in to the new building. So I don't think that if you're coming at this from the point of view of affordable housing, there's nothing, uh, if the project is great, if the project is important, we can either build around it keep the facades or if necessary, sadly, um, remove the designation or the listing and proceed with building 36 apartments for seniors on Girard. And uh, have we had our missing middle discussions that would be higher than the current five stories on Girard? Fortunately, I couldn't get that that time. And then there would be the uh, red door was able to be rebuilt into the condo. So I don't find that it's an impediment for that. I do think it does need to be taken into consideration. And uh, through the good graces of council and the wisdom of Toronto and East York Community Council and input from staff and from all staff, not just heritage staff, but all staff regarding a project, I think we can usually come up with a, a pretty good outcome around these properties. So I'm not worried about that. I'm also not worried as I've been reading about Queen Street and it's never, nothing will ever be built there again. Uh, we have a lot of great mid-rise on Queen Street. It looks fantastic. And, but as everybody knows, my concern is always social purpose of site, affordable housing, that um, we are taking out lots of very affordable apartments that are on second and sometimes third floors of our long time avenues like Queen, like Gerard, like Danforth and replacing them with unaffordable condos. So that is really my concern and I will always work for the affordability of in any development. I don't find that this batch listing will harm that. I don't think it will harm people from developing their properties and uh, gives everybody a heads up. So thanks for that. I'll move that my motion. I'll also move the staff for Mr. Chair, thanks. Thank you. I'd like to uh, speak to the item, please. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Matlow, and then I, I have a couple words I want to say. 
Oh, th <clears throat> thanks. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, Councillor Fletcher has absolutely demonstrated herself to be a big supporter of small businesses in her community, along with putting in a lot of efforts to advocate for affordable housing. And just nobody can honestly question that. Um, when it comes to the process of listing, Councillor Bylaw's questions were uh, leading absolutely to the truth um, that, you know, what listing does is it allows us and heritage planning the opportunity to then do our due diligence to discover whether or not a building should be fully designated under the Ontario Heritage Act or not, or somewhere in between where we provide some level of protection with respect to the facade or some other arrangement that can often allow for some measure of development above or around what we'd like to retain. But it allows us that opportunity to do that due diligence rather than we've seen many instances in our city where a building has been demolished because the city legally had to provide the demolition permit. And you know what happens? The community understandably gets upset then we get upset at heritage planning <laughs> and, you know, and, and then we go through this vicious cycle over and over and over again. Mary McDonald was right. We as a council has have asked them to prioritize the preservation of buildings that merit heritage protection, whether it be architectural or cultural. We've asked them to be more proactive about how they do their work and Mary and her team are doing that. So I just wanted to make it very clear that just because we have an individual who makes a deputation as th and says things about properties in Councillor Fletcher's ward, and I want to acknowledge how Councillor Fletcher uh, clarified the record and the facts about that, and just because as things were said about 140 Merton, which are not true, we are building a wonderful senior supportable housing building there that will support the community and has the community support. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. I think that we have proven over and over again that we can prioritize different uh, important issues in our city at the same time. That's our job. Heritage is important. Affordability in our city is a crisis that we need to address fully. We can do both well if we choose to, and we're using every tool in the toolbox to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to add a couple of remarks on, uh, to pick up on this theme. Uh, during the deputations, it was said, uh, first of all, that there is some, somehow a conflict between uh, protecting heritage buildings along Queen Street and getting affordable housing. And uh, the, in fact, West Queen West was specifically mentioned. So let's just take a look at that. The two uh, most innovative and exciting affordable housing uh, operations on Queen Street West, both by not-for-profits, uh, exist in heritage buildings. Edmonds Place, which is uh, a tremendous uh, socially run not-for-profit, housing uh, people who have uh, been street involved, and Gallery 1313, which is one of the earliest artscape housing. Uh, projects, both in heritage buildings. Interestingly, um, when Edmonds Place was being done, uh, the not-for-profit applicant for that site came forward and said, we believe this is a heritage building. We would like you to designate it as a heritage building, and we think that if it's a designated heritage building, it will be more successful as affordable housing than if we were to knock the building down and build something new. Further, we're right now at the 1313 site as part of the discussions around the, the Parkdale hub, and I know Mr. Richardson's aware of this, looking to dramatically increase the amount of affordable housing at that site while retaining the heritage values. The idea that the two of them are at odds exists in the minds of a, a handful of individuals in the city of Toronto who seem to believe that the only way you house people in the city of Toronto is to throw out all planning and heritage rules. They're wrong. The facts show that they're wrong. And it's unfortunate that they're influencing as many people as they are. So, uh, anyone else to speak on this? No? 
So, Councillor Fletcher, can we take your motion and the item together? Okay, taking it all as a package, all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Next, item 2415, demolition of a structure with South Rosedale Heritage Conservation, within the South Rosedale Heritage Conservation District and approval of a replacement structure at 10 Elm Avenue. I have no deputants here. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Layton, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I believe I can move the staff recommendations. Okay, on the staff recommendations, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, item TE 24.16, 1375 Queen Street West Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application Request for Directions Report. Uh, I have no deputants this. Are there any questions of staff? I don't see any. I'm going to move the staff recommendations. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.17. 372 to 378 Young Street, Official Plan Amendment, Zoning Amendment Applications, Request for Directions Report. I have no deputants listed on this item. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, Councillor Layton. Well, there are no deputants because they've all emailed me personally from Marlborough Street, but I'm happy to move the staff recommendations for the, uh, the direction of staff to go and fight the appeal at the LPAP. Very good. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item TE 24.18, 63 to 91 Montclair Avenue, zoning bylaw amendment and rental housing demolition applications, request for direction report. I have some deputants listed on this item. Uh, Leslie Levac, can you hear us, Leslie? Here I am. Hi, welcome. Uh, you have five minutes to address the committee. Start whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of council, community members and neighbours. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today as a concerned local resident. I really applaud the city planner's careful review of the development proposal and support the recommendations in the report. I'd like to make some personal comments and emphasize some serious um, and important issues. First, I'm not against well-considered and well-placed development. However, I'm very concerned about the significant densification and huge volume of the proposed structure on a short, dead-end street that is not zoned for a structure of this size and its related occupancy. The sheer mass of the two tower structure, 21 and 23 stories, and the intended residency rate are far beyond anything that's reasonable for this location. In contrast, the existing multi-resident buildings on the street are between six and eight stories and have good setbacks. It's startling to me that Parallax, the developer, could realistically imagine placing such a bulky, towering, shadow-throwing mass in this location. The proposed density alone would create problems that the developer is either not anticipated or simply does not care to address. Here are examples of just two very serious problems emanating from the densification and proposed structure. How will safe and efficient movement of pedestrians be managed? And how will clear and efficient access for emergency and service vehicles and efficient movement of increased vehicular traffic be feasible? Parallax does not appear to have contemplated and mitigated the enormity of the problem of moving possibly 1,000 pedestrians from the proposed development to the somewhat adjacent St. Clair subway uh, substop to the west. The development is on a dead end street. Walking east to Spadina and then south and then along Heath Street is a good long walk. It's not a short distance from the subway station. And what about clear and efficient access for emergency and service vehicles as well as other vehicles? Where will, for example, an increased volume of garbage, fire, moving and delivery trucks as well as ambulances access this development and turn around? Montclair is a narrow city street and Bantry Avenue to the south functions presently as a narrow service laneway. Vehicular access and movement is a critical safety issue. Traffic on Spadina Road, the only entry to and exit from Montclair Avenue, is often stopped and jammed from Lonsdale to Heath Street. 
Pedestrian access ways and traffic management are just two of many issues that emanate from the density and mass. Packing far too many people in residential units onto a short dead end street is not what I understand the city or the province have in mind for development. I believe the proposal must be significantly scaled back with acceptable transition into the city existing streetscape. And when this is done, all the other issues of traffic, access, safety, utility, infrastructure, environment, et cetera, will need to be addressed intelligently. There's really something amiss with this development of pr proposal. It's just so obviously wrong for its intended location. I trust that council will take the thoughtful advice given by the city planner, take into account the significant and legitimate concerns of community members and oppose this development in its existing form. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions of the deputant? Seeing none. Leslie, thank you so much for sharing your advice with us today. Um, next, I'm yeah. going I'm to call on Linda uh, Tuck Chapman. Linda, are you with us? Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Council, for allowing me this opportunity to speak. I also want to thank Josh Matlow and his staff. You've been terrific, as has the city planner. So my husband, Tom Ashbourne, and I are long-term residents of 376 Spadina Road. So we're, on the, we're almost at the corner of Bantry and Spadina Road. And we don't, like our, the previous speaker, we don't oppose development, certainly through in the, in the 17 years we've been in that location. There's been lots of changes in our neighborhood and we're pretty happy with them. The, you know, things are going well. But as the previous speaker said, this, is, this, is, this development is completely out of character with the neighborhood. It's pretty massive and, you know, Forest Hill Village is the last actual existing village in the city of Toronto. And it seems from a heritage perspective, you might want to consider preserving uh, the village itself. So, as was spoken earlier, the tallest building on Montclair is currently eight stories and I believe that's what it is actually zoned for. So, this, uh, this uh, uh, plan that Parallax has put forward is in no way uh, going to conform with existing bylaws and uh, and the zoning. Now we live on Spadina Road and we use Bantry Avenue, which is very grandly called an avenue. It really is a service lane. It's only a couple of inches wider than a service lane itself. So it's a very narrow street and it's kind of steep at the top. So we come in and it's already a bit tricky navigating getting into our parking uh, place because there's a garage at the uh, at the corner of the little lane behind us and there's a low rise apartment building. So it's a bit tricky getting around there at the best of times. And we're just, we have uh, a few parking places there, but there are 12 of them back there in total that have to get through somehow or other the lane. So we currently use Bantry as our, as our entry. And I believe the proposal is to make it one way going the other way, which is gonna make it pretty much impossible to get into our parking place from the other end because it's exceptionally narrow. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about Bantry Avenue. Uh, I did sit in on the um, on the proposal that uh, where the developer went through it. And there's a proposal not just for all these large vehicles and construction and fire and ambulance, et cetera. But they're also proposing that 90 cars an hour will come out of Bantry Avenue onto Spadina Road. And if you're at all familiar with Spadina Road, once they put in the uh, streetcar in, on St. Clair, it already is a major through point, so it's pretty busy all the time in, uh, during you know normal waking hours on uh, Spadina Road. So I don't really know if anybody could safely get out of there. It's it's pretty tricky as it is. We often have to wait, and not only that, it's steep there. So I have seen many a morning when people can't get up the lane to get onto Spadina Road because of ice and snow. Right, so it's not easy at the best of times. So, um, so people get stuck on the way hill. Now, also, uh, the subway is close by, so there's lots of people streaming through across Bantry Avenue, and the little lane that runs behind our house is a shortcut to get over to the subway. So, this is based on our on our existing uh, volume of people. Uh, the Heath Street Co-op, which is behind us, uh, also has an entranceway onto this narrow lane, which is, which is perpendicular to Bantry and Heath. It runs in between. 
So they come out of there quite regularly. I mean, I myself had to be quite cautious backing up to make sure that there's nobody there. So there's lots of pedestrians already going through there. And I can't even imagine another thousand people looking for shortcuts to the subway. They will use that Bantry Avenue. They will use that laneway behind our street. And it's already pretty unsafe. So uh, all this additional traffic will certainly make it worse. Now, I so I've talked about kind of access, I've talked about the scale, and I've talked about the whole safety aspect to it. Now, there was a fire on um, uh, the house next door to us and the one over on the other side of Bantry Avenue since we've been there in 17 years. Believe me, it was quite difficult for the fire vehicles to even find a place to, to, to park their vehicles to get in to put those fires out. So uh, if you've got um, a big apartment building down the way, I don't honestly see how you could safely fight a fire, just given the access to such a narrow space. And uh, anyhow, so I and not to mention ambulance and all kinds of things. So I, I can't really see that this would be safe. Now we've lived through construction in our area because to the south of us, it is an apartment area and uh, and it's zoned for apartments. But our home did suffer considerable damage because of the tolerances for, uh, you know, the ground shaking, et cetera. So I, I'm not sure that our little old house would survive. It's about 100 years old. I'm, I'm not sure it could survive this massive construction so close by. And we can't be the only ones. I know our neighbors across the street, in fact, sued the developer who put in some apartment buildings over on Heath Street uh, successfully because of damage. So uh, that's a real concern. And also I'm kind of wondering whether or not the whole infrastructure in the area, it's, it was never built for this many people. How will it survive if in fact we're gonna be putting that many people on? So I see I'm out of time. I just wanna wrap up to say, we don't disagree with this development, but we do think it would set a precedent for violating uh, zoning bylaws and, and changing them. And basically once the cat's out of the bag, that may well be uh, something that happens in many areas of the city, not just ours. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, Linda, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, next, I have David Kaufman. David? Oh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can, David. Welcome. Uh, you have five thank minutes you. to share your uh, thinking with the committee. Start anytime you're ready. Yes, and my name is David Kaufman. I am a resident of Lower Village Gate a complex of 34 buildings, including two seven-story buildings and 32 townhouses. We have submitted to Council a written list of issues that are of special concern to Lower Village Gate. Our first point today regards the exit of pedestrians from an enclave. Our complex separates the development from the TTC and the St. Clair and Bathurst commercial hub to the west. Knowing that the development is contained within an enclave, at the November public consultation, the developer presented a revised plan with a pedestrian exit from the enclave via the public portion of Lower Village Gate Road to access Heath Street. But the developer has not filed its revised plan, having appealed to LPAT under its original plan. Staff recognizes that a public walkway connecting to the TTT, TTC subway is a critical pedestrian connection. However, it's not so simple. The walkway ramp proposed by the developer must encroach upon city property. It must punch an entranceway through a city-owned retaining wall. Hence, developer's proposed ramp requires a public domain agreement between the developer and the city, a planning issue with financial implications which should be a condition precedent to any development regardless of its eventual height and density. Our second point regards transition from one zone to another. Our zoning is classified as a neighborhood. The development would be in an apartment neighborhood. Where an apartment neighborhood is adjacent to a neighborhood, the built form policies of the official plan require an appropriate transition in scale to neighboring existing buildings. However, the development would erect a sheer wall bordering our complex that is triple the height of our highest buildings, which insults the zoning notion of an appropriate transition in scale to neighboring buildings. City planning acknowledges that the development will cast us into shadow half the day at both the spring and fall equinoxes, 
and it generate winter wind conditions that will be brutally impactful on Lower Village Gate. The development should be redesigned to allow for a more gradual transition by stepping back the elevations of its western structure significantly, not superficially, or by terracing the built form. As the city recommendation report indicates, an adequate side setback provides a method of transitioning from neighborhood to an adjacent apartment neighborhood. However, the development's structure goes right up to our property line. It is troubling to imagine that the fire department does not require a fire lane at the dead end of the development. It is equally troubling that city traffic service does not require a similar roadway because the original traffic ingress and egress arrangement of the developer is unworkable in the extreme. The developer retreated from these shortfalls in its revised plan, which is not before this council. The matter should be dealt with at the zoning stage since it will change the built form footprint of the development. Our third point regards sewerage infrastructure, pipes and storm drains in our area were installed roughly in 1983. 40 odd years later, they will be utterly inadequate with the additional demands of the Montclair development and other recent developments in our area. Indeed, the developer admits that the available fire flow water demands on Montclair are substandard and require water main improvements. We agree with city planning that the developer must submit a revised functional servicing and stormwater management report for improvements to the existing municipal infrastructure. <laughs> Who bears the cost of infrastructure upgrades is a concomitant issue. Our fourth point regards height, density, and massing. South Forest Hill Residents Association, in its written submission, in the written submission of its council Wood Bull on April 19, which is part of the record, has mentioned issues of height density massing. So has the city planning report. We share the same concerns. Finally, we agree with city planning that the developer must submit an upgraded transportation study and a transportation demand management plan. The development will only exacerbate the existing congestion and lack of street parking by adding a massive vehicle load cars, trucks, moving vans, contractors, service vehicles, and constant food and parcel deliveries to an already highly congested area. David, I have, I have to ask you to wrap up. Do you have one final yes, thought? I, think I, have, I have wrapped up. Thank you for your, your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions for David? I don't see any. Uh, next I have, David, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. Next I have Gordon Harris. Gordon, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, Gordon. Uh, so uh, you have five minutes to address Mr. the committee. Chair. Start whenever you're ready. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, members of council. As you just heard, I'm Gordon Harris. I'm a member of the 70 Montclair condo board. 70 Montclair is directly across the street from this proposed development. As well as being a member of our condo board, I also chair the board's planning and development advisory committee. The proposed redevelopment, uh, 6391 Montclair Avenue, as proposed, would be entirely out of scale with the neighborhood. And as our building lies immediately north of the proposed redevelopment site, we have a particular concern, as it would put our building's communal rooftop amenity space in shade for much of the day, as well as shade the public realm, our ground uh, level outdoor space, and all of the suites on the south side of 70 Montclair. But I, I want to be clear, we're not opposed at all to redevelopment in the city, um, but we do not believe that a project of this scale in this location is appropriate, and therefore it does not represent good planning. It's the view of the 70 Montclair board and our committee that this redevelopment could be acceptable if the proposed height, mass, form, and scale are addressed. Reducing the height, adding greater setbacks from property lines, respecting the principle of an angular plane and reduction in the floor space index from the proposed 11.3 would certainly bring the project into a more appropriate scale with its surrounding neighbors. And just as important as our concern about height, mass, and density is our concern about the impact 
redevelopment as proposed would have on traffic on this narrow one block long dead end street. You've already heard uh, others speak to that. Large vehicles, including emergency vehicles, such as fire trucks, are particularly challenged uh, by the nature of this narrow dead end street. As well, the development as proposed would result in the loss of dozens of mature trees, including a stunning 60 plus foot Norway maple and other vibrant and healthy trees, Japanese maples, white ashes, and Scotch and Siberian elms. So while this proposed redevelopment would have a direct impact on the established uh, Forest Hill South area, it also has the potential to be a precedent for many other established neighborhoods throughout Toronto. There are many good precedents from across the city demonstrating excellence in large-scale urban design and redevelopment. Unfortunately, this project is not one of them. The project would be far better suited to a location along a major arterial roadway, not on a narrow one block long dead end street. And nor would it be suited in scores of similar small streets throughout Toronto. We wholeheartedly encourage redevelopment to increase the supply of available, affordable and accessible housing in Toronto. But please make sure that this and future projects fit into and add to, not take away from the Toronto neighborhoods we all love. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Gordon? I don't see any. Gordon, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Next, I have Judy Newman. Hello. Hello, Judy. Hi. Hi, it's Gordon Perks. Yes, I can hear you. Welcome to okay. Toronto East York Community Council. You've got five minutes to address the committee. Start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the council for giving me this time to speak. Um, I'm just gonna, for giving me this time to speak uh, uh, about the issue of the overdevelopment of 63 to 91 Montclair Ave. My name is you know, Judy Newman and I'm a longtime resident of 260 Heath Street West, which is about a block away from the proposed overdevelopment. I want to begin by saying that I was pleased to see that the city planners were not recommending the proposal as submitted by Parallax in its current form. The planners recognize that there are many significant items to be addressed before the proposal can be considered for approval for the small narrow piece of property flanked by two substandard dead end roadways, one of which is literally a laneway. The developer is proposing to place what is essentially a mid-rise development capped by two tall towers on the, onto this property. The density is four times that of any building in the area and taller by at least 15 stories than any building on the street. They want to have their cake and eat it too. The developer managed to buy the 15 single family and townhomes on the south side of the street. While I'm not opposed to redevelopment of the properties, I'm opposed to the developer trying to cram two giant high rises into this small area. Any size development that is more than single family homes would constitute intensification here. The site is perfect for a missing middle type of development that would allow for green space and sunlight. My building and others will be grossly overshadowed by these proposed buildings, cutting off sunlight for most of the day for public spaces as far as a block or two away, including the only parquet in the immediate area. The planners point out that Parallax does not provide for appropriate setbacks, transitions, green spaces, or protection of existing materials trees. All other buildings in the area are surrounded by green spaces for any resident to enjoy. Parallax has saved any meager green space for its proposed owners only. This is not a build, this is not a development that will enhance um, affordable housing in any way. I have always loved my neighborhood for its diversity of population in terms of age and family composition. As I've gotten older, I appreciate the ability to walk along the streets, including Montclair, with safety. There are always people walking their dogs, children running along the sidewalk or being pushed in strollers. We're able to walk along the roadway if need be, which has been more often during COVID, in order to maintain physical distancing. I'm not sure that will continue if this huge oversized development is permitted to be built. 
The proposal does not allow for safe pickup and drop off of residents or deliveries, movement of traffic from other buildings, or garbage and emergency vehicles. In the winter months, the roadway and sidewalks are even more congested due to snow and ice. On occasion, on many occasions, uh, seen trucks not being able to having to back up down the back up the street because they can't um, because they can't turn around and also parking on the sidewalk to allow for any flow of traffic by going directly to the LPAT it seems the parallax is signaling that they do not intend to make the needed changes. I am hoping that the city and the community will vigorously oppose this development in its current form and that the city will conduct its own studies on all outstanding issues to ensure that the safety and well being of people of the neighborhood take prior priority over developer profits. Thank you for your attention and consideration. And I hope that this proposal will be turned down until a more appropriate plan is in place to benefit the South Forest Hill community and its residents. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I don't see any. Um, oh, geez. Can I ask one of Councillor Bailao, Councillor Bradford, uh, or Councillor Fletcher to put your camera on just so that I know I have quorum. Here's Councillor Bradford. Okay, I have quorum. Uh, so there were no questions for Judy. Judy, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Next deputant we have listed is Marcia Gilbert. Good afternoon, Marcia. Good afternoon. Welcome to Toronto East York Community Council. You have five minutes to address us. Please start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marcy Gilbert and I'm speaking on behalf of South Forest Hill Residents Association or SFHRA, a non-profit volunteer led organization with over 600 members living, working or connected in some way to the area. SFHRA is committed to enhancing our diverse community, helping members address issues of concern and advocating for our shared interests. The SFHRA is represented by Johanna Shapira from Woodbilt Bull LLP, along with our planner David Butler and urban designer Mike Michael Spaziani. The Toronto East York Community Council will have received a detailed submission from Ms. Shapira. I want to highlight a few issues and say a few other things. First, I want to acknowledge all of the hard work by the city planners in reviewing this development and their decision to reject as it as it's proposed. The SFHRA is very appreciative of the staff hearing our comments and writing the report, which was no small task. In opposing the development, we are not trying to prevent new people from moving to Forest Hill Village. I want to state clearly for the record, we're happy to welcome new people into the community. What we are opposing is a development that, as proposed, is much too large for the street and the neighborhood. It was very disappointing that the developer categorically refused to engage the community in any effort to reduce the height of the building. At most, the current Montclair buildings are eight stories tall, and as such, they are a fitting transition to the homes just north. By contrast, the height, density, and massing of the proposed parallax development are four times greater than the existing buildings on the street and at least double any other building in the area. Notwithstanding our very clear statements of concerns about the height, massing, and density, the developer to date has stuck to its original proposal of two towers 21 plus and 23 plus stories on top of a significant mid-rise building platform as well without an appropriate setback. The community has serious concerns about safety. The safety issues are complex uh, of this, uh, are the safety issues that are co complex of this magnitude, which is sandwiched between a narrow dead end street and essentially a dead end laneway. There are already vehicular challenges on Montclair, especially when trying to enter the intersection at Spadina. The widths of both Montclair Avenue and Bantry do not allow for trucks to turn around, forcing trucks to back up out of the street into Spadina Road or 
use one of the existing driveways of the mid-rise buildings, which has resulted in the damage of retaining walls and putting pedestrians at risk of injury. How will emergency vehicles access and depart Montclair or Bantry when they need to attend to residents? We request the city seek an independent traffic study separate from the study submitted by the developers to look at these issues. The developers traffic study because of its timing did not take into account the number of home deliveries, be it packages or food that are delivered by trucks. A study was done on a similar 20 story building pre COVID documenting that 4,000 packages were delivered in one year. We can expect post pandemic people uh, post pandemic people will continue to do most of their shopping through e commerce resulting in increased truck traffic on these dead end streets. For safety reasons, a new transportation study and emergency vehicle study cannot wait until site planning. This independent study needs to be transparent and done prior to zoning because zoning is what will determine the height and massing of the building. SFHRA is concerned about the impact on green space by the development. Furthermore, the development will create shadowing of the public parquet at Montclair and Spadina, the rooftop gardens of 60 and 70 Montclair, where residents in these buildings enjoy access to the common rooftop garden and lounge area, and impact the residents at 240 Heath, who have an outdoor patio on the grass behind their building. The developer should not obtain relief from zoning and planning requirements in a way that negatively impacts the local community, it should provide it should provide some green space at grade. We're, we're asking the city to do, do their due diligence to ensure the residents both current and in the future will be safe and that equity be implemented so that current and future citizens have access to green space and that this precedent setting over development not continue to creep into the community, making Toronto an unlivable place for seniors, families, people with a disability, intergenerational and financially diverse population. Thank you for your time. We're counting on you to make sure there is an appropriate development solution for this site. Thank you, Marsha. Are there any questions? No? Uh, thank you so much for your, your thoughts and your deputation today. Uh, next, I uh, Shalom Schachter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is... R Welcome to Toronto East York Community Council. Uh, you've got five minutes to make a deputation to the committee. You can start whenever you like. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Rabbi Shalom Schachter, and I'm active in a number of interfaith social justice organizations, including the Interfaith Social Assistance Reform Coalition, the Toronto Area Interfaith Council, and Faith in the City. One of our major um, uh, objectives through these organizations is to address the critical shortage of housing in the city. Uh, I live on Montclair, uh, and the street uh, contains a diverse population uh, by age, family size, uh, income levels, and ethnic and interracial uh, background. Uh, the street uh, we live on contains uh, single-family houses, modestly priced condos, and two large uh, rental uh, buildings. Uh, the housing um, on 63 to 91 uh, Montclair uh, is a uh, proper site for intensification. But what we need uh, is affordable housing, low cost housing, rent geared to income housing, and rent geared to purchase housing. The luxury um, high priced condos uh, of uh, limited space will not solve our um, housing uh, crisis uh, and uh, this issue uh, came up with uh, earlier applications. We urge the city in every one of um, its uh, developments uh, to insist that there be uh, some degree of affordable housing uh, to address the real needs of um, most people who lack adequate housing uh, today. 
Um, finally, in respect of amenities, uh, the amenities um, should be made available to all residents uh, of the uh, street, and that would include uh, access to green space, dog runs, uh, recreation areas, and especially with efforts to uh, control our carbon uh, output uh, to have access uh, to um, um, electronic um, or electric uh, charging stations. Uh, again, thank you very much uh, for um, uh, allowing me this opportunity to speak, and I hope you will take these um, concerns into consideration when you address uh, this development. Okay, thank you very much, Shalom. Are there any questions? No? Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, that, that concludes our list of deputants for today. Are there any questions of, are there for this item? Are there any questions of staff? I do. Councillor Matla. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, through you uh, to, um, to planning staff, are you in possession of the, uh, the, the motions that I uh, intend to, to move? Uh, thank you. This is Oren Smear speaking. Uh, we were just uh, given word of those now. Yes. Okay. So, um, just to be clear, and I can read it to you if if that's helpful, um, but I just need this for the record. Is your interpretation of the motion that I'm moving with respect to the navigability of Toronto Fire Services and other and other uh, relevant to you know Toronto Paramedic Services, etc. Is your interpretation that I intend for that study and the information to be made publicly accessible to be done now or at the site plan stage? Because my intent is for it to be done now. It, uh, from what I understand, uh, Councillor, your intent is for it to be uh, moved up to the zoning stage uh, rather right. than its uh, typical site plan stage. That's correct. That's my understanding. And so, with the passage of this motion, would would, would that be done? Uh, well, I understand you are asking for us to seek um, that information from our uh, colleagues, and so yes. we can seek that information. Uh, but perhaps it's more of a, a question for uh, our, our our colleagues in the other divisions, like emergency services. Okay, I appreciate that. So, is uh, is Jim Jessup there? Is Deputy Chief Jessup there? Or somebody from fire. Mr. chair, do you know? I, I don't have anyone uh, stepping forward from those departments. Uh, Councillor Matlow, I'm not sure how you want to proceed. I'll go back to uh, to Orange Samir. Um, I had a conversation. I had a conversation with Deputy Chief Jessup, and given the capacity challenges that they may have due to the fact that their team is also supporting the uh, the city's vaccination clinics uh, through the pandemic now, that it may be helpful to have some outside support to prov to provide that analysis if they're not able to directly. Is that something that planning would undertake or would you be asking them to undertake that? I just want to understand who does what. Uh, Councillor, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll say typically when we have a question that we would like answered, we go back to the applicant uh, and have their uh, experts uh, assess the, or answer the question we have. That's the typical process. Any of uh, any such request to go to an independent or outside person, not through the applicant, is uh, is not typical. So we would have to explore how that's done. So I know it's not typical, but that's the point, right? We don't want to rely right. on the applicant's uh, advice. We want to have uh, independent, objective advice, whether it be from, for example, Toronto Fire or from an independent consultant. Would it happen one way or another? But working with your colleagues. If council directs so, yes. Okay. And so just to be clear, is that your interpretation of the wording of the motion in front of you? Uh, 
Council, I'm just gonna look at it again very quickly. Thank you. I just wanna know if I need to change a single word, if there's anything that I need to do to make it clear, because that's my intent and I, and I appreciate your advice. So I, I think we would seek um, advice from fire services because we need to understand what their um, requirements are. Because frankly, it's not the same type of requirement for solid waste in terms of maneuverability and turning radii and whatnot. Fire trucks you know, have a little bit more liberty on our streets and they can move and, uh, and back up in different ways than fire trucks could. So not understanding what their requirements are, we'd obviously have to seek from them to understand that. Um, you know, typically the types of comments we've received from fire services are those with respect to the distance uh, of the front entrance from the public road or the distance from the front entrance to a fire hydrant. Uh, maneuverability uh, isn't one that is typically discussed with city planning. So again, yes. if that's not an issue for fire services, then it's important for us to understand that. Um, and so we will understand what their issues are and work with them on that. Okay, and that and that the analysis will be publicly available. Do are you you're fine with that? I don't have a problem with that. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Chair, unless there's any other questions from my colleagues, I have some motions. I don't see any anyone else leaping to that. Nope. Or is yours, Councillor Matlow? So, would you uh, would you mind uh, asking the clerk to put the motions on the screen? I, I don't even need to ask; they just do it. Like I, I don't even know why you need a chair for this meeting, frankly. I, I forgot who's telling who what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> floor is yours. Thank you. So. Um, you know, what what you've heard from uh, my the residents in my community uh, is is completely accurate, and I want to thank the uh, the deputants for the very thoughtful submissions to community council. Um, I want to begin by clarifying, you know, what this community is, and just as importantly, what it isn't. Um, I know that there is a um, a, 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 a belief by many that. Forest Hill Village is only uh, a, a, a wealthy uh, neighborhood uh, in the heart of Toronto, because of course there's truth to that. But it's not only that. If you if you know Montclair, you know that it is um, it's a reflection of Toronto. It's a reflection of the diversity of Toronto. There's a diversity of uh, backgrounds. There's a diversity of income brackets. There's a diversity of means. There's a diversity of ages and there's a diversity of abilities. Um, and it's a community that is not anti-development as without exception, every single one of the deputations that you heard made that very clear. Uh, what they do want to ensure is that the development leaves the community better than the developer found them. Uh, that is always a reasonable request. The development proposal by Parallax is not only far too large, exceeds just the, you know, any any concept of what's reasonable for that specific site, as as planning also concurs with, but it also uh, completely ignores any reasonable transition. It exacerbates the current traffic concerns. Um, and it ultimately uh, has left residents with um, enormous worry about the ability of first responders to be able to access Montclair uh, within a reasonable time frame to do their work uh, to to address um, you know real emergencies uh, within the street. the The context of the street itself is that it is a very narrow, dead end street, and it um, and it abuts Spadina, which during normal times, and even during you know part of parts of this pandemic, sadly, uh, is is bumper to bumper traffic. It's a very very you know it it, it wasn't originally designed to be a, a major street, but it but it carries a lot of volume. I'm speaking of Spadina in particular. So to get in and out of Montclair already is a challenge, 
especially during peak hours. And there are very reasonable concerns about the ability of first responders to be able to navigate that. Um, and they just want answers. They're not asking for what the answers will be, but they want to be reassured that uh, that our first responders and other relevant staff are genuinely comfortable or not comfortable, but they want to know what the answer is. You know, Parallax, uh, when this started out, um, uh, I invited them to come and partake in a working group process with these residents, some of whom you heard from today. And it started what I believe to be in good faith. And then Parallax just walked away from the table just before Christmas and they went to the LPAT. All of you have led working group processes where you were, you were hopeful that the, the residents and the applicant would work together to arrive at what we often refer to as an admittedly imperfect, but perfectly reasonable or perfectly workable resolution. Parallax decided simply to walk away uh, from the table, go to the LPAT, and then tell us after the fact. So, um, with, you know, with, with the support of the community and importantly, with the support of our planning staff, and I want to acknowledge Sipo Mapango for the good work that she's done along with her colleagues, along with Oren and the rest of planning staff. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the lower village gate residents, the residents on both Heath and Montclair, and in particular, the South Forest Hill Residents Association, uh, who've provided um, strong and capable leadership in the community. And I want to, I want to encourage residents in the Forest Hill area to actively support your residents association who are, who are, you know, they put in a lot of time, they don't earn anything and they're, and they're doing whatever they can to protect the well-being of the neighborhood and the quality of life in this community. And I just, I can't encourage you enough to get behind them because the work they're doing is really worthy of our support. So um, I hope you support uh, what I what I have before you. Thank you again for planning, for your willingness to take this on at the LPAT, and we will continue working closely together to make sure that the interests of the community come before the financial interests of, of this developer who isn't even willing to work uh, in, in, a, in a reasonable way with the community to even arrive at a resolution. Uh, I hope that they will come back to the table in one form or another, so that we can actually address the outstanding concerns that the community has. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. Are there any questions for Councillor Matlow? I don't see any. Does anyone else wish to speak to the item? No? Uh, so, uh, Councillor Matlow, with your permission, I'll take the amendment together with the item. All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Okay. Just roaring through it here, team. We're on item 19. Remember, we have 97 items today. Um, item TE 24.19, Residential Demolition Application 350 Davenport Road. I do not have any deputants listed. Are there questions of staff? I don't see any. Uh, to speak, Councillor Layton. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm just trying to find my notes here while Councillor Cressy, I think, gives me a call. I'm sorry, Councillor Cressy. No, this one's one of yours, 19. Yes, no, he was just actually giving me a phone call. So it came up on my phone and because I'm working with one last computer. Uh, I couldn't view it. Uh, this, I will be supporting the staff recommendations to allow for the demolition at 350 Davenport Road. So um, there's a there, there's no above grade building permit, but we do need the space. Councillor, 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 I hate to interrupt you. Yes, I need to know whether you're moving to approve it without conditions or with conditions. I believe it's to approve it with conditions. So recommendation two. Okay, thank you. All right, is that it? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the standard condition. This is this is easy. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, item TE 24.21, non-residential residential demolition application 12 and 20 Dawes Road. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped 20. Uh, 
to E25. My, my apologies, Mr. Mr. Speak. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could go back, I need to approve without conditions on this one because the city needs access. Okay. To the site staging. We're gonna. This takes my a apologies. lot of work, Councillor. Watch. That's a whole bunch of work. Okay. Can I have a motion to reopen? Councillor Layton is moving that. that. All those in favor of reopening. <laughs> that carries. Councillor Layton, would you like to move a motion on this item? I, I will move. Uh, I will move the motion number one, the option number one, which is to approve the demolition without condition. No, option one is to refuse. You want option yeah, two. Sorry, option two, not option three. Okay, option two, which is to approve without conditions. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, next, item TE 24.20, res Residential Demolition Application 99, Oxford Street. Councillor Layton. Uh, yes, uh, I believe there is a motion to approve with conditions, but there is additional condition, there is an additional motion that should be here. That was requested from Heritage Preservation So that C, Services. any new building proposed for the property at 99 should be designed to respect the history of the site? That's it. Okay, good. Okay, um, on the motion from Councillor Layton, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Now, TE 24.21, we have deputants. Uh, first, Pedro Lopez. Pedro is not present. Tabby Nazari. Tabby, we, I'm told you need to connect your microphone. We've given you permission on our side. You need to do something on your computer at home. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, Tabby, hello. Welcome to Toronto East York Community Council. You have five minutes to address the committee. Please start whenever you're ready. Uh, hi, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, member, uh, members of the council. This is Tabby Nussi, Development Manager at Marlin Estate. I would like to really thank the staff and the council's office to bring this request to today's meeting. And I'm also here to answer a council question. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Okay, are those all your remarks today, Tabby? Uh, yes. Okay. Are there any questions? Seeing none, Tabby, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, are there any questions of staff from members of the committee? Seeing none, Councillor Bradford, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I would like to move uh, recommendation one. Okay, Councillor Bradford is moving refusal. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item TE 24.22, request for fence. Why did it's, I, I. Sorry, Councillor, just one moment. I have to be. One moment, please. I had it as 22. We were on 21, Councillor. We're just we're just clearing something up here uh, with the clerks. I've probably caused them some problem that I don't even understand. Hang on. Okay, moving along. Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes. So my confusion perhaps there between 21 and 22. Uh, if we've done 21, I need to reopen that and move recommendation number three, yeah. if, if that's possible, if that's where we're at with clerks. And uh, apologies for that. I'm giving you the Councillor Layton look now. Oh. 
Okay. What does that look like? That's that, we're going to have to, it's a whole bunch of work to fix this. Watch. Mm -hmm. Can I have a motion to reopen item 24.21? Councillor Layton, this is his motion now. All those in favor of reopening. Okay. Now, Councillor Bradford, which would you like to move? On 24.21, I would like to move staff recommendation three. On recommendation three, which we'll put up on the screen, that's to approve with those three conditions. Is that good? That's correct. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. So on that motion, all those in favor, opposed, carry. Like that was just exhausting, man. Don't do that to me again. It's been a day. It's, oh, I know. I know. You wouldn't believe the, the trouble I caused the clerks over here. <laughs> All day long, they're like rolling their eyes at each other. What What is the chair up to? I got no idea. It, yeah, they're, they're strong souls. Okay, now we will go to TE 24.22. Uh, we do have two deputants there. Uh, first, Angelina Malloy. Angelina, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? I certainly can. Welcome to Toronto East York Community Council. You'll have five minutes to, to talk to the committee. Start whenever you're ready. Okay, um, just before I start, sorry, um, could you please confirm that Council has our most recent submissions, Exhibits 1 through 8, that I'll be using in my presentation? Uh, give me one second to check. Thank you. When did you send them in? Today. Or yesterday, sorry, yesterday. Okay, we're just checking with the agenda. I mean, yes, the members have the email access to the documents. Yes, we do have access to the documents you sent in. I've just checked on my own. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so please start. Okay, all right. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. My name is Angelina, and I live at 81 Boardwalk Drive. I'm here to voice my strong opposition to the fence exemption request on the east boundary fence of 79 and 81 Boardwalk Drive due to the negative impact on our property. Almost two years ago, in early July 2019, the owners of 79 Boardwalk Drive unilaterally increased the height of our adjacent fence above the bylaw limit of two meters. The increase on our side resulted in heights of 2.64 meters to 2.44 meters. When it was finished, the negative effects of the height increase were blatantly obvious from our small backyard and when looking out from our main floor family room windows. It was very obtrusive and disproportionate. It extended well above the garage roof line, which looked very odd and created an unpleasant boxed in feel. As shown in the photos we submitted, exhibits one, two, and three. Being very upset at the negative effects, we filed an official complaint. The city bylaw officer found the fence in violation and issued an order to comply. After the deadline, there was partial compliance. The horizontal planks were removed, but the new unsightly post extensions remained in violation. As shown in Exhibit 4, which is the email correspondence with the bylaw officer, and Exhibit 5 and 6, which show the post extensions as they still exist today. A year later, July 2020, a second order to comply was issued for the East Boundary Fence. By now, they surely knew the rules and process for fence bylaws, yet at this time, 79 Boardwalk Drive increased the height of their south fence, which is also non-compliant. It was the following month, August 2020, that they applied for a rear yard fence exemption on the south, east, and north boundaries. Our hope is their grouping of fences into one rear yard application isn't a way of getting a blanket approval for all boundaries in one ruling. Most recently on February 23rd, 2021, Ms. Grimma submitted a letter to council summarizing their reasons for needing the fence exemption on the east boundary. And the contents of this letter are deeply concerning to us as it contains many false claims and misleading statements. Please refer to the red highlighted area of Exhibit 7. For example, they claim we have verbally intimidated and assaulted them while on their property to the point where they had to get a restraining order against us. 
Can I ask? I'm, I'm very sorry to inter interfere, Angelina. Like, yeah. I, I, I just want to be really clear. The purpose of uh, your time here is to give us your opinion on the on. Uh, the I understand. Uh, no, I, I, I thank you, and I understand that. Okay. But anything else? Anything else? Anything else does not help us make up our minds. So if you could just tell us what you think about defense exemption, okay? Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, so basically, um, there's there's nothing in their letter that would pertain to us for a reason for requiring them to have defense exemption. Um, we are not a threat to them in any way, um, or nor to anyone. Um, security is not compromised with a two meter fence. And 79 Boardwalk has had security cameras installed around their property for many years now. When it comes to privacy, we cannot see from our backyard or main floor into their backyard, um, from anywhere in our backyard. And in this neighborhood, all houses have third floor back balcony, so full privacy is afforded to no one. And aesthetically, we already know what the height increase is going to look like because we've seen it. And it will permanently change the look, feel, and enjoyment of our yard. From their side, 79 Boardwalk has planted a cedar hedge along the east boundary fence which will continue to grow and hide the requested extension from their view. This cedar hedge has no height limit and is a natural barrier that will provide the same effect as increasing the east boundary fence, except with more pleasing results for both homeowners, as shown in Exhibit 8. Because of this non-compliant fence, we have now had the enjoyment of our property negatively affected for almost two years. In conclusion, we are requesting the council deny 79 Boardwalk Drive's request for a fence exemption on our east and north property boundaries. Thank you very much, councillors, for your time here today. Thank you, Angelina. Uh, are there any questions for Angelina? Councillor Bradford? Uh, thanks for the deputation. Just very quickly, um, did the neighbors applying for the fence height extension, uh, did you have any conversations or discussions about this to try and work it out between the neighbors um, prior to ending up here? So I, I did go out and I did mention to their their work, the person who was building the fence that we um, we did not want it, want it. Um, but I guess he was instructed to continue with the um, with the fence. Now we haven't talked to these neighbors. We're not talking, so that's honestly a part of the uh, the issue we're having here. But we, I did make it very clear as it was going up that it was not something I wanted on our shared fence. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate your deputation. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina. Uh, next, I have listed Jeff Sparks. Jeff. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Jeff. Welcome to Toronto East York Community <laughs> Council. Uh, you have five minutes to address the committee. You can start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. My name is Jeff. I'm Angelina's husband. I live at 81 Boardwalk Drive. I have a few additional points that I would like to add. If you could reference the MLS report provided for the pool enclosure of 79 Boardwalk Drive Appendix 3, 4, and 5. If you look at Appendix 3 and 4, the interior fence height is presently the same on all sides. At no point does this fence height exceed the garage roof line. This can also be seen on Appendix 5. The only interior fence height that they are requesting to increase is on our boundary. This would also be the only area where the proposed fence exemption would be much higher than the garage roof. The shared fence will be significantly higher on our boundary. Therefore, we will incur the worst effect of their rear yard exemption request. I would like to state that our adjacent east and north boundary is our only concern. 
Their other boundaries are not our concern and should have no relevance to our boundary. <clears throat> Two meter fences are the norm for the small backyards throughout the Woodbine Park neighborhood in which we live. For over 20 years, I've lived beside the present owners of 79 Boardwalk Drive and the pool enclosure fence was two meters or much less until it became in violation in 2019. I would like to comment on Ms. Grimma's letter regarding her reasons for fence exemption. It was exhibit seven. The list of occurrences and events bear no relevance to our east boundary fence nor us as individuals. Then they make false claims about us, the neighbors to the east that are unsubstantiated, yet they claim the summation of all these events is the reason for their fence exemption request on the east boundary when there's actually no basis for an exemption request on the east boundary. For example, they make a claim that we have trespassed on their property numerous times to observe work that is not as our concern. We do not Jeff, trespass on their property. Jeff, Jeff. I'm going to I'm going to give you the same thought that I, I gave Angelina. Okay. We are here to deliberate right, okay. on the fence. If you have thoughts about the fence, we're happy to hear them. Thoughts about other okay. relationships you have with your neighbors are not relevant to us. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yep. Okay. When you are neighbors, there will be times when there are areas of mutual concern along your property boundary, such as this fence. Um, Regarding stress, which is mentioned, what about our stress? There's an outright disregard for our well-being and happiness in our yard. Why should we have this unsightly fence and caged and feel forced upon us? We feel that this would simply be unfair. They also state that the uh, fence height to the east would hinder us from looking under their property, thereby stopping eye-to-eye -eye contact. We do not see into the yard with the present two meter fence. Exhibit five and six photos taken from our back step clearly show this, as do the other exhibits. Regarding the statement about our back entrance, we do not stand on our back stairs and overlook their property. In fact, the only time you might momentarily partially see each other would be if both owners simultaneously entered their homes and looked at each other, which is not occurring. Today, they are asking for an exemption to a bylaw on the east boundary at our detriment. They've based the request on misleading and unsubstantiated untrue statements. We are quiet, respectful people with a good rapport in the neighborhood. In conclusion, we feel disliking your neighbor is not a valid basis for requesting a fence exemption. We're requesting that the fence exemption on the east and north boundaries be denied due to its negative effect on our property and enjoyment. Council, thank you for hearing our concerns. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Jeff? I don't see any. Uh, so Jeff, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Next, I have listed Chris Talbot. Chris? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Chris. Can Welcome to Toronto East York Community you. Council. You have five minutes to address the committee. You can start whenever you're ready. Thank you, councillors. My name is Chris Talbot. I live at 77 Boardwalk. We've been here for about a decade. And I, I can't speak to anything happening on the other side of our property, but I know we live in one of the best neighborhoods in the city. Uh, however, during the summer, uh, with all of the beach and fireworks and festivals and everything else going on there, we have had, on occasion, people in our yard. Um, I've had bloody hands on my garage door, which can only be accessed through my backyard. Um, I've seen things thrown into my backyard and my neighbor's backyard at 79 um, from the alleyway. So I would like to... Uh, voice my support in the raised fences uh, in the backyards uh, strictly for security, keeping things and people out of our yards. Um, like I said, 90% of the year it's great. We do run into these festival and firework and summer seasons that uh, causes some issues, break-ins in garages and whatnot. Uh, so again, I, I'm just here to support 
uh, no hesitation for uh, granting their their permit. Is that, that all you want to share with us today, Chris? That's, that's all I have to say. I don't have any problems with the, the raised fences. Um, I applaud it. It creates a more secure backyard for me and my young children. Okay. So I have no problems. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions of Chris? No, Chris, thank you for joining us today. That is the list of people that I have to depute on this item. Uh, are there any questions of staff? No? Councillor Bradford, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, very briefly, I'd like to thank uh, Angelina, Jeff, and Chris for making the time to depute today. Um, Chris, we didn't see you there. I think um, you might have been listed on a different item. So uh, it's nice to hear from you as well on 77. Um, I understand that there's quite a history. I kind of heard a little bit about that uh, on this, this particular fence exemption request. And these conversations at community council are always difficult. Um, you know, if, if it's here, you got one neighbor for it and one neighbor against it. It's a mutual sort of common element there. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the joke is neighbors, uh, fences make great neighbors. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it, it's tough. And those relationships when we live in the city in tight quarters, uh, down there by the racetrack as well. Um, you know, you want to get along with your neighbors and, and that is a much better place to be in. Uh, it sounds like there's some tension here. Uh, I can appreciate the, the nuances and different arguments that come uh, from both sides on these fence applications. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we did not hear from the applicants today as well at 70, 79. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be erring on the side of caution, uh, going with the staff recommendation of number one. Um, to, to stick to the two meter limit here uh, and deny the application for, uh, for the increase. Okay. Are there any questions of the mover? Seeing none, anyone else to speak? I don't see anyone. Well, actually I see about 12 versions of everybody. We have infinite regress of Councillor Matlow's face. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're all we're all back to normal now. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, uh, Councillor Bradford has moved option one, which is to refuse. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay. Uh, where does that take me? To item thirty, I believe. Right? Yeah. I'm all good. Yep. Okay. Uh, Item T 24.30, 190-200 Sudan Avenue and 18 Brown Brownlow Avenue zoning amendment and rental housing demolition application. I have uh, one deputant, Andy Gort. Okay, we're just gonna take a moment. Uh, it's taking a moment to get Andy sorted out technically. Uh, this is the moment where you can answer the urgent email from your executive assistant or get that cup of tea you've been wanting to get for a long time. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, is this Andy? Yeah, it is Andy. Andy, uh, we've had success. Very good. Thank you. Welcome to Toronto East York Community Council. Uh, you have five minutes to address the committee. Start whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, sorry, it's uh, I've been a bit, bit of waiting, so uh, I wasn't quite uh, immediately available. Sorry about that. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair uh, Perks and fellow uh, Toronto East York Councillors. Uh, my name is Andy Gort and I represent the South Eglinton Ratepayers and Residents Association where this uh, application is located. Uh, we recognize that uh, this agenda item is only for the approval of the preliminary report, 
but you can see from the number of residents, I think there are almost 20 people that, that wrote in, how important this application is for the community. And it's the second time this application is in front of you, but we submitted it in a different form. Uh, first, we'd like to thank Alex Teixeira, the senior planner on the file for the report. And we support the comments you raised, and we also appreciate the support we have received from Councillor Matlow. There are some application specific comments you'd like to make, and also a comment related to uh, the cumulative impact on the, on the wider neighborhood. Uh, this application is in the Sudan uh, apartment neighborhood, uh, which is at the Young and Eglinton area. On the site specific points, um, the Sudan apartment neighborhood is, is very deficient in open space and uh, parks. So the community uh, would like to request an on-site parkland dedication uh, at this property at the south side uh, to address the deficiency of, of parkland. Um, the application is an info uh, uh, application and there already exists a tower on the property. And there simply is not enough space uh, on the property to, in, in our opinion, to add a tower uh, and observe the, what's normally uh, the 25 meter tower separation. I think it's less than seven meters. And it also intrudes on a greenway allowance that was adopted as part of uh, the Midtown in Focus or uh, OPA 405. And the tower is, is too tall. Uh, it should be descending in height uh, with distance from the Young of Eglinton. It doesn't transition well to the low-rise neighborhood to the south. And last but important, uh, at, at, uh, there's, uh, there's no opportunity provided for affordable rental units, which is also something that we would like to see. In terms of the, the larger neighborhoods, um, the Sudan neighborhood in, in 2016 was 6,600 people. We've kept track of all the applications and, and when they were completed, there'll be 17,000 residents in this uh, quarter uh, square, square kilometer area. So from 6,600 to 17,000. Uh, and on a cumulative basis, the, the neighborhood lacks community services. Uh, there's no additional school capacity that has been added, uh, affordable daycare, recreational facilities, social services, parks, open space, uh, all of those things um, have, have, not, uh, have not increased or, or uh, have not been added. We're also concerned about the transportation infrastructure in, in the area. Um, all these um, uh, developments uh, end up uh, exiting on Sudan or on Eglinton, so two, two roads only. And we have 1960s uh, infrastructure in terms of public realm. The sidewalks are still from the residential area from the 1960s. And um, uh, during peak hours, uh, we are seeing significant traffic congestions and uh, risk of, of serious risk of pedestrian and, and cycling safety incidents. So we are we are also requesting a comprehensive transportation study for this neighborhood, focusing on both uh, active mobility as well as vehicular traffic, and one that would consider sp specific improvements such as widening of the sidewalks. And this is not a new request. Uh, traffic analysis was part of the Midtown in Focus Plan implementation initiatives in 2018 that you collectively as city councils requested for this area in 2018. That's uh, more or less uh, what I wanted to uh, speak to you about. And uh, we welcome an opportunity together with other stakeholders to work with the developers to create a, a better application. And we thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Andy. Are there any questions? No, nope, seeing none. Andy, uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, members, that's the only deputant I had listed on this item. Are there any questions of staff? I don't see any. Councillor Matlow, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. Uh, the motion is to uh, secure on-site parkland dedication on the property. Um, you know, while we have been um, uh, doing everything within our municipal powers, which are limited uh, shamefully, to address the cumulative impacts of the development pressures in the Young and Eglinton area. Um, we, uh, you know, until we have a better planning regime and a better planning process and a government that will actually respect our Midtown and Focus plan that we worked on as a community together to achieve, um, 
we still need to be creative about how to work within the flawed rules to be able to achieve many of our goals. And one of the things that we've been doing as part of our Midtown of Focus plan is I've been trying to create breathing space on Sudan to allow for transition, but most importantly for both the apartment neighborhood to the north and the single family uh, uh, dwelling neighborhood to the south to have park space, open space for the people who live in the neighborhood. And that's what we've been doing as a green line along uh, Sudan. So what this would do is this would um, uh, work essentially as a contiguous green line uh, with the adjacent parkland and pops that we've already achieved uh, uh, abutting this, this portion of the property. And we would like to see that continue on. So that's what uh, we'd like to do. And uh, moreover, um, there are going to have to be significant changes to this proposal before it could earn our support. And as Andy said, um, you know, this, this development, like every development, needs to contribute to our quality of life rather than exacerbate the current conditions where we have a dearth of social services and infrastructure and park space to support the quality of life of our neighborhood. So um, that's that will be the focus of our conversation with the community as we move forward with the community meeting. Uh, but certainly uh, the parkland dedication is something that uh, wherever this development itself ends up, we want to make sure that we secure that space for the livability of the neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Matlow, I have a, a question of you. Um, so this is a preliminary report, right? We don't have final advice from staff. Councillor Matlow? That, that's, yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. The, and I, I've just been glancing through the preliminary report and, and I realize that there are quite a number of City of Toronto planning frameworks come into play here. I can't see, I mean, I've got the Midtown Zoning Review. I can't see something that says that, that we have ever drawn out that there has to be parkland on this site specifically. I see that there, there's a, an overall public realm plan, but I don't see this site identified as one that has to be green space. Am I missing something? There are two, um, I think, two important points of information that would be helpful to to you. One is, um, actually, it's been some time now since staff actually identified the this specific neighborhood as parkland deficient. So that's why when I was the councillor for uh, you know the other side of Mount Pleasant, uh, we were able to acquire uh, two properties on Manor Road, and staff have always been actively supportive. Uh, about looking for and identifying other sites where we could find uh, more areas for parks. Another part of the general area that we're looking for park space, which is always difficult, is also the northeast quadrant of Young and Eglinton as well, which just doesn't have enough park space to meet the needs of the, the growing neighborhood. Um, so in, in a generality, we're always looking for any opportunity to create more park space because there's a, there's an identified and data-driven deficiency. Um, moreover, as part of the Midtown of Focus Plan Phase One, so you may recall our Midtown of Focus Plan that was you know similar to TO Core about you know, sort of the a secondary plan review. We did a public realm study, and part of that study identified the north side of Sudan as a green line where we'd want to create a setback, a, a sufficient setback. To create that breathing room, and um, so the, the, this the, this entire property between Brownlow and Redpath, the property owner came in with an earlier application where we were able to. Councillor, uh, councillor, uh, councillor, it's four o'clock. Yeah. We have a bunch more deputants. Am I to take your answer I, as a yeah. no? I mean, I've well, represented no, a park deficient no, area before. I, I I still represent a parks deficient area. I understand how all of this works. I asked you a specific question. Is this is site identified in a City of Toronto planning document as an area that should be converted to parkland? 
this, this particular property? Part, part of the site, we already achieved a setback on the site abutting Red Path. So this would simply continue the, the setback towards Brownlow. And that's in the... But that's what we're is that in the is the, that in the Young Eglinton Secondary Plan OPA four hundred five? Where would I find that? The okay, I, I, you know what? I think I've got enough answers for my questions. Are there any other questions of the mover? No. Okay. Um, Anyone else to speak? I, I'll just say a couple of quick words. I, I think Councillor Matlow's intent is great here, and I think it's fantastic that he's fighting to get green space uh, in, in, his, in his ward and in this very, very uh, dense and frankly overbuilt, thanks to the province of Ontario, uh, air, part of the city. But, you know, I, I just can't bring myself for this community council to direct staff what the outcome of an application review will be at the preliminary review, uh, report stage. So I, I, I won't be able to vote for his motion. I wish him luck in achieving it during the um, negotiation with the applicant. I think his, his luck would actually have been better if he hadn't tried to test that question before I had any planning advice in front of me. Anyone else to speak to it? No? Okay. So on Cal Councillor Matlow's amendment, all those in favor? One, two, three, four, five. All those opposed? One, two. Okay, so it passes. On the item as amended, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item TE 24.31, 2180 to 2210 Young Street, 15 Eglinton Avenue West, and 20 and 46 Barrick Avenue, Zoning Amendment Application Preliminary Report. I have one deputant here, uh, Matthew Bagnall. Matthew? Good afternoon. Yes, hello, Matthew. Welcome yeah. to Toronto East York Community Council. You'll have five minutes to address the to address us, uh, begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair, members of Community Council. My name is Matt Bagnell. I'm a planner at the Toronto Lands Corporation. TLC is a subsidiary of the Toronto District School Board, acting on their behalf for all land use planning and real estate matters. Uh, Canada Square, as you know, is located within a community experiencing significant residential intensification and population growth, which is presenting critical accommodation challenges at local elementary schools. Without adequate long-term local school capacity, students generated by new developments will not be accommodated by local schools and will need to be bused often on lengthy commutes to other TDSB schools far outside the local community. Cumulative impact of over 50 developments in the area, with more applications continuing to be submitted will result in unsustainable accommodation pressures that cannot be addressed within existing local TDSB schools. Student accommodation reviews, such as boundary changes and program relocations, have largely been exhausted in the area. The school sites are constrained, preventing the wide use of portables, which may otherwise provide some limited additional capacity. Students emanating from new developments within the catchment of Eglinton Junior School, which is located 600 metres east of Canada Square, are being redirected and bused to schools outside of the community, up to eight kilometres away. Approximately 60 elementary students are currently being bussed out of the area, with over 100 more expected once additional developments under construction are complete. Further 250 students in the uh, Eglinton area could be bussed if applications under review are approved. Canada Square's currently assigned elementary school is Oreo Park Junior, located approximately 1.5 kilometres walk to the west of Canada Square. The 2,700 residential units, the Canada Square development is estimated to generate 54 new elementary students, 
Harrier Park's capacity is 242 students with an, with an attendance in October 2019, pre-COVID, of 293. That's a building utilization of 121%. A study has been scheduled by the TDSB for next school year to determine timing and requirements for busing of students from new developments in the Oreo Park Junior attendance area moving forward. The residential development applications submitted to the city within the Ario Park Junior assigned area of Cylinder Review or LPAT conclude, among others, 50 to 60 Edmondson Avenue West, uh, 34 and 39 storey towers, including 688 residential units, and 36 to 44 Edmondson Avenue West, a 65 storey proposal, including 663 residential units. Outside of the Ario Park Junior catchment, Major development applications in Midtown also include 1913 to 1951 Young Street, currently proposing a 13 and 45 storey towers and 825 residential units, and 55 and 65 Broadway Avenue, two 39 storey towers, including 648 new residential units, as well as several applications, other applications proposing over 400 units. Busing students outside of the local area is not a sustainable solution. At least a fewer opportunities for students to participate in school activities outside of regular school hours and a general detachment for students, parents and guardians between home and school communities. Busing does not therefore support the provision of a complete community. The TDSB and TLC are exploring opportunities to secure space for up to 800 elementary pupil places within the Midtown area, with Canada Square having the potential to make a significant contribution. Securing school space will include the pursuit of partnerships with the city and broader development community and requires the acquisition of site and or strata ownership to ensure the ability to accommodate long-term enrollment is secured for Midtown. Given Canada Square's uh, size and central Midtown location, it offers a unique opportunity for providing a new elementary school or elementary school space for the area. The need for a new school is reflected in the Midtown in Focus Community Services and Facility Strategy and was reaffirmed by City Council in July 2018. TLC acknowledges the recent member motion to Council, the future of Young and Eglinton's Canada Square, supporting Midtown residents' quality of life, and supports the recommendation for evaluating redevelopment of the site, having consideration to schools, among other matters. TLC have begun initial discussions with Oxford Properties, advising them of our interest in securing school space as part of this, as part of this development. Uh, TLC are keen to continue these discussions on behalf of the TDSB to help secure school space and contribute to a complete community for Midtown. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of Matt? Seeing none. Uh, any questions of staff? Seeing none. Councillor Matlow? So I'm, I'm going to be moving this, uh, I'm going to move to defer this indefinitely. The motion there. <laughs> so um, as you all know, at council, um, I, I moved a motion with your support to create a community working group to um, create a, a very clear vision for the Canada Square site to support our quality of life, to ensure that as, as Toronto Lands Corporation on behalf of the Toronto District School Board just spoke about the need for a new public school, which I'm working very closely on with, um, with uh, uh, Trustee Shelley Laskin. And uh, moreover, uh, we're, we're looking at a very clear vision uh, for how this site uh, can uh, can be used uh, creatively in support of the community uh, with the community engaged. Um, what I intend to do is once we finish this working group process, which we are about to undertake, and we have that special study uh, concluded, then I'll be releasing the, pre the preliminary report so that we can have a full and informed conversation with the community where we have the special study in front of the community along with the Oxford uh, proposal, and then we can have uh, that discussion about how we move forward. So all parties are aware of this, all parties are engaged, 
And, um, and as you know, from the motion uh, approved at council, uh, we're going to have to do a lot of hard work over the next uh, uh, several weeks uh, uh, to, to come back to the community with that special study concluded. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Matlow. I'm going to have to ask if the city solicitor or someone from the city solicitor's office is available. Is there anyone available from yeah. Hi. Kelly, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Kelly. I've got a, 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 a Lulu for you. So okay. um, we have an item in front of us, which is a preliminary report. So Canada Lands Corporation is, uh, or an applicant is making an application. The preliminary report, as you know, uh, always contains a recommendation to have a community consultation meeting. Are we yes. allowed to just skip that to just uh, as community council say, no, we're just going to defer considering even having a community meeting. Is that within our rights? Or are um, those meetings required? So under the planning act, it's not required to have a community consultation meeting. So by strict letter of the statute, no, but it is the city's process always to have one. So okay. um, are you breaking law? No. Are you breaking policy? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone have any questions of the counselor or the staff now that they're on the floor? No? Anyone else want to speak to the item? No? By the way, there will be a community meeting. <laughs> it's just about doing it at the same time. It's not a community Councillor, you had your opportunity to speak. If I, had, if I wanted to ask you that question, I would have. I don't think I would have found your answer satisfactory just as I didn't on the last item, but that's life. I, I think it's really bad process to just make up your own idea of what community consultation is, but hey, Members get to decide. So all those in favor of Councillor Matlow's uh, motion to uh, defer indefinitely the consideration of the uh, preliminary report, including the recommendations that we uh, schedule a community meeting and put out notice. All those in favor of Councillor Matlow's motion? One, two, all those opposed? I, I'm sorry, guys. I, I think I saw three hands opposed. I'm going to have to. I'm, I'm going to have to get it recorded because it's just too hard to see who's voting and who's not. Councillor Fletcher, I couldn't tell if you voted there. Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Fletcher. Hang on, everybody. All those in favor of Councillor uh, Councillor Matlow's motion to indefinitely defer consideration of the preliminary report and the recommendations that there be a community consultation meeting. All those in favor. Councillor Matlow, Councillor Bradford, Councillor Layton. All those opposed. Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Wong Tam, Councillor Perks. So that motion loses on a tie. Uh, so we'll take the um, main motion, the staff recommendations then to schedule a community consultation meeting. All may, right. I, may I move another, may I, uh, point of order, may I move another motion then if that is too much for you? Uh, because if this moves forward now, you will see things will go sideways. You are you, like, uh, I, if you have any faith in the work that I'm doing with the community, have some trust that this is critical to finish this working group process, 
to be able to get to the kind of yes that will result in something effective and positive at this corner. So, so counselor. So what I'd like to I, do, I, if obviously, I may, is move it. Can I can I make a suggestion? A can I make a suggestion? State. I'm trying to make a suggestion. Okay. Can I suggest we stand this down for a few minutes, and you think of a way to to manage this, where we're sending out the notifications to people that there's a development application, as is our duty as elected representatives so they know there's an application and that there's some consultation process that's going to happen. You figure out a way to do that. I, I and have a way. If I, I, a I way. could finish. You figure out a way that satisfies the intent of the process that we normally follow so that people get notification and can look at the staff preliminary report and do all of those good things. You send around a note by email or text to us with a suggestion of how you'd like to do it so we have time to digest it instead of having to rethink the planning process on the fly and we'll consider it. Okay? So I'm going to hold this one down while you do that piece of work or I there can is, call the vote only on the item. Way. Uh, Which would you like to do? Would you like to hold the item down and try to find a fix or vote? I need to know that. Mr. Chair, may I suggest an option that you may see as, as reasonable? Okay, so I'm going to take that as holding the item down, uh, right? Okay, I'm not going to, I, we can't negotiate solutions to these problems on the fly while we've got deputants waiting. Put something in writing to us so that we can see it and think about it, send it around and we'll look at it. I'm holding this item down for now. Why, why, why are you doing this this way? It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be this complicated. There okay, will be a you don't have the, you don't have the floor right now. Okay. So the next item that we have in front of us is TE twenty four point four zero safety review Mill Street and Cherry Street. I don't have any deputants listed on this item. Are there any questions of staff? No, Mr. Chair, only a motion and then to speak. Councillor Wong Tam, your, your, your uh, sound is very low. Uh, I'll try to speak up. Is that better? A little better, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, may I proceed, Mr. Chair? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I apologize that, uh, that this matter is still before us. I did, I was working with a, a uh, with transportation staff on a motion. Uh, if I can ask the clerks to please put the motion onto the screen uh, and simply is to uh, to amend the uh, the staff report and to ask for the following, uh, requesting that the, um, the acting director of Trans transportation management uh, come back to us uh, with an overview of how to uh, expand the senior safety zones across uh, multiple uh, conditions in the West Onlands and also to ask uh, staff to uh, prepare a report uh, with respect to the work zone unit transportation services on a safety strategy regarding construction management with, from Parliament Street, Bayview, King to Mill Street. And I want to just um, to thank, uh, you know, transportation staff, thank my own staff on trying to find a resolution to this matter. Uh, we have had a number of near incidents and, of course, we've actually had uh, fatal collisions uh, in the area. Uh, we are doing everything we can to find a way to accommodate, obviously, the growth and the development that's taking place, but also that the vehicles can have safe passage, whether they're service vehicles or private passenger vehicles. Everybody needs to get from A to B in the safest possible manner, and everything we're trying to do is to enhance that. Uh, so we've got some work. Uh, we're, we're not there yet and not by any stretch. Um, and hopefully this work can be uh, forthcoming, uh, but also expedited um, as we continue the review. And thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. So uh, we'll take uh, your amendment and the item together. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. Item TE 24.41. Uh, car share vehicle parking areas, Stadium Road and Duro Street. Uh, I don't have any deputants on this item. Are there any questions of staff? No. Uh, to speak, Councillor Layton. 
I believe we have recommendations in a revised, in, in a supplemental report, not a supplemental report, in a revised report. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, what's yes, that's, what, that's what's before us is the revised report, yeah. Okay, then I'll move those recommendations, please. Okay, uh, on the item, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Okay, TE 24.43, construction staging area time extension 387 to 403 Bloor Street East. I don't have any deputations. Uh, are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, um, Councillor. Yeah, I have a quorum. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, thank you, Chair. And if I can ask the clerk to please put the motion on the screen. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't prepared earlier when we were um, uh, when the item had come up, but oh, uh, no. we're now prepared. Uh, we'd like to uh, amend the, the the staff report by adding the following, uh, just slightly changing the date of the uh, extension, but also adding a new clause to um, direct city staff transportation staff to work with the applicant to do another review of the of the of the of the site conditions uh, especially when it comes to accessibility we've had some complaints um, in the neighborhood that uh, that the roadway occupancy is impeding people's uh, travel um, and uh, and more importantly than anything else it's it's impeding uh, people with mobility challenges and people living with disabilities, uh, they don't have the ability um, to, you know, hop on and off uh, and, and, de and, and jog in and out uh, as those who are able body. And I think that we need to make sure those accommodations are made uh, and to establish a, a construction working group. Um, it has been somewhat informal, the complaint process, uh, but because we have had um, several uh, complaints coming in, uh, I think that we can proactively avert some of those challenges and complaints by having the applicant uh, affected stakeholders as well as the residents meet monthly and they can clear the deck and deal with any issues as they arise as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we'll take all of that together. The um, amendment and the item, all those in favor, opposed, carried. I believe that takes us to 2447, construction staging area 59 through 71 Mutual Street. Uh, I have no deputants. Are there questions of staff? I don't see any. Councillor uh, Wong-Tam. Yeah, just a, a couple of questions uh, and for you to staff. Uh, with respect to the uh, this particular um, request, to occupy, uh, again, more of the city's public right-of-way. Um, with respect to the developers making that request, I mean, our options of restricting it seem to be relatively minimal, but have you done everything possible to reduce the impact to the neighborhood and the pedestrians by way of this construction um, uh, road occupancy review? Is this the very best that we can do? Or, or, or can you push it, push the site further back? Is there a transportation staff here to, to answer the question? Hello? Is Vince there? Sorry, we, we do have, it's Vince speaking. Hi Vince. We do have construction. Uh, we've got construction, uh, our works on staff here, Craig Cripps, but I don't think he seems to be answering. He may have stepped away. Um, can um, we I've, wait to see if he if he um, comes back? I can try and search for him. I think he just yeah, came on. Good. There he is. Good afternoon. Uh, Hi, good Craig. afternoon, councillors. Yeah, sorry about that. I was having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, yeah, if I heard the question correctly from uh, Councillor Wong Tam, it's regarding the actual staging area on Mutual. And uh, yes, we have explored all of the options as we do with almost all de all development sites within the City of Toronto. Um, we certainly do encourage use of the private property for any construction staging. Unfortunately, 
with the conditions that we have in that area and constructability lot line to lot line, there is no opportunity to stage construction from the private side of property. So unfortunately we are, we are, you know, for lack of a better term, stuck with the staging area for this location to facilitate construction. And I think we have looked at all issues as far as maintaining pedestrian accesses and maintaining lanes in, in as many directions as possible to uh, to keep mobility in the area. So uh, unfortunately, this is the best scenario that we've been able to uh, to advance to this point to get to report to you, Count Council. Uh, thank you, uh, Craig. And I guess uh, it doesn't matter whether or not the development was approved by City Council or if it was approved by the OMB or LPAT. Once the once the applicant slash developer has their approvals, uh, there's very little we can do to restrict their road access. Is that not correct? Yes, in my opinion, uh, Councillor, that is correct. Um, I, I would uh, have legal make an official comment on the position of, of Council to deny these staging areas. Um, but in, in, uh, in my opinion, yes, we have done what we've been able to do to try to restrict the amount of occupation of the public right of way, maintain all accessibility requirements under the situation that we've been given um, the legal position of Council um, that really has to be commented on by City legal. Uh, th thank you. I guess, um, I, you know, in the interest of time, I, I, I don't want to um, expend any more than I need to, but uh, Craig, your answer was already very helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and we and we will continue ongoing consultation with your office as this project proceeds. And if there are any issues or concerns that need to be highlighted to my unit, we will address it with the developer immediately. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Wong Tan? Uh, no, Chair. No? Thank I'll, you. I'll give you the floor then to speak to the item. Uh, yes, thank you. And I will ask the city clerk to place my motion onto the screen uh, by uh, by way of, uh, there it is, thank you. So we're going to amend the, the dates. Uh, so we're shortening the, the length of time for the road occupancy. I want an opportunity uh, to, to reassess uh, the construction impacts uh, when it's time. Uh, and essentially we're just going to restrict it to September 30th, 2022. And also to direct to have this community council direct the applicant to formally establish a construction management uh, working group. They must meet monthly. They must invite the local stakeholders, which includes uh, obviously affected cities' visions. I want them to speak to their neighbors, and I want them to work with the local residents uh, as well as the residents association. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I, you know, I think many, buddy, and everybody has recognized that construction impacts across the city are difficult, um, and there is especially difficult when city council did not approve the application. Um, and uh, when an application is approved elsewhere through another pro provincial quasi judicial body, uh, when these road occupancies come back, they they actually hurt that much more. So not only did we not like the application because it was just not a great development. Uh, we now have to hand over a part of the sidewalk and the roadway. Um, so, you know, everything I would like to do uh, with respect to sending this away and making it uh, just sort of evaporate, I just don't have those those legal and legislative tools. So we have to, we're dealt with the hand that we're dealt with and, uh, and we're trying to make do of a situation that hasn't been great for the neighborhood. And I just want to recognize that in this little patch of downtown Toronto, we've got development happening on almost every side of the street. Um, so now we're about to close in the final side of the street for, for the area. And, uh, and it just feels incredibly harsh, especially as people are forced to stay home, uh, especially as we're asking them to, to stay in place and to, to, to remain um, uh, you know, indoors uh, with all the construction impact. It is just incredibly challenging. Uh, challenging on mental health, challenging on health and well-being, uh, challenging overall. Um, if the developer is paying attention and listening to, to these remarks, um, I think, you know, the message for you as a takeaway here is that you've got to engage with the local community. You have to set up this proper 
construction management working group. You have to find the neighbors and you have to talk to them about when your deliveries are coming in, when the cranes are being lifted and hoisted. You have to be able to communicate clearly with timely information and you have to respect them. And, uh, and I don't think I'm asking for a heck of a lot. Uh, and, uh, and if it, that doesn't happen, then you're gonna have to deal with Craig and myself all over again. And I would much rather have you be proactive and constructive in building positive relationships moving forward. Um, and, uh, and that concludes my remarks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions of the mover? No. Anyone else to speak? No. Uh, we'll take the amendment and the item together. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Uh, before we go to the next item, Councillor Bradford, um, I've been meaning to get back to this for some time. You had an item, I think it's 23. Do you want Yes. To? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If we could reopen item 24.23, uh, I'm just scrolling. Going through my notes about board management. Uh, colleagues, we approved this early. I have to reopen it because I have been made aware that one of the appointees in the Beach Village BIA has moved out of the country. So we need to remove him from the list of appointees, leave that vacant uh, for the time being so that uh, they can still hit quorum at their meetings. Okay. So first on the uh, motion to reopen, all those in favor, can I see the screen? All those in favor, Oppose. carried. Uh, and then to remove the one name, all those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay, now we can go back to thank our- Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you. Good catch. Um, did we just finish 43? 47. We finished 47. So that takes us to 54, which is uh, road alteration Woodbine Avenue. And we do have three deputants listed on this item. Uh, first, uh, deputy Michael Polanyi. Michael, are you there? Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Michael. Welcome. So you know the gig. You get five minutes and you can start whenever you want. Super. Great. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak uh, to you this morning. And um, yeah, I'm a resident, speaking as a resident of Woodbine and Danforth. Uh, area. I've lived here over 20 years, raised uh, two boys here with my partner. And, um, uh, you know, I always urge them not to ride their bicycles on the Danforth and Woodbine Avenue because I was extremely afraid that uh, uh, harm would happen to them. And uh, so now when I look around and I see families uh, and small children riding along the Danforth and on Woodbine Avenue. I'm extremely grateful for all the work that uh, you people, you councillors, ha have done in recent years to make our city, our streets um, healthy, safe, uh, and uh, welcoming to people of all ages. Um, I am concerned about the proposal to uh, squeeze uh, another vehicle lane onto a section of Woodbine Avenue. I, I am concerned that it might uh, constitute a step backwards in terms of um, the safety for cyclists and other road users uh, on Woodbine Avenue. And I want to briefly share um, three concerns. And the first concern really is about safety. And um, I know that uh, Councillor Bradford has indicated that the key goals for this modification are to protect safety, reduce congestion, and reduce the neighborhood cut through, so cars cutting through uh, neighborhood streets. Um, and I, I think my concern is just reading the staff report. I don't see any evidence in the staff report that um, the addition of a lane will accomplish uh, any of these things. In fact, it's pretty clear if you read the staff report that staff raise, uh, identify at least six ways in which adding a lane would compromise safety. And I don't have time to go into them all, but it has to do with narrowing vehicle lanes, narrowing bike lanes, reducing separation between bikes and vehicles, 
uh, an unsafe merging of lanes north of Girard, poor lane alignment at Woodbine and Girard, and an untested design uh, in terms of putting uh, bike lanes, uh, having bike lanes next to timed parked vehicles. Um, all of these uh, design aspects are substandard and put vulnerable road users, uh, especially cyclists and pedestrians, at risk. And staff have indicated that these safety concerns cannot be mitigated and recommend against adopting uh, the proposal. So if safety is indeed a top priority, I, I don't think this proposal should be accepted. I think it should be rejected. The second point I want to make is that um, the plan, uh, the proposal is aimed at reducing congestion and reducing residential cut throughs. And again, there's no evidence in the staff report that adding another lane uh, on the section of Woodbine, which is the design approach that's been dictated to staff, will do either of these things. In fact, staff cautioned that removing the left turn lane at Gerard and Woodbine is going to limit traffic flow, flow through that, that intersection. Um, and um, that I think the other point is that the report, there are things that are missing from the report, like a recognition that vehicle um, traffic has dropped dramatically um, over the past year and the demand for cycling space has increased. And I'm also concerned that there's no, no discussion of climate change, um, the climate impacts of this proposal. So I know my time is short. So the final point I want to make is just the concern that um, there's, I believe, a lack of awareness about that a decision is making taking place on this proposal today. Uh, I know that Councillor Bradford has held consultation meetings, but the staff report only came out uh, or was only circulated by the councillor late last week. Um, and the email from the councillor didn't indicate the safety concerns that staff raised or the opposition to the proposal uh, by staff. So I, I, I'm just concerned that the people I'm talking to in the neighborhood who are very active are not uh, aware of this proposal. So I'm, I'm really encouraging you not to move ahead with this, uh, abide by staff's recommendation to reject this proposal because it's, uh, it's unsafe and it's not going to achieve the goals I think that uh, we're hoping for in terms of um, Re, uh, uh, Woodbine Avenue. So I think I'm done. Thank you for your time. Happy to answer questions. Sorry, Michael. I, I, I just had a bit of administrative work I had to do there. Are there any questions for Michael? Brad? Or sorry, Councillor, Councillor Bradford. Sorry, it's been a long day, guys. Not a problem. I'll I'll keep it brief and and thanks, Michael, for the deputation. Uh, did you have an opportunity to attend the community meeting that we had uh, a few months back about this proposed design, where where these things were discussed? Uh, I I did not attend. Uh, but I think you're referring to the one in January. I did read the uh, the meeting materials that uh, were sent around after that. And I understand that my my office sent you over the the video of the. You know, one of the benefits, of course, being on Zoom, we can record it. We sent that over to you. Did you get a chance to to watch the tape and the discussion that took place there? I did not have a chance to watch the full discussion. Oh. You no, know, I got that yesterday. Okay. So yeah. Okay, so um, with respect to some of the safety concerns, you know, I, I live uh, Danforth Woodbine as well. I ride that bike lane uh, all the time. Um, do you uh, do you ride the Woodbine bike lanes? I'm assuming yes, you do. You're I do just, definitely yeah. regularly. So, with respect to one of the concerns, a lot of folks had identified was visibility of sight lines. Um, particularly vehicles as they duck in and cut through into the neighborhoods, hooking right across the um, the bike lane and the limited visibility. Um, do you agree that that's a concern? Is that a concern for you? Um, it, in terms of cars pulling off out from the uh, side streets, is that what you're referring to? No, no, northbound traffic. You're going northbound in the bike lane and a car hooks right because they're trying to get out of the congestion on Woodbine, they cut through the neighborhood. They hook right, and visibility is limited for for both the drivers and the cyclists as they're moving between the parked vehicle 
and going uphill slowly and the traffic that's cutting through the neighborhood. Yeah, it, I can it, say it, I, it's been a major issue for me, but it, I could But it has been documented be by staff. Okay. Um, and they have noted that, and there's been several attempts to try and address that with revisions to Woodbine over the years. So my, my point being, um, would you would you agree that if there is not a vehicle parked there in the parking lane during rush hour that visibility would in fact be be improved for drivers having visibility on the cyclists i think as a cyclist um having rode on that street before um there was a bike lane i think i would prefer to have uh parked vehicles um next to the lane rather than two okay. narrow lanes right next to me. Um, but you would agree that cyclist. there would be visibility improved for everyone in that scenario? It's it's possible. I don't okay. know if there would be a safety and, improvement, but and yes. you understand And you understand that there's still a bike lane here, both north and south in this proposal? Yes, I am concerned and you that the bike lane is, the will be narrowed, okay. um, and I'm concerned that the, the, the buffer okay. distance will be narrowed. And you understand that there's a proposal to put in separated concrete barrier here as well with the plexi post that doesn't currently exist there. I think that would be great. I do understand that that's part okay. of this. And I, you I, understand. I don't see that in the staff report. No. Though. And, and you understand that the speed limit will be lowered to 40 kilometers an hour. I see the staff recommend that. I don't see that as part of the recommendation in the report. I would, I would support that. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for your deputation today. Okay. Any other questions for Michael? Michael, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Next, I have listed Gideon Foreman. Hey, Gideon. Great. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? I certainly can. You got your five minutes. Get going when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, my name is Gideon Foreman. I'm with the David Suzuki Foundation. I do policy work at the foundation. Um, we're here today to also oppose the addition of a car lane on Woodbine Avenue. I, I do want to say that we understand everyone around the table are people of goodwill and good faith, and we understand we're, that this is a complicated situation, but we do feel that it's important for us to raise some concerns. And Mr. Chair, we're, we're baffled that this proposal is coming forward. Uh, it, it does seem detrimental, as the former speaker said, to, to public safety, and in our view, it certainly does nothing to help the city meet its greenhouse gas reduction targets. I, I was frankly surprised, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, when I read the staff report outlining some of the safety hazards, uh, uh, this discussion of rear end collisions, uh, the claim that four lane alignment, lateral shift, and the poor visibility um, of the far side of the intersection could result in head on collisions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just baffled. Uh, we're going to risk head on collisions so that we might save a few minutes during the afternoon commute. It, it just doesn't make sense to us. I'm also concerned, uh, Mr. Chair, the project's at odds with Toronto's policy statements on transportation and the climate crisis. Uh, as you know, our downtown plan makes clear that facilitation of car movement is not the city's priority. The plan states, and I quote, pedestrians, cyclists, and public transit will be prioritized relative to, par to private automobiles, unquote. And Transform TO, our climate strategy, clearly prioritizes active transportation, not car use, with its goal of 75% of trips under five kilometers uh, being walked or cycled. So I, I just don't understand how this, uh, this uh, community council can justify additional space for cars. It, in our view, during a climate crisis, it simply makes no sense. So I would urge you to listen to your own staff I urge you to listen to the city's own policy statements and, and, to, and to shelve this, uh, this proposal for an additional car lane on Woodbine. Let's have more discussion with the community. Let's put our heads together and see if we can come up with some better solutions. I can't think of a constituency on earth, Mr. Chair, that, is, that has busted congestion by, by adding additional space for, for cars. Thanks very much. Okay, are there any further questions? Are there any questions for Gideon? No, seeing none. 
Gideon, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, next, I'm going to move to Adam Smith. Adam, can you make sure that your microphone is connected at your end? Go here. Hello, Adam. Can you guys hear me? I can. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so, right, Adam, you've got you. five minutes to address the committee. You can start whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, my name is Adam Smith. Thank you guys for, uh, for hearing uh, us residents today on this important issue. Um, I've lived right on Woodbine Avenue at Norway for nine years now. I watched the Woodbine bike lanes go in, a very welcome addition, and I used them almost daily pre-COVID. Until the Woodbine lanes went in, I never saw families riding together on Woodbine, but now it's a regular sight. However, there were flaws from the get-go, and they plague us still today. In coordination with our local cycling advocacy group, 32 Spokes, I have written a few different reports to the past and present councillor and city staff with my concerns and ideas for a better way. My latest recommendations, a vision for a Ward, Ward 19 transportation network, uh, were inspired by this current changes to Woodbine. And uh, in my submission to the city, there's a link to that report if anyone cares to look at it. Um, I, I won't spend much time on this other than to say that um, what I feel to be the best solution to Woodbine to replace the lost volume there is to unify rush hour parking restrictions on Coxwell to handle more volume. But four years of proposing that idea and city staff will not comment on it. Uh, the biggest problem with Woodbine is the city still wants it to do double duty as both a crucial piece of cycling infrastructure and an arterial road. There isn't enough width to do both. The city needs to choose one purpose and suit that, not try to satisfy contradictory purposes. The recommendations in item TE 24.54 are not supported by city staff, as they are not supported by a single resident I know, including myself. It will make Woodbine busier and more unsafe with narrower lanes and lanes that don't align well to the intersection of Woodbine Girard. It will force more parked cars to squeeze onto already packed side streets and it will not solve the issue of side street cut through traffic as that issue clearly has a long-standing history that predates the Woodbine bike lane going in by a decade or more. However, if one change can be teased out from the rest, Woodbine should be reduced to 40 kilometers per hour. And in my opinion, not just between Gerard and Corley, but its entire length from O'Connor to Lakeshore. I've been recommending this since 2016 when the lanes first went in will make Woodbine safer in general and make it a little easier to exit onto Woodbine from side streets when traffic is moving 20% slower. Staff seem reluctant to change this because of the arterial legacy of Woodbine and the arbitrary hurdles of the warrant system created to prevent downgrading of arterial roads. I hope uh, Toronto East York Community Council does not pass this recommendation as is, but consider separating reducing Woodbine to 40 kilometers per hour and moving that forward. The Woodbine bike lanes are a crucial piece of cycling infrastructure, which means Woodbine is no longer a crucial piece of car infrastructure, and we need to start treating it as such. Um, just in my last couple minutes here to, to address some of um, Brad's comments to, to Michael, um, I do agree visibility would be increased, but uh, you know, eliminating some of the parked cars northbound. Uh, however, I would think removing you know, the first one at most two spots would solve that problem, not, you know, taking away the entire lane of parking for that entire stretch. You know, uh, drivers don't need that much notice to see a cyclist coming as they come up to turn. So again, if, if this means removing the first spot or two, um, you know, that could be an improvement. But I, I, I don't see, especially with all the other changes proposed, how uh, removing the entire lane of parking for the entire length really does anything other than, again, cater to car congestion and, and car movement. Um, and that more or less, uh, you know, that's, that's my comments. So thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Adam? Seeing none, that's all the deputants I have listed on the item. Uh, are there any questions of staff? I don't see any. Councillor Bradford, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll try and be brief. Uh, lots to discuss here, but I do have a motion to, to bring forward some small but uh, meaningful changes on Woodbine that the local community and I have been working on since I took office uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, the motion basically asks to implement the design changes in the staff report, as well as lowering the speed limit on the entirety of Woodbine, as we just heard from the previous deputy there, uh, and introducing new physical separation for the bike lane south of Danforth, uh, as this doesn't currently exist there. Uh, I'd also like to just clarify for my colleagues, um, despite uh, what we heard, um, this is not, I guess it depends on how you view it, adding a new car lane. This is permitting vehicles to travel northbound in a lane that is already on the road. Uh, what is currently dedicated to parking on it. Um, and it's just for three hours a day, Monday to Friday. Um, this has been a long journey to get here, a very long journey, more than two years of work. And uh, of course, I'd like to start by thanking the community uh, for their countless hours of involvement and uh, correspondence and emails and participations and meetings uh, and feedback on Woodbine Avenue. You know, when I when I first took office, this was one of the the meetings that uh, that I had first. It was back when we still gathered together. Um, it was at um, it was at the Stan Wablo Clubhouse and. This was an election issue. This was actually a wedge issue. You had a campaign run on ripping out Woodbine bike lanes. And it's a lesson for all of us, I think, when, when bike lanes don't go well, uh, it can actually really set, uh, set us back in terms of expanding the cycling network across the city of Toronto. So, so we had that meeting. It was, it was packed. There was like three different news crews that were covering it at the time because I was going to be, you know, standing in front of the crowd getting lit up. Um, but I've been very clear. I, I, you know, I'm not a guy who rips out bike lanes, not about that. Um, but I would work with the community to listen to concerns and see if we could come up with something that addressed, you know, a variety of concerns that people had primarily about cut through traffic and safety uh, on the side streets adjacent to Woodbine. Um, these meetings that we've had, and we've had many, uh, both working groups and public meetings most recently in January, we had like 300 folks on a Zoom call, um, you know, they, they were always very well attended. There's a lot of community engagement. Uh, I think the fact that we had three deputants today um, speaks to the fact that folk, folks have heard about this. Um, you know, they recognize that what, what we're landing on is certainly a compromise. Um, and it's a compromise that really focuses on the, the piece of the Woodbine bike lanes that has been the most challenging, which is Kingston to Girard. And for those of you who are familiar with the East End, uh, you, you may remember this particular little stretch here. Um, that's where we focus our efforts. And, um, you know, the, the issue that we're trying to solve here, of course, is, is that cut through traffic, Gulfview, uh, Duvernay, Castle, streets where people cut through and, uh, and jam it during that sort of peak period. Folks freak out about the Woodbine bike lanes and, you know, say it's all bad. It's, it's not all bad. It's actually a really welcomed uh, connection piece super important north-south connection, Martin Goodman Trail up to our new Danforth bike lanes. But, um, you know, I think that the process at the time, it was maybe a bike lane that came first and generated a lot of controversy. You get the typical hyperbole uh, about, uh, about the volume, the delays, the safety concerns. And uh, I think when we rolled up our sleeves and got down into it, we really identified this piece from Kingston to Girard as the more problematic area where we have more cut through traffic. Um, and, and the bike lanes going northbound, it's a lot different than the bike lanes going southbound. So we generally, as you know, as a city, we of course have guidelines where we look at all our streets and you know, what are our sort of standard parameters that we would use in most situations. And that's how we deal with building out active transportation across 640 square kilometers. But at Woodbine, you're dealing with an 8%, 10% grade when you're going northbound. So what does that mean for a cyclist? It means like you might want an e-bike, something with a little bit of an electric assist to get up there, or you're like a pretty strong cyclist and you're out of the saddle jamming on the pedals, or for a lot of folks, they're walking. And the reason I, I make that point is the speeds in which you are traveling northbound on Woodbine as a cyclist are a lot slower than when you're going down that 8%, 10% grade um, going southbound. So, when we're looking at adding separation, uh, concrete posts with the flexi posts, uh, when we're looking at what will be a little bit tighter of a buffer zone, you have to consider the context. Um, you have to consider the risk of, of 
during, so to speak, which which is what we use in all our guidelines um, in a situation where you're going probably five kilometers an hour on a bicycle or you might be walking it. I think what we're doing here is bringing forward a solution. And again, it's just that PM peak period where we have the cut through coming through the neighborhood. We're using the parking bay that was granted 24 seven parking that never existed before on this arterial road. We're pulling that back for three hours a day and opening that up to, to vehicle traffic. It will improve the sight lines. We will lower the speed limit. We will improve separation by, by putting in those concrete barriers and flexi posts. And uh, you know, this is, this is the compromise solution that we have worked together with staff who I know are not supportive, but obviously worked with us on the design. And again, it's outside of their typical guidelines. This is a made for Woodbine solution, which is frankly, probably what we should have come up with in the first place. But I understand was, uh, you know, was not an option uh, available at the time. So, you know, I think after years of uh, discussion, uh, we have an imperfect but better solution here for this particular piece of Woodbine. Um, my hope is that we can see this as a moment here for the city um, to really show that we can respond to feedback, that we can listen. Uh, and, you know, listen to folks on the ground who are really the experts in the community. It's easy to draw these things up in CAD, um, you know, on a computer. But when you see how it works in the neighborhood, and I know you as my colleagues understand that, um, there are different considerations when you're in the neighborhood. And, and this design aims to reflect, reflect that. So I do want to conclude with my thanks to staff for their work on this. Um, when I first got my hands on the drawings, I looked at some of the numbers there in the survey and I said, like, th these numbers are not right. Like, this doesn't exist there. I ride Woodbine bike lanes all the time. And Roger Brown, to his credit, came and met me on Woodbine. I pulled out a tape measure. We put it on the ground and found that the numbers on the drawing were actually not what existed and painted on the ground. It was a pretty remarkable moment. So, uh, you know, I want to thank Sean Dillon for holding the pen on this report. Uh, I know that we've had a lot of conversations to get here. And uh, and again, of course, the community for their feedback, not the trolling and the pile on and Facebook, not that, I'm not thanking for that. But uh, for all the people who did roll up their sleeves and email me and call me and have discussions about this, you know, Adam Smith there who's written report after report on transportation mobility in the East End, all of those folks, uh, I really do appreciate it and um, would appreciate your your support in moving this forward. Thank you. Any questions of the mover? I don't see any. Anyone else to speak? No? On Councillor Bradford's motion, all those in favour? Opposed, if any? That carries. Okay. Now, we come to uh, 63 and 64. Uh, Councillor Wong Tam, I just, I've, I've conferred with clerks, and just to make it, this is their understanding. Inadvertently, both items uh, were submitted, even though they're on similar matter. Uh, city staff would prefer that Toronto East York Community Council uh, consider debate and hopefully approve item 64 and that we simply uh, withdraw item 63. Is that your understanding? Uh Yes, it is. Uh, okay, Mr. Chair, that is so, now my understanding. So, all right. So let's let's do this in a way that my little brain can follow. So can I have a motion to withdraw sixty three? Councillor so one Tam, are you moving that? All right. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Okay. So on item sixty four, are there any questions of staff? No. Councillor Wong Tam, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I'd like to just move the recommendations in the staff report and to apologize to everyone for my for the earlier confusion and thank you to staff for your patience and, and helping us sort this out. Okay. Any questions of the mover? Don't see any. Anyone else to speak? No. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item 81, uh, residential demolition application 292 Dundas Street West. Uh, I don't have any deputations. Are there any questions of staff? Don't see any. Councillor Layton. I'll move the conditional approval. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, item TE2496, Councillor Matlow, this is your letter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, would the clerk put the motion on the screen? 
Do you mean the item, the new business item? Yeah, that's it. right, the letter. Okay, we can do that. So just, I mean, so everybody, uh, everyone's just, just got to, it in their just agenda. Just to explain well. it to everybody. And by the way, um, you know, to both the, uh, the last item, which I have um, submitted a new motion to defer the other item with, re with, with regard to the preliminary, preliminary report, rather, to June, which you'll see in a moment. Um, and on this item, I, I, I was under the impression that we've had a custom of, of deferring to the local councillor at this community council, uh, typically when it comes to these sort of local planning um, uh, processes, given that we just have more knowledge and a depth of understanding. Councillor, are you speaking to this item the or the next one? I am, I am. So this is the working group process? That, that's correct. Okay. Uh, to the depth of understanding of the of the needs of the community and the process that we're going through. And so on the last item, I didn't speak much, uh, so I'll speak a little bit more to this, but it will it will pertain to the other item. Um, when um, when Oxford submitted their application uh, late last year, just before Christmas, it angered and upset the community. Um, there has been a long standing lease on the Canada Square lands, which the public owns, the City of Toronto through the TTC owns, but there has been a long-standing lease that another uh, group uh, 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 had rights to, and then they sold it to Oxford, and they have another 70 or, or, or plus years existing on that agreement. So they brought forward their application, and there were a lot of buildings there, and yes, some open space, but there was really like a token gesture of any real community benefits. And the whole discussion with Oxford before was about things like farmers markets and schools and community, uh, you know, community assets that would, that, would, that would address the dearth of um, both services and infrastructure along with park space that this growing area needs. So um, that's why um, uh, I brought forward the motion uh, at the last council meeting to introduce the working group to engage the community in a special study on the site to determine what what really our goals are, um, referring to, for example, the Midtown and Focus plan that we created together along with other works uh, that we've done, and then to ensure that the goals of the community are genuinely reflected in whatever we end up approving on public land. Another thing uh, that, I, that I want you all to know for context, I was able to achieve in 2018 when CREATO was leading a discussion about the, 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 the new lease agreement that council approved. I was able to achieve an agreement, uh, a condition, that along with the fact that there would be a local development process, a community process where there'd be consultation with our neighborhood, this would not be appealable to the OMB, now called the LPAT. So in other words, we don't have the same pressure as a typical development application always has with thinking that if we don't, for example, do things this second, that they will run to the LPAT. That's not gonna happen here because we have the condition, given that it's public land, the very unique context, that we have, we have that condition in there that they're not going to be able to do that. So what this motion is about is ensuring that the request of the community to help inform the work of the working group is responded to. I can I can tell you that I had a meeting recently with the uh, many of the leaders of the residents associations, along with CREATO and planning staff, and everyone is comfortable with what is in here. Okay, CREATO and planning also were fine with this, so I'm not asking them to do anything that they would object to. Uh, this will also provide transparency and trust as a basis for the discussion moving forward, because as you know, there are others who are making making uh, uh, the lease agreement that CREATO uh, did into something that it is not and was not. So it is important that all the, the information just be on the table, people see it with their own eyes, and also recognize that the lease agreement is only as good as what we end up uh, uh, supporting on the site to the development process. In other words, the lease agreement is entirely conditional 
and it will only move forward if we decide it will move forward. The last thing I'll mention, and I'll just uh, and I'll speak to it now, so I'll save you some time on the other item. The the only reason that I move the other item uh, as as uh, a sunny die rather than month by month is because we always get scolded every time we keep deferring things month to month. And I was trying to save us from that. What, what we what because we don't have the pressure of the OMB now. It is it is absolutely important planning staffs on board the communities on board to finish this special study process. So when we do hold the public meeting, we have all the information in front of everyone. Of course, we're going to consult with the wider community. It, it's going to be done by, you know, but before the summer, but we've got to do it in a way that has the trust and the confidence of the community. And that's what I'm leading. So I ask you for some faith in this process. If we don't do it this way, what will happen is that the leaders of the residents associations and many, many thousands of residents who are following the work we're doing and are already deeply engaged in consultation from me and them is that they will not trust the city. They will not trust this process. They will see that there's a fix in. They will not see any real effort to address the real priorities of a neighborhood that was set as a urban growth center by the province years ago without any assurity that the quality of life would keep pace with the growth that we're experiencing. And this will end up just being a long running, awful, messy controversy without any productive effort at a table where people can actually get some work done and achieve a plan that really works for people rather than just a developer. People need to have confidence in that in that goal. So I ask you to support this. I ask you to support the deferral to June motion that will be presented after this. And I ask you for your confidence in achieving a process supported by an interdivisional team of staff to get us to a place where the community actually is happy with the result. And I hope that you would expect the same from all of your colleagues in the work that you're doing, such as Councillor Bradford just did his good work on Woodbine and Councillor Layden just did in his good work for Chinatown. This is what we're here for. You know, things are not always linear. Processes don't always work with every single context. Sometimes you need to consider the reality on the ground and the people that you're working with, and then make sure that the process adapts and is agile enough to actually achieve something good. And that's what we're doing. So I would appreciate your support. And so would my community. Thank you. Are there any questions of the mover? Councillor Bailau. Just a quick question, Councillor. Um, yeah. I, I know that at, when we had this discussion at council or other councillors have shown and expressed interest in this item because it is pretty close to their communities. Did you have a chance to uh, um, talk to them about some some of your strategy here? Are they involved in this strategy? Is everybody playing nice in the sandbox? <laughs> well, I, I think it would be dishonest to say that everybody has been playing nice in the sandbox, but are we all on the same page? Yes, I believe that uh, Councillor Cole and Councillor Robinson uh, are just as committed as I am to ensuring that, the, uh, that all relevant information, including the lease agreement, be shared with the community. And I don't think there'd be any division in, in, in opinion on that. Any other questions? Question of the planning staff, please, just to sort something out. Thank you, okay. Ms. McDonald, actually. Um, or maybe you can answer this, Councillor Matlow. Um, there was always this, I, I don't know where it was written down or anything, but when there is a planning application so, that's right on a border and there's it's on the border of another community council there was always a special process for that it, that's my recollection I, and i don't know what's happened there i'll ask you i'll ask planning staff um, if that's okay actually i'm Councilor pretty fletcher, clear between before 2010 you, that's how it worked yeah. councillor councillor fletcher um i'm just hang on hang on i am going to get yeah. an answer from staff my, okay. uh, so there is, I, I can tell you, and I'm just trying to find, is there someone from clerks 
who can explain oh, what goes to Toronto East York, what goes to North York, and what goes to planning when there's a when when something is across a boundary. Do we have someone from clerks who can answer that? Well, I mean, if there's a boundary issue, there's no such thing as a boundary issue. Can you answer? Um, Councillor Fletcher has just asked, what, when does stuff go to planning? When does it go to one of the, the local? Could, you, no, maybe I could ask it. Because that's I, I, can, I can answer that for you if you uh, like. Councillor Matlow, <laughs> well, Councillor Matlow, I'm chairing the meeting. I've asked the clerk's department who manage what items go to what committee and who oversee the implementation of that portion of the procedures bylaw that determines which committees manage which files. Councillor Fletcher has asked for a technical question on that, so I'm going to have clerks answer it. Okay? Good. Uh, Councillor Fletcher, your question was about when um, an item, for example, would be on the border between or straddle two community councils. If that were the case, yes. then the item would have to go to standing committee. To be clear, by standing committee, you mean planning and growth? Uh, yes, yes, I do. So I'm not clear when that gets done and who... No, I'm not trying to disturb anything for you, Councillor Matlow. I just, I'm so interested because before you got in that seat and others were north of you, that was again a common discussion as to how to have the Young and Eglinton conversation straddling very, very intense growth area, straddling two community mm -hmm. councils. So I'm really unclear how that works. And Councillor Perks is attempting to have so, clerks explain so, that. So, Councillor Fletcher? Councillor Fletcher. Yeah. Planning can answer that. Um, planning staff or, or the clerks can answer, uh, but the short answer I've got is that the specific site does not actually touch the border of North York and doesn't go into North York. Okay. okay. So that's okay. Thank okay. you. Just clarifying. All right. Yeah. Good. So it's still the uh, it, it's still the practice. This just doesn't meet the border test. That's right. Is that it? Doesn't fit the rules that, that lay out the... when things go to planning and growth. It has to actually straddle a border. And I'm this saying site does on not. That, that that still is there. This doesn't meet that test. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate that. Thanks, Councillor Matlow. Let me do that. Okay. Are there any qu other questions, either for staff or Councillor Matlow, on this? No. Uh, on this item, on on his letter. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay. So that leaves us only with the one item. Oh, 97. Sorry, Councillor Fletcher, you have item 97, which was a letter you this submitted. This here. Hmm? Yep. I thought I'm you just... might have to do it, but I'm doing it. Could you just read the title for me? I don't have it handy. Oh, it's got to do with the uh, excluding permit parking for an application at 17 Boothroyd in my ward. Yes. Okay, good. So the floor is yours. Oh, I'll just move the recommendations uh, in the report, in the letter, and thank staff very much. Thank Mr. Lafredi for clarifying it very well for me, why we're going this route. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. All those in favor, opposed, carried. So that just leaves the... So uh, just for you, just so we're clear that there is a motion there that I have to withdraw that clerk because I can't do it. I have to send it for a report. I got it. No, no. Uh, it shows Ellen, there's a motion Ellen, here. Ellen says uh, she's done her magic and it's all fixed and all good. Okay, all fixed, all good. Thank you. You don't need to do anything else. I can just sit back and relax. Thank you. Okay, so that takes us back to item 31. Councillor Matlow, uh, you said you had a proposal that you thought would sort out yes. the dilemma we yes. were in. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll speak to uh, my revised motion, if I may. My revised motion is similar to my last motion, but I will make it specific to June. And the reason I'm making it specific to June is because that is when we are completing uh, uh, our working group process as part of the special study um, for Canada Square. I, I'll make a comment uh, because it was suggested in some way by the chair 
that by not uh, moving forward with the preliminary report now, that there that in some way it's 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 not it, we're not going to be consulting uh, with the community or letting people know about this application. Um, there's a few points to that. First of all, it is widely known that this application has been submitted. There's been two or three different Toronto Star articles. Uh, I put it out through my e-newsletter to tens of thousands of people. Uh, the Oriel Park Association, the South Eglinton Ratepayers and Residents Association, uh, Quantum Towers, you name it, all of them are sending out information to their uh, their neighbours. It is the talk of the town. We are all having conversations. When back in the days when I was uh, walking my daughter to the bus stop, uh, other parents and I would chat about it. Uh, there, I can assure you that it's more than consultation. We are all actively discussing this because it's so important to us in the Young and Eglinton area. And, um, and moreover, when we actually have the community meeting, it'll be a full public meeting as full as it can be online and we know it'll happen. It's just a matter of if it's gonna happen right now before we complete the special study working group process, which council supported, or would we do it in isolation where we're only looking at the Oxford proposal without the advantage of sharing with the community the outcome of the special area study for Canada Square. And I've been working really closely with planning staff on making sure that we do this well. Right now, we're about to hire uh, a facilitator for the working group. We're engaging everyone from um, the, uh, the leaders of the residents associations, tenants associations, BIAs, other organizations, my neighboring councillors, because even though to Councillor Fletcher's point, even though this is in the Toronto and East York Community Council area, and it's in my ward in Ward 12, regardless of my relationship with the other two councillors, I recognize that they represent adjacent neighborhoods that should be represented at that table. It's not about us, it's not about them, it's about the community. We are a midtown community and we, this site has the opportunity to serve the neighborhood, and that's what we want to achieve. And by the way, I, and also the school trustees, um, Shelley Laskin and Rachel Chernoff Slynn, uh, because we want to achieve a school there. We have a, we have a serious um, uh, uh, classroom capacity, uh, a dearth of, uh, of capacity in our area that needs to be addressed, both for the existing residents and for people who will welcome in the future. This is this is real, and we need to do this well. And if if you know. I would just encourage, whether it be Councillor Perks or anyone else, if you have concerns or questions, just talk to us. Because like, we really are doing this thoughtfully and we're trying to do this well. And there are enormous pressures on us as we move through this process and a lot of different competing interests and viewpoints. But the most important thing that I can tell you is that I'm working, I'm working with a group of residents who really do want to say yes to something. They just want to say yes to something that they really believe will contribute to our quality of life. The Oxford proposal, they listened to us about creating open space. I think there could be better design there, but there are a lot of lar just large buildings with really a token amount of, of community space in the podium of one of the buildings. And, and the buildings are very, the podiums are insular. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on this. And there's a lot of really innovative, good ideas. like not sort of block ideas, like creative ideas coming from the community that they want to work on. Let's give them that opportunity so that when we go back to the wider neighborhood at the community meeting, we can share that vision. We can share those ideas. And yes, we'll review Oxford's proposal. And let's try to put that all together and achieve something. Because if we don't do it that way, people will walk away from the table. And then there will only be a fight rather than a real effort amongst well-meaning grown-ups to get back to a table and achieve something special for this neighborhood that's needed a lot of social services and infrastructure and open space for years. This is not just a typical Young and Eglinton you know, speech. Like This actually is a historic moment that we have. And I'm asking you for some faith. I'm trying to, I'm trying to move forward a process and bring people together and get somewhere. And if we, if we 
If we move ahead with the Oxford proposal before we achieve the special study, it won't work. And you'll lose the confidence of the neighborhood. And there's justifiable, justifiable cynicism walking into this process in the first place. Their confidence needs to be earned by the work that we do. The last thing I'll mention is that because I was able to get that condition, that there would be no appeal. It doesn't mean that this is limitless. What do you mean? It just means that we're not up against the wall. It means that we have the space to do this work well and then come back to the community with it. And I ask you for your support. Thank you. Uh, I have a question or two. Councillor Matlow, I, I just I want to understand two things. First of all, is your effort here to defer the notification and the public meeting to June? Or is your effort here yes. to confer considering whether there will be a notification and a meeting until June? I'm deferring the item to June. Right, which means we're not deciding now that uh, a notice would go out and there would be a public meeting. You don't even want to decide that now. You just want to put Absolutely. that decision off until June. It will harm the process. I'm not asking your opinion on how the process will go. I'm asking about what you're trying to do with the item. So the motion yes. you move means we're not deciding today whether there will even be notification Correct. to your community and a public yes. meeting. Okay, that's the first thing I needed to understand. Public meeting at this point, yes. No, no, we're not deciding. You're saying let's not decide if there will be a public meeting at all. That's the effect of your no, motion. You, no, uh, uh, Councillor Matlow, respect, if, you want, if you want, we, we can amend your meeting. motion. We're just not moving forward with it at this point. If you want, we can amend your motion to say, uh, ask staff to, to, to hold a public meeting in June or in July and to send out the notification ahead of them. Would, you, would that work? I, my motion speaks for itself. I want to ensure that we complete this working group process. Okay, so, so we understand each other that you're, you're not prepared to take a decision today that would commit us to having a public meeting. All right, Correct. second, um, you've made the claim several times that you have uh, some kind of a commitment that there will be no, ap no appeal. I mean, I, I don't yes. understand how you have uh, a legally binding obligation on the part of an applicant that they have surrendered their appeal rights. Do you have such a thing? I'd like you to ask questions of planning staff or creating. Sure. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask understand. a question of city legal. Uh, Ms. Matsumoto, are you still with us? I'm sorry, I've dragged you into past five o'clock here. No, no, I'm here. Of oh, course. You, just, um, you have the best job in the city. Um, <laughs> is there a legally binding uh, covenant or uh, agreement or something on this property that uh, removes the applicant's appeal rights? Um, I, I'm just hesitating because I'm not sure if the information is confidential or not. So I just don't want to reveal anything that's confidential. Um, maybe I can answer in a hypothetical. Um, it's possible that somebody has entered into an agreement between parties that they won't they won't do that. Um, and um, whether or not that's you know binding on the other person is a whole other question. But it's possible that there is such a thing. Oh, do I need? It's possible that. Okay, so. So we're staying in the hypothetical realm. You put a caveat yes. on that, you're a lawyer, lawyers do that. You <laughs> said whether that's enforceable is an other question. So let's answer that other question in this hypothetical circumstance. Is it enforceable? I believe it's, in, uh, I've never seen it before. Can I just say that? I've never seen it before. So I don't know the answer to that question uh, fundamentally. It's unique and it's not something I've seen before, but um, I suppose they could fight it out over the whatever, con if, if a contract clause like that existed, they could fight that out amongst themselves. I'm sorry to be so um, 
vague. It's just I don't I don't want to. So you're saying there's there's there. there's no case law on on a matter on an agreement like this. There's nothing we can rely I, on. You're just hoping it would work. Yeah, in my like 20 years of doing this, I've never seen that before. I'm in, there could be other examples out there that I'm not aware of, but I've never seen it. It's certainly not something that you come across very often. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mr. Speaker, I do have questions. Councillor Bailao. Yes, um, and maybe this will lead to a motion. Um, and I don't know if there's anybody in legal or anybody from CREATIO that can clarify this, but I believe that uh, old Bill Toronto and CREATIO deals yes. have a clause. I'm in the middle of the meeting. I can't, I can't. Councillor Matlow, you would be wise to turn your microphone off when you're not speaking. I apologize. Um, have a clause that um, actually um, says that no appeal will be um, uh, permitted without consent of Creatio or Built uh, Toronto um, and under, you know, uh, extenuous circumstances. There is language in the agreements. Uh, can somebody confirm that? I believe this is actually a practice of, of the CREATO and that there is uh, things in agreement. So this might actually be one of them. So my understanding um, is that that's correct for CREATO does this in certain circumstances. In that circumstance, the city's the landowner. So the city, I don't think it's confidential that the city does have that in some agreements with housing now. You're correct. Okay, so so it, it is possible that there is certain language. So it, it can be challenged, but um, uh, they would require authorization from the city and CREATO, and it could be challenged because if there's reasonable grounds or something, there, there is some language. So it might be good for staff to share that language. Maybe even the councillor would want to add that to his motion of things that need to be publicly shared as well, because there is some language like that usually in contact. Okay, anyone else have questions either for staff or Councillor Matlow? Um, by, by the way, I'm sorry, um, Molly was asking me something right at that moment. So it's all, I, I all good. I just didn't want, I, I, I have a phobia about hot mics. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've, I've, I've learned to have one too uh, due to recent events. Um, uh, I don't believe that Kelly uh, actually has this file. Uh, so uh, you may want to speak with either CREATIO or, or TTC. There's already an agreement. There actually is a formal agreement and, and they could explain that in a little more detail uh, for you. But uh, 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 they, they will not be appealing this, given that it's our land. All right. Are there any other questions or comments that members have? Okay, uh, I'm just going to say a couple of words. Um, so I, I am not 100% comfortable, but I am much more comfortable uh, with the idea of deferring the uh, preliminary report to the June meeting than deferring it without any recall date. Um, I, I completely get it that local councillors know the lay of the land. And I can think of a whole lot of occasions when I've come to you colleagues and said, listen, on this file, there's, there's something unusual about it and I wanna handle it in a slightly different way. Here's why, here's how, uh, happy to answer any questions you have. And then we proceed together. There's a difference but based on the scale of things. If you're coloring within the set of, of uh, lines that we have usually, you know, the, we go out, we have community meetings, so on and so forth, just doing that uh, at a committee meeting saying, look, you know, normally we'd say eight stories here, but for a reason we're going to nine, come with me, that'll all be fine. That's completely different from uh, bringing at the last moment why don't we just not follow any of the normal planning procedures? Whole different thing, absolutely different thing. 
And unfortunately, despite Councillor Matlow saying a moment ago, you know, that he was, we're, we're welcome to come and approach him, uh, he made no effort to, to let us know that this highly unusual suggestion of not even approving the preliminary report or setting a date to approve the preliminary report, none of us were given warning that that would be the case. None of us were given reasons why that would be the case. And frankly, if you go way outside the bounds of what normal procedure is here, you owe it to your colleagues who, you know, you're not just asking to trust, you're asking to break the norms of how we do planning here. That's a different matter. So I'm always gonna put the brakes on and ask questions. That's my job. You know, we don't delegate the authority on planning matters to the local councillor, they're delegated to community council. It's my job to understand what's in front of us before I vote. And I will always insist on that. The second thing I wanna say is I understand there are moments when dealing with a large neighborhood that has many active planning pieces, why you would wanna work with a group of people who had more history on it, more sophistication, uh, more experience, and you were building some trust. I would understand why you wanna do that. I work that way sometimes too. But we have an obligation, a duty, to send out a notice to everyone within a geographic area in a timely fashion saying, this is happening in your neighborhood and to do it for every address. Not the people who happen to read the Toronto Star, not the people who happen to be members of a particular residence association, not the people who happen to be on the mailing list of a particular councillor. We have an ethical and in fact a statutory obligation to notify everybody, whether they're inside those tents or not, that there's a development coming. So I will never consent to saying, let's indefinitely defer meeting that basic ethical duty part of our job, which is to, to inform people whether they're on our list or not. Never gonna give that ground up. Now, I can accept the compromise of revisiting this again in June, but come June, there is no way I am deferring any further sending out that notice and having that public meeting for everybody. So I'll, I'll, I'll let it go today and I'll support the councillor's motion, but this is not a matter of just showing a little bit of trust or giving you some room to navigate. At some point, we have a duty to tell everybody. Those are my comments. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I have, a, I have a point of privilege not to, not to be antagonistic, but really just to clarify something because it has been implied that we have an ethical duty to, uh, to notify the community about a, a development uh, proposal and somehow I don't want that to happen. Nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, that's the not a point of privilege. That's well, not a point well, of privilege. You've actually, you've actually suggested that what I'm doing is no, not you're, following this is what the this is, vote, Councillor. Please. What you're doing right now please is trying to debate me. The vote, please. I don't know what you're trying to do right now is well. debate me. I have please. no interest in debating you. The rules don't I'm say that debating. we just debate each other all day long. I'm not debating anything. I made no, I, I did not make the claim that, that you said that I made. I have ruled you out of order. You your option did. now, your only option now is to challenge my ruling. Is that what you would like to do? But I haven't stated. I haven't stated my. You did. Point of privilege. Would you like you to challenge my ruling? You did that about me. You, you Would you like to challenge my ruling? I don't hear that. Okay. So, is there anyone else who would like to speak to the item that's in front of us, Councillor Layton? I, I'm just going to. I'll try to be really brief. I think. I, I think I get both points being made. I think, and on on the one hand. Um, the, uh, the, the, the chair wants to see us go through our normal process and doesn't want to, um, uh, to, to take a path that might result in us not having formally informed individuals of a planning proposal. And I certainly would want us to do that or undertake a path like that either. But I don't think that's the intent of Councillor Matlow in his original motion. I, I think that 
um, he's being dealt a really a really difficult position uh, and 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 development proposal in this case. We've got city land, we've got private interests, uh, we've got a, a very highly uh, de uh, develop it, developed and developing neighborhood that has a uh, a, a, a secondary plan that has been. Uh, that has been messed with by other levels of government, and he's he's trying to perhaps chart a slightly different course. Um, I don't think it has the certainty that the chair would want to see in ensuring that the the boxes were being checked, the ones that uh, that that ensure that we're accountable. And so that's why I think I see both uh, both the chair's position as well as Councillor Matlow's. Um, I, I think that bringing this back in in June gets to the intent of what Councillor Matlow was trying to do, but gives the assurance to the chair at the end of the day that we're gonna get an opportunity to either vote on the preliminary report or adopt the preliminary report as, as we would traditionally do after some work has been done. I've been put in this same position before where city divisions, like what wasn't, it wasn't built, I was built prior to create um, that, uh, that they did give me that assurance that no, no one was going to try to jump in front of, uh, a, a process that the local councillor wanted to undertake with their community. I think they'll probably do a better job this time than they even did when it was built because create demonstrated, I think over the course of time, they're willing to look at city building initiatives as part of their mandate far more than what Bill was doing. Um, so I think we should get on with the vote. Let's move ahead. Any other speakers on the item? No, seeing none. Uh, why don't we take the councillor's uh, motion to defer the item until the June meeting of Toronto East York Community Council. All those in favor? Opposed, that carries. I believe that leaves us only with the bills. That's right. Yeah? Okay, let's do it so that we get it done quick. That the Toronto East York Community Council pass and declare as bill, bylaws bills 274 to 311 prepared for the April 21st, 2021 20, meeting 24 of the Toronto Community Council. All those in favor, I gotta see, I gotta see the screen so I can prove that I watched them vote. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Next. Uh, that the Toronto East York Community Council pass and declare as a bylaw a confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of the Toronto East York Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting 24 on April 21st, 2021. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Is that it? Okay, members, thank you. Uh, I apologize for not having us got finished by 5 o'clock, but I did my best. Have a great evening. We'll see you all soon. Tomorrow at Planning and Growth Committee. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Thank Thanks, you. Bird. Bye, everybody. Thank you.